I am just waiting for Dr. Ashish Lila. Otherwise, we'll just start, sir. I think he would be joining. I messaged him. Any time. Okay. This time, sir, whole program will be managed and organized by our research scholar, sir. So. <laughs> yeah, sir, I was yes, two, years, two years ago. I was there in IHBT personally. That time yes, also sir. had organized this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, if if you permit, sir, I think can they start or? Yeah, I think we should start. We can start. Yes, start. Sanjay ji, I have just joined. Uh, Ashish Lele here. Oh, yeah. very good morning, Dr. Lele sir. Very very good morning. Welcome yeah. and and happy Teachers Day to you. Good morning. Sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Morning, Shekhar. Hey, Shish. Teachers are the backbone of an, any country, the pillar upon which all aspirations are converted into realities. Beginning with these beautiful lines by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, I welcome you all in our FIBS Student Seminar Series 2021. Our teachers are the light of the world, the beckon in the darkness, and the hope that give us the audacity to survive. Today, on 5th of September, we celebrate Teacher's Day. A day set aside to honor the brilliant souls who work tirelessly every day to ensure that the future is bright for all of us. Let us welcome to all our guides, teachers, with a big round of applause. On this auspicious occasion, let us take this opportunity to express our gratitude to all of our teachers who have made such an indelible impact on our progress. It is a day full with excitement, pleasure, and happiness to all scholars eagerly anticipate the chance to tell their teachers how and why they are special for them. And we all know that we celebrate Teachers' Day on 5th of September, marked by the birth anniversary of Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. Along with being a successful leader, former president of India, Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan was a great scholar and a brilliant teacher. In his remembrance and in honor of the brilliant brilliance of our gurus and teachers, we transform this beautiful day into an occasion of sharing ideas. Yes, I'm talking about student seminar series, which is now slowly converted into a global event. I'm Vikas Dadwal, PhD scholar representing from CSI IHBT, and now going to connect you with numerous brilliant scientists, scholars, graduates, and alumni around the world. But before we move further, I request everyone to rise for our institutional anthem, our Sansthan Gang. Hey, Himale, hum tere Oh, awesome. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Before we move further, I want to provide you a brief uh, briefing of our seminar series. Student seminar series was first executed in 21st September 2017 under the dynamic supervision of our director, sir, Dr. Sanjay Kumar. Under his direction, 24 young motivated scholars from different laboratories of CSRIHVT were participated and discussed their ideas on bioeconomy, by resources, Himalaya product and processes. Yes, this was our first theme for the student seminar series 2017. It was a marvelous day and our first successful student seminar series. In 2018, 22 IHBT scholars participated and this time the entire institute participated and turned this occasion into a mega event. The theme was expanding scientific horizons from basic translational research. The scholars and scientists work together flawlessly. Nevertheless, a large number of vendors come forward and they support us. <clears throat> I can still remember that evening when guides and students took pictures with their beautiful smiles on their faces. In 2019, respected Director General Dr. Shekhar Simande shown his immense presence on our institute. The theme was Science for Society Meeting the Unmet Need of, uh, of the nature. During this year, first time we introduced IHVT Swar, a popular science story writing competition, along with oral presentations, because we believe these events promote the holistic development of a scholar fraternity. The year 22, 2020 was a pandemic year. Doors are closed and the world heard the phrase quarantine for the first time. By turning adversity into opportunity, we switched our event into the virtual mode. Uh, and around 32 scholars from various prominent universities, institutions, including IITs, GNDU, HPU, CSK, HPKV, and Punjab University were connected. The theme was COVID-19, cancel culture or window of opportunities. We brought together scientists, scholars, professional medical doctors from around the country for that event. We were astonished by the tremendous response of scholars on the world. This year, our theme for the event is scientific innovation and digital transformation, bridging interdisciplinary perspectives. More than 150 academies, acad uh, 150 academies participated in the oral, e-poster, IHVT swirl, photography, and videography competition. Now, our event is no longer confined to the PhDs. Now, undergraduates, graduates, and even engineering students have shown a great enthusiasm. This year, we are bringing back and connect you all with our past IHVT scholars. Yes, I'm talking about our alumni who are currently working on highly prestigious universities and institutions around the world. I am delighted to welcome you all for our seminar series 2021 once again. I believe the upcoming video will give you a glimpse of how these events are come together. Thank you.
In the presence of our respected Director General Dr. Shekhar Singh Mande and our keynote speaker Dr. Ashir Kishore Lele, Dr. NCR Pune, I would like to invite Director Sir for the lamp lighting and cake cutting ceremony. Sir, kindly permit us for the lamp lighting and the cake cutting ceremony, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. DG, sir, can we proceed, sir? Dr. Ashish Lele, sir, can we proceed, sir? Okay. okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, can you permit us for the cake cutting ceremony? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Sir, every year on this occasion, we also uh, release our abstract book for the event. Now, kindly permit us for the release of our abstract book seminar series 2021. May I proceed, sir? sir? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, every year on this occasion, we plant tree on behalf of our guests. So kindly permit us for the tree plantation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shekhar Sivande, Director, uh, Director General. Sir, uh, kindly permit us for the tree plantation. Please go ahead. Please go. Our honorable keynote speaker, Dr. Ashish Kishor Lele, Director NCL Pune, sir, we also plant a tree for you uh, on your behalf. So kindly permit us for the tree plantation. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Before we proceed to the next session, I would like to give you a glimpse of our lovely institute. So.
Thank you, sir. I hope you really like the video. Now, I would like to invite our director, sir, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, CSRI Chuiti, for the welcome address. Sir. Thank you, um, Vikas and my dear research scholars. Honorable Dr. Shekhar Mandeji, DGCSIR, Secretary DSIR, and also Secretary MOES. Uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Ashish Lele, Director of NCL Laboratory, very prestigious lab of CSIR. And I can see our scholar alumni, uh, Dheeraj Vyas from uh, Triple IM Jammu, Upender from Belgium, Praveen Rahi from NCCS Pune, Avdesh from Bihar Agriculture University. I can see our friends from YS Parmari University, uh, Solan, Punjabi University, Patiala, and I can also see people from Punjab University, Chandigarh, and also from Animal Husbandry Government of Himachal Pradesh. Uh, our all valued guests and alumni, my dear research scholars, and members of CSIR IHBT. On this auspicious uh, Teachers' Day, I humbly pay my respect to all my teachers. And um, this respect will be incomplete if we do not pay tribute to Dr. Sarpalli Radhakrishnan, uh, who always advocated that teach to transform. And I think this is a great message. And how can we forget um, uh, Gurudev Ravindran Tagore, who is known as Gurudev itself, and who not only gave us the national song, but who reinvented the concept of Gurukul. And uh, when he always said that objective of teaching is to knock on the doors of the mind. This is the time when we remember one exemplary lady in this line is Dr. Madam Savitri Bai Phule. Uh, she was the first female teacher of India's first women school and who appeared on the stamp of India in 1998 also. So I think this is these have been some exemplary teachers in our country. And uh, uh, you we always remember Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, he always counseled that education is the primary driving force for growth. And I feel it's very apt that we pay tribute to our great teachers like Sir C. V. Raman, uh, not only because of his uh, monumental discovery on uh, Raman effect on scattering of light, for which he received Nobel Prize in 1930, but also he produced some exceptional scholars. Uh, like, for example, how can we forget Dr. G. N. Ramachandran, uh, whose epic discovery on triple helical structure of collagen, I think uh, no biochemistry textbook is complete with, without uh, Ramachandran plot. How can we forget Dr. Sarabhai, who was again the student of Dr. C. V. Raman, who established this ISRO program. And uh, similarly, Dr. J. C. Bose was yet another son of India and great teacher who appraised the uh, country's head with pride. And uh, he is not only known for his contribution on millimeter waves, radios, crescograph, and when he showed that, uh, you know, uh, plants. Uh, are living being and electricity plays a very important role in signal transduction. But he also produced some fantastic students like S. N. Bose. And today we hear the name Boson, that is the uh, particle based on his uh, close association, association with Albert Einstein. And both of them worked together and they founded the statistics of Bose Einstein statistics. So, such a great student. Yeah, Meghna Sa, another student of Sir J.C. Bose. And we all know today when we study the chemical and physical condition of a star, what nobody can go ahead without the uh, Sahaz ionization equation. We all know it. And uh, so th the list is long. And we have seen that in India, we have a culture of great teachers and great students. And sir, in CSIR, we all are aware that we are so fortunate that uh, uh, nobody else but Dr. Shante Saru Bhatnagar. He, has, he's, he was the revered founder of CSIR and he is known as the father of research laboratories. And sir, now we have you with us uh, who showed that what these research laboratories can deliver for the nation. And particularly in this COVID time, you showed us that how science can help the nation in conquering the demanding uh, circumstances. And uh, so... Uh, Dr. Bhatnagar 
laid down all these laboratories and now we are seeing the outcomes coming out of that so thank you sir for uh, taking and giving us so name you know now science is again into the central uh, discussions in the nation that science is so important for national development and uh, uh, the, thank you so much sir and uh, what we believe that in scientific world each one of us and uh, is our teacher and uh, i remember sir few inst instances and i thought uh, on this teachers day i would like to share with you uh, for example we remember sir uh, you know in science uh, there was a person known as amazuel the egyptian born scientist and he wanted to study the chemical reaction and then he realized that this uh, chemical reactions happen so quickly in the range of femtosecond and he was not able to see what happens during this chemical reaction and at that time there was someone else who had developed these fast lasers and uh, we, we, he thought why not to use these fast lasers so that he developed some super fast cameras so he initiated the chemical reaction recorded the spectra and analyzed how the molecule structure is changing and based on all this work today we see the whole science of the or the new field of femtochemistry started and he received nobel prize later on in this area now in such instances can we think is it possible that unless there was a laser technology he could have established this so we learn from each other and we have to keep our eyes and ear open and so today we all are connected through virtual modes and at www this world has become so famous that world wide web and so i was very curious you know how this www thing started and uh, when i started uh, seeing its uh, history it was so fascinating and it traces back in 1640s when pascal who had discovered you know this pascaline or the early counting machine so he showed that uh, using this machines it is possible to do calculations and later on based on his first discovery then charles babbage he invented the difference engine then we know that you know turing he made uh, something known as turing machine which is the example of our central processing unit and the icing on the cake was when tin uh, berners lee he envisioned you know a global information space where computers were linked in a vast network and data was freely available for all and then he thought to create this thing he needed some languages so he created that http which we call as hypertext transfer protocol or html that is hypertext markup language and then url that is a universal uh, resource locator so it made it possible that you know this ww thing is stuff and today we all are talking to each other just because of this ww discovery and uh, even this covid period it helped us to connect throughout the world with our academia with our friends and um, um, only thing important probably is that we should have people and group who have capability to integrate and synthesize uh, you know various capabilities together and sir uh, i remember your lecture when you were giving on this covid 19 mrna based vaccine i think it was so exciting to see how the power of nanotechnology was so important you know when we, we realized that mrna could be a fantastic way to develop vaccine so, you know but then they realized that mrna will not be stable so they used this lipid nanoparticle so they encapsulated mrna in that lipid nanoparticle and then they injected and uh, so it was so fascinating you know at one side we have nanotechnology at another side you have hardcore molecular biology put together and in this covid period so quickly uh, this vaccine came together so i think we need to have such people who have ability to synthesize and bring the things together and uh, uh, it was so interesting to see that you know from the first time india launched india took a lead in launching that dna based covid 19 vaccine uh, and it's on the shelf and you don't need even a injection for that so i feel that uh, you know seminar like this which our students have are organizing it i think it will be a, a mixed pot where uh, 
several new ideas will be germinated several new innovation would take place that's the whole idea you know what is friend thought uh, that you know we should be discussing the things together and uh, our research scholars no doubt they are the future teachers they are the future scientists and uh, we have no hesitation in mentioning that our research scholars they leave no stone unturned to achieve the institutional goal and uh, it's because of their dedicated hard work that we all are making dents on global science through quality publications and patent on one side and on the other side we are outreaching the society empowering our farmers empowering the uh, improving the livelihood and improving the quality of life either through aroma mission through floriculture mission through high valued crops like heeing kesar mong fruit apple or other industrial crops developing range of formulation for degradation of organic waste and so on in the process they develop range of nutraceutical and food based products they develop entrepreneurship and create an environment of startups and incubator so i feel students play very uh, rich role and uh, uh, it's so nice that they think that we should pay uh, back to the teachers to organizing such seminars i think it's very thoughtful and sir we are very fortunate that today we have your presence presence of dr mandey sir and dr lele whose rich experience i'm sure and thoughts of wisdom would transform the path for our action for national development through science and technology sir i sincerely wish our students our teachers and their teachers all the very best in their scientific pursuits thank you very much sir jai hind jai bharat thank you sir thank you so much sir for your kind and motivational thoughts now on behalf of the whole organization organizing committee and csri tvd i would like to invite our honorable tg csir dr shekhar simande an eminent scientist of our repute inspires us to do better every day your excellent career is renowned throughout the world we really appreciate yet your keen interest in our event your efforts towards our event has motivated us to make it better and better day by day so we are really honored to have you back with us again be the scholars of csr ihbt wish you a very happy teachers day and welcome to the fifth student seminar series 2021 so i would like to invite now honorable dg sir can you address this august gathering sir thank you very much dr sanjay kumar director of ihbt palampur dr ashish lele director of ncl pune all the past students of uh, ihbt the current students of ihbt and whoever has joined on this webinar a very happy teachers day to all of you i have very pleasant memories of uh, ihbt palampur from 2 years ago when i was there in person for this particular event and this has kind of a become a tradition in ihbt that every year students organize this student uh, completely student the uh, organized uh, seminar series on the teachers day uh, it's a very healthy tradition and i do think i do uh, uh, believe that uh, students not only will get to learn much more about different subject areas and all but also can hone their skills on holding such seminars and how do we actually propagate knowledge through such seminars others having said that let me say also uh, recount that uh, Uh, india has actually placed a great uh, our india has greatly benefited by the guru shishya parampara lot of uh, teaching from generations to generations have happened through the guru shishya parampara in which people uh, who learn out of their life's experiences and all pass on their teachings to a set of disciples through this particular parampara and knowledge has always been extended in the context in the if you look at the history of india by deliberations by debates and so on and so forth and many of those deliberation debates are very famous from uh, the, the, the historical days and one of the uh, very philosophical debates that actually happened a few thousand years ago was that between rishi yagyavalkya and gargi and maitreyi on the other side and there yushi yagyavalkya actually goes on deliberating elaborating the concepts of athanga akasha and so on and so forth 
it is amazing how the knowledge has been actually gained and uh, transmitted from generation to generations since then uh, the classroom education system and the formal education system through written text and or written text and other things is rather new in human history it is uh, hardly happened in last about maybe 3 or 400 years that learning through reading textbooks and all but in general we have always learned from the experienced people who have seen life and uh, from their experiences what if they have learned we have actually tried to gather them is not to say that whatever has been gathered uh, by the people through their experiences is always right i am not saying that is always right they can also be challenged and is a typical challenges between the students and the teachers which has really helped humanity to advance the frontiers of knowledge and that's where the debates between student and teachers assume a great importance in which students keep challenging their teachers about the new ideas and so on and so forth and as a matter of fact together both of them advance the frontiers of knowledge and uh, by the time students take over as teachers of the newer generations it becomes better and better and better uh, being a teacher part of a teacher ourselves many of us here especially myself ashish and sanjay uh, would agree that uh, it has been a pleasure uh, to be in this profession it has been a great pleasure to be in this particular profession uh, we have always enjoyed interacting with students younger generation and uh, i don't think any other profession uh, having been in this particular profession is better than that and i keep telling uh, many people across society that if you think what is the best profession in your society that is either being a teacher or a scientist uh, ask uh, any of your friends who have other professions and they will tell you how dry the professions are including a administrative position how dry it is and there is nothing more enriching or nothing more pleasurable than being a scientist or being a teacher that is one profession that pays you for what you enjoy to do there is one singular profession where you actually get paid for your own enjoyment and that's why when we work in our labs and all at midnight at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock we are not doing out of compulsion we are doing it out of that sheer pleasure of finding something new and that's how together with the debates between teachers and students and exploration of the world that we advance the frontiers of knowledge all of us oh uh, our being here to those teachers whom who inspired us in our school college or later and each one of us if we just think and introspect we will remember those names who were so inspiring to us to bring us to this particular stage and today is that day to remember them and pay our respects to the teachers thank you all very much for organizing this particular event we are all eagerly looking forward to ashish's talk Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, thank you, all the students, for inviting me here, and wish you all the very best for the teachers' day. Thank you, sir, for such a beautiful and wise words. We are really honored to have you with us. We ensure you that we scholars work hard, and we bring more proud moments to the CSIR and for the country. thank you sir thank you very much so now i like to invite uh, pallavi sharma one of our convener to proceed for the further session thank you vikas and uh, thank you all for joining us today good morning happy teachers day to all i am pallavi sharma a phd scholar and i take this opportunity to thank you all for finding time and joining us today as it is rightly said by dr sarvapalli radhakrishnan a life of joy and happiness is possible only on the basis of knowledge and science it brings me great pleasure to welcome dr ashish ishor lele director of ncl pune to the fifth student seminar series today he is an exceptional scientist and an amazing visionary from our csir family dr lele graduated in chemical engineering from udcd mumbai in the year 1988 he has done his doctorate from the university of delhi 
US in 1993 and his post doctorate from Cambridge University. He is well known for his research on micro and meso structures of polymers and relating it to the macroscopic dynamical and equilibrium properties. He was also the first scientist to elucidate the amoeba like dynamics of ring polymers. He is an elected fellow at the Indian National Science Academy, Indian Academy of Sciences, and Indian National Academy of Engineering. He was honored by the Young Scientist Award in 1996 and Shanti Swarup Bhitnagar Award for Science and Technology in 2006 by CSIR India. Infosys Science Foundation has honored him with Infosys Prize in 2012 for his contribution in engineering and computing science. He was also awarded with the ICT Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2013. Today, he will speak to us on the emerging area of hydrogen economy. I am confident that we all will learn a lot from him today. So, without further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Ashish Kishore Lele. Sir, I invite you to join us and kindly enlighten us with your thoughts. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Pallavi. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shekhar Mande, DGCSIR, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Director IHBT, and all my dear friends from uh, uh, IHBT. Thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful seminar series. Uh, I wish I could have been there in person. I have never really visited IHBT, so I am actually looking forward to coming there sometime. Uh, and now you have. We look forward, Dr. Lele, to have with us. Thank you, Sanjay ji. Uh, and now you have planted a tree in my name, so it's my responsibility to make sure that it yes. it grows and it flourishes. So I, yes. I certainly would like to come down sometime uh, and and see your wonderful institute. Thank you also for giving me the virtual tour of the institute. It looks so fabulous. The background, the backdrop, and the institute, everything is absolutely uh, phenomenal. So. Uh, I would like to, of course, uh, start by paying my respects to all my teachers. Uh, Ashish, you are being mute. Ashish, uh, mute. I think. Sorry. Uh, so I'd like to start by paying my respects to all my teachers. And one of the first things that I do on every Teachers' Day is actually uh, wish Happy Teachers' Day to all my past students also, uh, because as uh, Dr. Shekhar Mande has said. Uh, in every student while you uh, train them you don't know when eventually you become their student because they they learn more about the topic than you do and they start telling you and you know that they, it's time for them to graduate then at that time uh, so it's it's a very ple pleasing journey to walk uh, with uh, all your students and uh, there is so much to learn from them so my respects to uh, all the teachers uh, what i'm going to do today is uh, to give you uh, some sense of uh, the topic of hydrogen which is uh, coming up in a big way in the country uh, i was a little apprehensive that uh, the topic may not fit the theme of the research seminar series for this year uh, but the student organizers have given me confidence that uh, i can speak about this topic so with your permissions uh, i'm going to share my screen uh, I don't have the right to share my screen, so can the organizer give me the right to share? Uh, Vikas? Yes, sir. In uh, uh, screen sharing, ka wo nahi ka right? Rajat sir, ko? Uh, sir, screen sharing open, hai, sir. Open. Uh, are you, you facing the right? Problem? Because uh, I can't share my screen. Just a minute, sir. Uh, you have to give me the right to share. Could you please just give give us a second? There is a technical error. Unko presenter kara do, because mere isme bhi nahi hai. So only organizers and presenters kare hai. So unko presenters ka seta de do. Ji sir. Done, sir. Done, sir. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So you let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is, can you see in the full presentation mode? Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I know I have time until uh, 11, so I have 45 minutes and I would like to uh, uh, keep some time for discussions. Uh, so I'd like to begin. Uh, so the title of this talk is about green hydrogen for clean India. And as you know, I'm the uh, director currently at the CSIR National Chemical Laboratory in Pune. Uh, most of you who have seen our PM uh, talk at the uh, Red Fort on 15th of August, uh, he made a very significant announcement on the day uh, when he talked about uh, green hydrogen. And he, he specifically mentioned that uh, green hydrogen will be India's biggest goal for providing what he called a quantum jump to address the uh, very important problem of climate change. Uh, in the last uh, one and a half year or so, you know, we have all been vexed with the, the pandemic and the coronavirus. Uh, and we've all been very, very intensely uh, struggling and fighting the, the pandemic. Uh, what we have sort of forgotten in the last one and a half years because of this uh, fight against the pandemic is that there is something else that is looming in the background. Uh, which is also equally or perhaps even bigger threat to the entire planet, to entire uh, every single living being on this uh, planet, uh, plants or trees or animals and, and, and all of that. And, and that is the, the problem of climate change. Uh, and this is a very, very significant and real threat that is looming. Uh, and I will talk a little bit uh, about it in, in one of the slides. Uh, but... Uh, this is a problem that has now uh, brought all the, the political people, the, the, the investors, the uh, industrialists, the scientists, researchers, policy makers, think tanks, all brought them to the same floor to think about what can be done to address this important issue of climate change. Uh, it is no longer new to any one of us. We all know the, and we are actually facing and seeing in every day uh, in, in the news and the, in the newspapers and media uh, about how the climate is changing, about how uh, events which are very disruptive uh, are happening at very regular frequencies and their intensities have increased uh, very significantly over the past uh, uh, few years. Uh, and this is all because of climate change. And if we don't do anything about it today, uh, it's going to be very difficult for the future generations to come. So in fact, this decade of 2020 to 2030, I don't think in the history of human civilization, we are you know, facing such a, a, a dramatic challenge that will actually decide the future of the entire planet and in particular our future generations and not just of human beings but the entire life on this planet so it is really a problem at that scale it's not a problem that we should be uh, wishing away it's not going to change on its own and it is really up to our generation and for the students uh, your generation to do something very very seriously about it uh, so this is the reason why this important issue has come all the way now to the most important address of the Prime Minister to the nation, uh, which you heard on the 15th of August. Uh, and I may also tell you that almost every single political leader of every single country is now making such statements uh, in their most important public addresses. And all countries and governments are now announcing some very uh, important uh, announcements for such as for example uh, sorry sir, sir, sorry sir uh, sorry to cut you short but sir your uh, presentation is not uh, moving it it's free sir could you please right. share the desktop yeah hold on a minute yes sir <laughs> Can you see my slide now? Yes, sir. It's first slide. Okay, then, then. This is a prime minister slide, but we can see now. Yeah, next one. Yes. Sir. Yeah, you can see now. Yes, prime sir. minister yes. slide. Prime minister yes. slide, right? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, let me go ahead uh, and uh, tell you that uh, a few days ago only, uh, uh, I think just yesterday, in fact, in fact uh, our uh, Science and Technology Honorable Minister, Dr. Jitendra Singh, also announced uh, an important, uh, made an important announcement regarding hydrogen. Uh, and he actually said that uh, India must have an aspirational goal uh, in its national hydrogen energy mission. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it uh, in the coming slides. Uh, and this is an important announcement because every country uh, who has uh, laid down the agenda for clean energy and in particular for hydrogen uh, has actually stated an aspirational goal. Uh, there are such aspirational goal statements made by the US, uh, by European Union, by Japan, by Australia and so on. And so it's important that uh, India should also make such an aspirational goal. And as, as you know, you know, aspiration is something that you uh, have the ambition to try and try and attain. It's a, it's a stretched goal. It's an it's a difficult goal to reach. Uh, but if you don't have an aspiration, uh, you don't have a very good plan for what you want to do. So it's important for every uh, country to set such aspirational goals. Uh, so uh, our minister announced such an aspirational goal, which he called the hydrogen two one two, and the details of what it means are uh, means are given below. Uh, and I will again elaborate on this a little bit but just for you to know it the first number two represents the uh, the production cost of hydrogen and the target is to keep it less than two us dollars per kg uh, every fuel has to then move from where it is produced to where it has to be used for example today uh, fuels like petrol and diesel are produced in refineries uh, at some locations in the country and they are of course used everywhere in the country so these fuels have to be transported so you have to store the fuel, you have to transport the fuel, distribute it, and then you have to refuel it. Uh, so just like that for hydrogen also, you have to do exactly all this thing. We call it the supply chain. And the cost for that supply chain, that is the cost to move the hydrogen and dispense it from where it is produced to where you want to use it. The target is to have it less than $1 per kg. And the third one is uh, if you have the incumbent technology based on fossil fuels like petrol or diesel and you want to replace it with a clean fuel like hydrogen uh, then an investor for example says you know uh, if i make this change i will have to invest some amount of money in it uh, and what will be my return on investment right so the investor has uh, the option of investing his money into something else a financial mechanism such as uh, such as in a bank for example or in mutual funds or wherever and he's going to get some return on investment uh, and he's going to say, he's going to ask if I invest this in a new technology like hydrogen, will I get less or more than what uh, other options I have? Uh, and in order to uh, invite the investor to uh, invest into hydrogen, uh, the what is called the return on investment, uh, that period of return on investment, uh, the target that is being set is less than two years. OK. Uh, and this is an important number because anything about two years in the Indian markets does not attract investors. Right? So this 212 is actually talking about the three important parts of any fuel value chain, the generation part, the supply chain part, and the use of the, uh, the, the fuel. So 212 are difficult numbers to reach. That's why it's called the aspirational goal. And we will see in the few, in, in the next few slides uh, as to how it would be possible to and what we have to do in order to reach such aspirational goal. But now that you have the prime minister announcing that hydrogen is going to be providing a quantum leap to our to addressing our problem of climate change and our minister having set an aspirational goal. Uh, now it is important for us to think and do something about it. Uh, but before I get there, I want to first tell you why hydrogen is important and why at all we should be interested in it. So to set the context, uh, if you look at today, what is the energy scenario in India and what is our emissions uh, status? Uh, the pie chart on the left shows you that today, which is the top left pie chart, uh, most of our energy demand is met by fossil fuels. So 56% is by coal and about 36% by a combination of oil and natural gas. All the others 
have a very little role to play as of today. So more than 90% of our energy is met by fossil fuels. Uh, unfortunately, all of this or most of this fossil fuel is imported today because we have very little resources of oil and natural gas. And in fact, although we have large reserves of coal, most of the Indian coal is what is called a high ash coal. That is, it's not easy to burn this coal to make steam and generate power uh, because it releases a lot of uh, uh, non-combustible minerals uh, that can foul and clog our uh, boilers. And so if, even for coal, India actually imports a very large amount of uh, even coal. So most of our thermal power plants from which we get most of the electricity today are actually using some amount of Indian coal, but also a very large amount of imported coal. Overall, therefore, the import bill for meeting India's demand is almost of the order of 160 billion US dollars. Uh, that is about 12 trillion Indian rupees. So that's a very large cost to our exchequer on an annual basis. What India is trying to do now is to become more self-reliant in meeting its energy demand. And this is a very important thing to, to uh, understand from the context that, you know, India is a young country. You know, it's uh, all of you young guys there are the future of India. Uh, and uh, if you look at the demographic of India, uh, our population is very young. And what that means is younger the population, higher is the aspiration of the country. On the map, or there's a very nice plot of, uh, of uh, GDP uh, versus uh, history uh, versus years, right? And you will see actually uh, if you plot all the countries, their GDP uh, and uh, the population, for example, you will see that there's a very nice master curve in all where all these countries can be placed. Uh, and India is pretty low on that curve. And what that means is uh, India has to climb a lot in terms of its GDP. Our per capita GDP is almost a fifth of the average per capita GDP of the world. So there's a huge you know, uh, aspiration of the country to increase the quality of life, the standard of living of our population. Now, you can't increase the GDP of a country without increasing the energy demand. So here is the situation where today we are importing a huge amount of energy. Uh, we don't really use a lot of energy if you uh, quantify it on a per capita basis. Uh, we have huge aspirations for the country. And therefore, our energy demands are only going to increase. And so it's important for the country, for us to ask ourselves, you know, how are we going to meet that increasing energy demand? Because there is no doubt that we will have to increase our uh, energy consumption. There is no doubt about it. There is no way back from that point. Okay? So it's only going to increase. And then the question is, are we going to use more and more fossil fuel or are we going to use more clean energy? So at a national level, the ambition of the country is today by 2050 to, of course, go to more and more renewables to the point that almost half of, us, of our energy demand by 2050 uh, is going to be met by renewables. Uh, you can see that on the uh, pie chart at the bottom. And the fossil fuel content in the energy share is going to come much, much lower. Uh, and this is a huge aspirational demand. And it poses actually uh, two problems. Uh, the table on the right top shows you the various sectors which consume energy. Uh, and you can see electricity, industry, heavy transportation, light transportation, agriculture, and many others. They all consume uh, energy and their per capita, I, I mean, their percentage of energy consumption is shown on the table on the right. The ones marked with uh, uh, blue font are the ones that can be met by renewable electricity. Right? So the power sector. So when I say electricity, it's really power sector. So power sector can, of course, uh, uh, go fully to green. Uh, as I said, renewable energy is going to uh, be the share of that is going to be very large. And all of that is electricity. So it's solar, wind, tidal, uh, geothermal and, and so on and so forth. All of that actually produces electrons and all of that is renewable electrons. So the power sector can completely move, at least theoretically, to, uh, to green. Uh, that is a difficult task by itself because you need what is called a base load. And I'll talk about that uh, when I show you the graph at the bottom. 
but one can say that it is theoretically possible to convert all electricity to renewable electricity. You can do that with light transportation, such as your cars and your two wheelers and auto rickshaws and so on, uh, can be based completely out of battery electric uh, transportation. So light transportation can also move to renewable electricity. Agricultural pumps can move to renewable electricity. In fact, that is a revolution that has been happening for several years now. Many of our farmers have what are called solar pumps. Uh, and uh, so a lot of agricultural uh, inputs uh, for energy can be made out of renewable electricity. However, there are a few sectors such as industry sector, heavy transportation sector, uh, and a few others. And within industry sector, we are talking of some very large industries like refining, cement, steel, glass. These are very large industries. Uh, and for them, it is rather difficult to become a zero carbon emission industry with purely based on renewable electricity. In these industries, as, as well as in heavy transportation, such as uh, trucks, buses, ships, airplanes, drones, and so on, uh, for them, you need a fuel. You need molecules, not electrons, uh, because it is uh, more economically viable to drive the energy uh, requirement in this industry by using a fuel, uh, that is through molecules. And therefore, this is a sector where even if we move to renewable electricity, uh, it is not going to be easy to convert this into a zero carbon emitting sector. Right? So you need here, uh, as I said, some kind of molecular form of energy. Coming to the uh, figure on the bottom, this is a very famous curve called a duck curve. And it's called duck curve because it has a shape that looks like a duck. Uh, and particularly the belly of the duck is, is an important part. And what it says is that uh, the, the y axis here is the difference between the energy that is uh, produced and the energy that is used. Okay, And the bigger the difference, the, the more the curve moves down in the in the belly. So if the difference in the energy required and the energy produced is larger, the curve moves uh, at the towards the bottom so that the duck becomes fatter. Uh, and this is a problem because if you can't supply energy uh, as per the demand of energy, uh, then you run into problems. Uh, you run into things like grid collapses and of course people don't get electricity and things like that. And this problem becomes more and more severe uh, in the case of renewable electricity for the simple reason that any renewable electricity that you look at uh, is not available 24 by 7. In India, we are fortunate to have solar radiation coming to us uh, for at least five to six hours uh, a day on an average throughout the year. It, of course, varies from uh, place to place, but on an average, we get at least five to six hours of sunlight uh, every day for at least 300 days a year and many many countries in the world do not even get that much right and I spent uh, uh, two years in in the UK in Cambridge and I know how terrible uh, the situation there is uh, and so you know you talk of biomass it's available only after harvest time so it's available seasonally and so on so any particular renewable energy source that you look at these sources are called infirm source of energy. Right? They are not firm sources of energy, which means they do not produce. You, it's difficult to produce energy from it 24 by 7. Uh, and turns out that for solar, which is important for India, uh, you know, when when you wake up and you are ready to go to office, you everybody needs a lot of electricity. When you come back from office in in the night, uh, you have to turn your lights on and your TVs on and your computers on and whatever, and you need a lot of electricity there. And of course, at early morning and the late evenings, you don't have the sun. So you don't have the source of uh, electricity. Uh, and so the blue uh, rectangles that I've shown are actually the regions where you it's early morning or late evening where the demand and uh, generation gap is very large. Right. And as you go to more and more renewable electricity, this gap is going to be more and more. And so the duck is going to become fatter and fatter and the fatter it becomes, uh, the more problematic it is. What that means is you have to be able to store all that electricity you produce. So the idea generally would be to capture as much sunlight as you can, to capture as much wind power as you can whenever it is available, 
and then store it. Find some medium to store it. And then, of course, if you store enough of it, you can use it for any time of the day. Sometimes you need to store only for a few hours. Sometimes you need to store for a few weeks, sometimes even months. And therefore, the energy storage is very, very critical. The time of uh, duration for energy storage is very critical as one moves to renewable electricity. Uh, batteries, for example, are good for a few hours of storage. They are not very good for very long term storage. And therefore, if you are looking at a few weeks or a, or a season of storage, it is important that you store it into something that has a material form that is difficult to store electrons, but it's easier to store molecules. OK, so uh, keep, just keep that in mind as we move along. So this is where hydrogen becomes uh, very important. Okay. It is what people call the Swiss knife of energy transition. And it's called the Swiss knife because of the uh, because of its very versatile nature, its ability to convert between electrons and hydrogen and back to electrons. So this conversion between electrons and uh, and the gas molecule uh, is, is a very interesting phenomena. You don't see that for many other fuels. Uh, so the uh, the picture on the left shows that you know you could produce electricity in the grid, pump it into the grid using any of the renewable sources such as solar, wind, nuclear, biomass, and so on. Uh, you can then either store it in the battery, of course, which will happen, but you can also convert it into hydrogen using something called an electrolyzer, which is simply uh, taking water and splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen. And once you generate that hydrogen, the hydrogen can be used for a variety of different applications. You can use it in transportation. You can use it to make synthetic liquid fuels. You can use it to make uh, for, for iron and steel and cement. Uh, you can use it in the power sector and so on. So there's a very large number of uses for, for hydrogen. Uh, and it's so also because it's a molecule, you can store it for a very long time. So you can take the renewable energy and use hydrogen as a long term storage medium. And so that is why uh, it is it is very important uh, as a very interesting energy vector. Uh, there are some first principles that you should know about hydrogen. Uh, people always, when you read about hydrogen, you know you will see, for example, people say it's the most abundant element in the universe. Uh, while that is certainly true, uh, you know we live on on the Earth in the universe, and on the Earth, hydrogen is not available as a gas. Right? It is available in the form of some molecules, so its hydrogen is trapped in the form of molecules, and the most abundant of it is, of course, water. And there are others such as ammonia in which hydrogen is available. But generally, it is trapped. And what that means is two things. One is there are multiple sources of hydrogen, right? As I said, it can be even fossil fuels are made of uh, have hydrogen in it. Uh, water has hydrogen, ammonia has hydrogen, biomass has hydrogen, and so on. So you have multiple sources, and this is very important to to know because when we are dependent on fossil fuels, we are only dependent on either oil or gas, and that's it, right? Uh, but when we look at hydrogen, you have the option of using many, many types of sources, and that makes it uh, more flexible. Uh, it is available also in a decentralized manner, which is different than fossil fuels, where fossil fuels are available only in some parts of the world. Sunlight and, and water are generally available uh, everywhere. So uh, the abundance is there, multiple sources are there, and therefore more flexibility of hydrogen as a fuel. The uh, flip side of it is that uh, you require energy to extract the hydrogen from the molecules in which it is trapped. So hydrogen is not free. You have to, uh, you have to spend some energy and therefore some money to extract the hydrogen from it. That is in general true for all energy sources, even if you have oil and gas, you have to extract the oil and gas from the belly of the earth. Uh, that requires some energy and that requires some cost. But in general, as of today's technology stands, the energy required to extract hydrogen is far more than, uh, than other sources. Hydrogen has very high energy density. Gravimetric energy density is one of the highest among all the known fuels. Volumetric energy density is a little low, and that is because hydrogen, the de the uh, Gravimetric density of hydrogen is, is very, very low. It's the lightest gas that we know of uh, in, in, in our periodic table. I talked about the 
efficiency of conversion between hydrogen and protons and today's technologies are about 50-60% efficient which is a very very significant efficiency and that's one of the big advantages uh, of the flexibility of hydrogen. Hydrogen if you burn of course you get water so hydrogen reacts with oxygen to give you water and liberates a huge amount of energy which is 33.4 kilowatt hour per kg that's the amount of energy that is released when you burn hydrogen. Uh, and the only product of that burning is is water so it's of course zero emission in so far as greenhouse gas emissions are concerned and therefore it's called the clean energy source uh, and as i said it can be stored as a gas molecule for a very very long period of time it's very stable and therefore it allows you to store renewable energy for long durations of time so if you keep all of these first principles in mind you will see that hydrogen is actually an enabler for self-reliance in energy uh, in India, we call it now Atmanirbhar. It's clean energy. And if you have the right technologies, it becomes affordable and accessible. And these are very important features of hydrogen, which is why hydrogen in India is going to be a, one of the most important energy carriers or energy vectors. Uh, so uh, this is what I said. You know, you can produce hydrogen using only solar, wind and water. Uh, you have abundant solar radiation and water in India, fortunately, uh, because India is moving in a big way in solar installations, uh, the price of solar electricity is very rapidly falling and occasionally we are one of the world's lowest uh, uh, solar prices at less than two rupees a unit. It doesn't happen all the time. Uh, it keeps fluctuating. Uh, but we can reach, we have the potential to be one of the cheapest solar electricity producers in the world. And because solar energy is what is required to make hydrogen, cheaper the solar energy, cheaper is the uh, cost of hydrogen. And therefore, as we progress in our ambition for solar energy, uh, it is uh, very clear that we will also try and, you know, we'll, we have the potential to become one of the lowest produce, uh, uh, producers of the cheapest hydrogen in the world. Because solar and uh, water are available very easily in India, it assures us self-reliance in clean energy. Uh, and therefore, if we can produce a very large amount of hydrogen and we have the potential to do that, uh, we can. it can be a game changer for us. Today, we are huge importer of fossil energy. We can actually become uh, an exporter of clean energy in the form of hydrogen. So that's a massive shift for India's strategy. Uh, any new energy vector that you bring in the country and particularly in the renewable sector, it would automatically mean a huge boost to the small medium uh, enterprises sector, SME sector, because it essentially creates a huge amount of jobs. Uh, in fact, there is a very nice report by McKinsey that says that uh, for every megawatt of electricity uh, energy, as you move from fossil to renewables, you will create actually seven times more jobs, right? So this is in every possible way, hydrogen is, is, is a very, very good news for India. Uh, it's not just for India, hydrogen is, uh, you know, metaphorically heating up everywhere in the world. Uh, there is huge amount of activity, huge amount of interest with almost every part of the world today. Uh, there are today about 360 very large scale, megawatt scale, hundreds of megawatt scale projects around the world. Uh, the uh, circles that you see on the graph uh, are where the hydrogen projects are ongoing uh, and huge amount of investments are happening, uh, you know, to the tune of uh, uh, 500 billion dollars. Energy carriers or energy vectors. Uh, so uh, this is what I said, you know, you can produce hydrogen using only solar, wind and water. Uh, Abundant solar radiation and water in India. Fortunately, uh, because India is moving in a big way in solar installations. Yeah, uh, Monica Rana ka on hai ke mic. Solar electricity is very rapid. I think some mic is on somewhere. Okay. We are one of the world's lowest uh, uh, solar prices at less than two rupees a unit. Monica, I I think it was by mistake. That's how it it was sorry. open. Sorry, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry about solar that. Yeah, Monica Rana, your uh, Monica Rana, phone over here. Yeah, please go ahead, Arthur. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, there are very large such projects and very large investments happening across the world. And uh, one of the biggest driver for hydrogen is is climate change. Uh, there is a sixth uh, assessment report by IPCC that has just been launched, 
and it's a wonderful report i you know i suggest uh, uh, at least some of you uh, who are interested in this in understanding more about this problem to read this report the report is of course huge it's a humongous report but they have a very nice technical summary that itself is about 50 pages long but it's really worth reading it's full of beautiful uh, pictures and graphs uh, it's a pictorial demonstration of the main findings of this report and one such picture is what is shown here and basically what it shows here is is that every region in the world every geographical region in the world is today facing some amount some uh, uh, repercussions of climate change either it's you know climate is getting hotter and drier uh, or, or it's get, facing a lot more cyclones of very high intensity and very high frequency uh, very large amount of increase in precipitation uh, with the these the polar caps uh, ice caps uh, melting away and so on so today uh, it's not climate change is not just uh, focused on a few regions or a few countries is actually affecting practically every single country in the world and this is the main driver as i said earlier also for climate change the other important reason why hydrogen is there's a huge excitement in the sphere of hydrogen is is because the technologies for hydrogen in every part of the value chain that is generation storage distribution and utilization uh, in all these parts of value chain the technologies have become extremely mature they have reached very high trl levels there are now economies of scale coming in because uh, these technologies are now getting implemented at very large scale and with scale the costs come down which is called the economy of scale uh, and you will see here in these pictures there are there is a gigawatt factory for making electrolyzer there is a gigawatt factory for making fuel cells uh, there are very large carbon fiber plants that uh, are used to make high pressure cylinders and there are many uh, vehicles today right from smaller cars to to trains and even a steel plant today that is now using hydrogen instead of coal for converting iron ore into into pig iron and then and then steel so these are the very interesting uh, developments that have happened in the past few uh, years where hydrogen is now becoming uh, a reality uh, historically hydrogen has gone through many hypes you know uh, it, it's this is not the first time that there is excitement about hydrogen in the world it has gone through something like 5 to 7 hypes in the past but every hype has just fizzled out in the past because of the fact that climate change was not such a uh, big driver at that point of time people had not yet re realized uh, the repercussions of it and the technologies for hydrogen were not as mature as they are today so today's hype in my, in in my opinion and many others also feel that it, this is not going to fizzle away it's actually going to turn into reality so what are the opportunities for hydrogen in india uh, very uh, simply put there are near term opportunities mid term and long term opportunities and i have listed some of them here uh, i'll not go through all of them but say that in the near term i believe that india will very quickly become a large producer of very cheap hydrogen and while the indian markets are still evolving uh, there are already opportunities available outside uh, for india to export hydrogen so in to me the nearest uh, term opportunity for india is actually producing a large amount of hydrogen and exporting it start exporting it uh, the other thing is you know many times if you go on the coastal regions you will see that there are big refineries there and there are lot of industries around that refinery you typically find a fertilizer complex you will typically find a steel plant uh, you will find a glass plant you may find cement plants and so on so around these refineries Uh, there are also or rather around the coastal region there are also these large plants which are clustered together and that could be an interesting model where you have one common hydrogen generation facility which is a green hydrogen that is produced by water splitting and then there are that hydrogen is simply piped to uh, all the users the industries around that region right so this captive cluster consumption model could be a very interesting way to move forward in the mid term Uh, we can think of moving all our heavy duty vehicles you know we in india today are the second largest truck manufacturers in the world we have very very large number of trucks on the road uh, and in fact most of our freight transport happens on the road not in the railways okay and uh, all of these trucks today of of course emitting a huge amount of uh, uh, particulate matter as well as 
greenhouse gas and it's possible to convert them into into hydrogen which would be clean and decentralized uh, zero emission technologies uh, but you need to set up the whole infrastructure for refueling hydrogen you know for example along a mumbai delhi corridor a freight corridor which is the most dense corridor in the country you would need at least 30 to 35 refueling stations for hydrogen if you can do that uh, and you have enough trucks converted into using hydrogen uh, then the you know along that corridor the entire truck transport can move from pet, uh, from diesel uh, to hydrogen and you can then scale that up across the country so that requires a lot of infrastructure setup and therefore that is coming most likely to come in the mid term and then the more difficult ones such as uh, converting an existing steel plant from coal to hydrogen or setting the right grid infrastructure uh, and bringing in hydrogen to balance the grid are a little long term technologies because they require a lot more infrastructure. Uh, globally, we believe that you know uh, you require you will require about 40 gigawatts of green hydrogen equivalent. Right? That's about 4 million tons of uh, hydrogen just for Japan another four to eight million tons for European Union and many more to come up. So hydrogen is going to be traded across the world. CO2 is going to be traded across the world, right? And so it's a very interesting energy vector where uh, trading across the world will become very important and India can play a big role in that, in that trade. India's own internal potential is anywhere between today's six million tons per annum to as much as 25 million tons per annum. I'm being a little... Uh, generous in saying, you know, at, at least hit 12 million tons per annum. That's doubling the hydrogen potential in India. That itself is a very large amount of hydrogen consumption potential for the country. 60% uh, of our trucks, if we move by 2030 to hydrogen, that's about six to seven lakh trucks uh, in India. That's a very large number of trucks that can be moved to hydrogen uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, we make and use about 1 lakh DG sets, diesel generator sets per year in India, and all of them can potentially move to hydrogen. So in India, the hydrogen potential is just very, very significant, and there is a huge trade market available also for, for hydrogen. So that's those are the opportunities for hydrogen. But if you really want to ask what really are the opportunities, then you have to deep drive, and you have to look at the production part, the, the storage transportation part, and the utilization part. Uh, this is the value chain of hydrogen and you will see that there are actually opportunities for India in every part of this value chain. For example, in the hydrogen generation, electrolysis, which is water splitting, uh, is the biggest uh, opportunity for India. And that's, as I said, is because our solar prices are coming down, rapidly falling down. Water is available in general. We have a 7,500 kilometer coastline from which water can be used. Uh, you, of course, have to today purify it, but people are looking at seawater desalination and uh, use, using that for hydrogen right away, uh, straight away, or using seawater itself for generating hydrogen. So all of that is, is going to happen. So there's a huge potential there. Uh, some of the numbers that I have said here, I, I think I'm nearing about 11 o'clock, so I don't want to uh, get into many details of this. Uh, I'll be happy to share this presentation with you. There are some numbers that I have given uh, and these are the targets for the cost of hydrogen, uh, for the energy consumption required to produce hydrogen and, and so on. So, you know, electrolysis is the biggest uh, opportunity for India today. There are many technologies for electrolysis. There's a PEM technology, there's a anion exchange membrane technology and so on. Which technology will come into India will depend on who is going to use it, where it is going to use and so on. So eventually you will find all these technologies coming into India. Just like today you're fine, you know, you say diesel uh, motor, right? But every vehicle actually has a slightly different diesel motor, slightly different technologies. So all these technologies will eventually come into India and so will this electrolysis technologies. Today's hydrogen is produced by the process of reforming or gasification. And that also uh, releases a lot of CO2. For example, by reforming every ton of hydrogen you produce will release anywhere between 8 to 10 tons of carbon dioxide. So this is called gray hydrogen. And today that is what is uh, produced. And of course, you don't want that CO2 emissions. And therefore, eventually reforming will, uh, will come down and electrolysis will pick up. There's a third option, which is pyrolysis. 
which is a very interesting option where you take the same fuel which is uh, which is natural gas for example which is methane right and that methane could be fossil methane or it could even be biomethane uh, and you split the methane molecule yeah you actually uh, split it into carbon and hydrogen fundamentally what you are doing is you are actually breaking carbon hydrogen bonds and you are reforming carbon carbon bonds uh, and those of you who are well versed with chemistry know how difficult it is to break bonds and create new bonds in particular carbon carbon bonds are not very easy to to make so this is a very challenging problem very interesting uh, r and d happening in this area but if you can do it uh, it this is a way by which you can produce hydrogen without any co2 emissions number one so it's green hydrogen number 2 you can actually make carbon and valorize it for example if you convert that carbon uh, into carbon black you have the entire tire industry available for you to sell the carbon black and carbon black is a pretty high price commodity product uh, if you can sell it if you make it the right quality and sell it you will practically get hydrogen as, as a free by product right so this is not only clean green hydrogen but more or less free green hydrogen so pyrolysis is a technology Uh, that has been around for almost 50 years but uh, the reason it is not yet commercially practiced is because there is some very beautiful science that is left undone it's not fully understood yet and it's fundamentally about how do you break carbon hydrogen bonds and form carbon carbon bonds right? some beautiful catalysis uh, and new ways of uh, doing this reaction like plasma pyrolysis uh, are all being under development today so any of you interested in doing good science in this area there is a lot of opportunity here going to storage and distribution uh, there are at least four technologies which are coming up in a big way the first is called compressed gas hydrogen so here you actually pressurize hydrogen to as much as 350 bar all the way to 1000 bar that's 1000 times the atmospheric pressure and you fill it up into carbon fiber cylinders which are transported across which can be transported for very long distances carbon fiber is a phenomenal material one of the most advanced materials the toyota car hydrogen car actually has uh, about 7 uh, and 1/2 kilograms of hydrogen stored in the car in the form of these carbon fiber cylinders and there are videos you can go on youtube and see you fire a bullet into this cylinder uh, it takes a couple of bullets or more to actually a tear through the carbon fiber cylinder tank so it's it's so robust the car overturns nothing happens to it so these are very mature technologies today and can be easily used there are three other technologies that are listed on this slide which i will not get into but some very interesting chemistry is happening in all of these areas either organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry happening in this area and the last one is a membrane technology where Uh, you could imagine pumping hydrogen along with natural gas right and this is very important because today natural gas grid is available in the country there are large very large pipelines running across the length and breadth of the country where natural gas is being pumped today so you could mix that natural gas with hydrogen it can be transported over thousands of kilometers and where you want to use it you take the mixture out and using membrane technology separate the hydrogen from it right and this would be one of the cheapest ways of transporting hydrogens the other is of course through pipelines and there is some very beautiful technology coming up in composite pipes for uh, for transporting hydrogen over large distances so again these are for materials people uh, those interested in material science these are enormous opportunities for some beautiful science and some wonderful technology Uh, that can be developed for this very interesting clean energy source the last one is in the area of hydrogen utilization this is the third part of the hydrogen value chain where you actually use hydrogen to reproduce the energy right and uh, there are three important utilization sectors here the stationary power generation which are all our backup powers uh, like a dg set transportation where you replace a diesel engine or a petrol engine with a hydrogen engine and in the steel sector where you replace carbon which is used for reducing iron ore to to hydrogen and in all of these a uh, lot of technology development has happened lot more will uh, will happen in the future uh, for example in the fuel cells for transportation application where my laboratory has done a lot of work uh, there is again some exquisite 
nano material technology development that is happening all kinds of beautiful catalysts are being developed today uh, you think of a wonderful nano sized engineering that uh, that is possible and you can do it at this catalyst level uh, to make very very efficient catalysts similarly membranes similarly porous uh, carbon fiber papers that are all used in these uh, devices that are called fuel cells uh, there's a lot of engineering that is required to be done in these fuel cells uh, and uh, when you do all of that properly you can get efficiencies at a system level of of the order of 50% and this is very very important because if you look at a diesel or a petrol engine today you can barely get about 30 to you know if you're lucky you really go to very high technology you get about 40% efficiency but generally our uh, petrol engines or diesel engines give you about 30 Uh, 35% efficiency and here you are you know in a fuel cell you are starting at 50% efficiency and we this is just the beginning of the technology development there's so much to happen and people are saying today that we can go up to 60 65% efficient engines so you are almost doubling the efficiency of the engine from today's level at the same time with zero emissions so this is where this whole technology development is happening and it all looks very very exciting and it involves great material science beautiful chemistry fantastic engineering great advanced materials everything coming together to make these whole systems in addition to that you have of course uh, you know uh, motor development uh, dc dc converter developments automotive engineering happening so it's it's really a, a bed of innovation uh, for all kinds of uh, technologies to come in and develop these uh, new things uh so uh, let me skip uh, some of these slides uh, realizing the potential for green hydrogen in india uh, we have suggested as part of csir some of these things that will be required for india to really uh, reach the potential of our green hydrogen right we have to incentivize make in india in uh, all these technologies eventually have to be made manufactured in india we don't want to it to be like the solar you know we we sort of missed the solar bus uh, and what i mean by that is although we are installing huge solar uh, capacities in in the country the solar panels are made elsewhere you know and they are importing them that should not happen for hydrogen this is the time right now where we if we push the right policies for make in india uh, we will avoid all these import uh, importing of these technologies so for that we have to really leverage indian r&d i believe csr will have a huge role to play in that we have to leverage our r&d innovation bring engineering together to develop these technologies we have to run very large pilots across the country india is a very large country you can't just run one or two pilots you have to run many large pilot projects across most cities in india in most geographies most climatic conditions everywhere we have to run these pilots so that we understand this technology even better uh very interestingly uh renewables as i said are can be produced in a decentralized manner uh, because you get solar radiation available anywhere in the country water is water sources are available in most part of the country so you can practically produce hydrogen anywhere so it's a decentralized hydrogen production we today are one of the best digitalized infrastructure country right uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of kilometers of optical fiber already there our Uh, it network our it capabilities are humongous we are actually producing a huge amount of software and know how for digitalization of the world so we are a very rich country in terms of resources for digitalization so if you combine decentralization and digitalization you can actually use these two very important factors for decarbonization so we call it the 3 d's decentralization and digitalization for decarbonization and i think india has a huge potential to do this we have to have a lot of standards for safety and regulations hydrogen is not a easy molecule to deal with a uh, very large explosive hazard so we have to have the right standards and we have to do what is called harmonizing our standards with global standards uh, we need to set up mechanism for very quick regulatory clearances Uh, and and so on and we need of course a huge amount of skilled workforce to to install all these hydrogen technologies in the country so at a csir level we are proposing to create a special purpose vehicle we are create uh, hoping to create a hydrogen mission where we can do uh, uh, 
all of these uh, activities and we can support the government in building the national hydrogen mission for for the country and i believe csr will have a huge role to play and we can do a lot of things uh, for india in this in this domain we are already doing a lot of things these are many technologies that in various of our labs uh, we are already uh, producing we have a lot of prototypes that we've done what we need to do is really now scale it up uh, and target even better efficiencies uh, bring together all of these expertise under one umbrella into one mission uh, bring together all the minds uh, the very fertile minds that we have uh, to to follow one goal right and if we can do that i think csr can certainly take the leadership in india to go end to end from beautiful science to good technology and scale up and implementation and we of course have a huge connect with industry and and not, these technologies cannot be realized unless you have industry on board so we we are the people in csir who can uh, with our very deep connects with industry bring them on board right to get all actors in the value chain together these are some of the important demonstrations that we have made in the past uh, a fuel cell car and a fuel cell stationary system on the right side uh, for supporting our telecom towers uh, and so on so i have listed here i'm not going to read them at all for you there are many many scientific opportunities i've mentioned here very specific targets and anyone who wants to do some good science uh, all of these are actually great targets uh, fertile to do very very good science uh, and these are some of the targets that we will pursue in our hydrogen mission in csir so in the end i will say that scientists engineers innovators investors policy makers all of them every one of them will have a major role to play in building the hydrogen economy in india we will all have to come together and csir in particular uh, will play in my opinion i have no doubt about it will play a very very important role in building the hydrogen vision for india so with that i will end my presentation here and i thank you once again for listening to me uh, so patiently what a presentation uh, dr lele i think very very informative presentation and uh, i think fantastic uh, before i have so many questions i think first uh, dr mande sir if you have to ask anything or you want to make any comment so no i think let the students ask questions that's better okay. students sure. will challenge you better than i do so. <laughs> yes vikas and uh, all our students over to you now thank you sir it's quite amazing to think about that is first element of our periodic table has so much fantastic and marvelous properties i am actually love the science fiction so i watched two many science fiction movies and i saw that hydrogen based uh, energies are uh, coming in next 100 or 200 centuries this is our future and is definitely transform our human civilization but sir i have such just uh, simple little questions one quiz that what are the present uh, status of the safety and preservation of that hydrogen economy because i think it is highly inflammable and uh, so this is the first question and second is um, as we are from a, a bioresource uh, himalayan bioresource institute uh, can uh, you can you give us some little glimpse or any direction so we can also move towards the hydrogen economy sir please very nice question because thank you and first a very important question of uh, safety for hydrogen i think it's a very very important question because uh, one of the most flammable materials as you very rightly said uh, the uh, lel for for hydrogen is just 4% right so we mix 4% hydrogen in oxygen and it becomes a very flammable mixture right uh, however uh, people have learned how to deal with hydrogen you know if you go to refineries Uh, hydrogen for them is actually you know i i was also surprised how comfortable people in refining sector are in dealing with hydrogen it's just one more gas for them if you have the right engineering uh, done for which technologies are already known hydrogen is not such a difficult gas to deal with okay number one so it's it's a matter of having the right regulatory regulations the right standards and the right engineering to to follow those standards okay uh, there should be no shortcuts there so regulations as i said in my talk also harmonizing india's 
standards, the Indian standards with the global standards is one of the first things that we must do. In one of the recent discussions with MNRE that I had, uh, we are proposing to create a small team uh, which comprises uh, people from industry and academia and so on to actually join a global effort today to harmonize standards for hydrogen. That is an ongoing process today. And we are hoping that uh, MNRE will also depute some Indian people uh, on those uh, global teams to harmonize the Indian standards with it. Okay, So it's a matter of just doing it the right way. The technologies are already in place. Right. Uh, the second question about uh, what can IHBT or you know, uh, research labs like yours in your region can contribute. And in fact, uh, let me tell you that Ladakh is one of the regions where uh, it has the highest potential for renewables in the country. Huge amount of solar radiation, fantastic wind capacity. And if you look at the intensity of solar radiation and wind versus the duration in the day, uh, when solar tapers out, wind picks up. Okay, and and so uh, there is something called uh, uh, you know it's it's basically how much percentage of the 24 hours in a day can you use renewable, okay, and for Ladakh is as much as 40 to 42 percent, which is the highest in the country. Anywhere else, it is ranging anywhere between 18 percent to 25 percent, and Ladakh is beyond 40 percent. Okay, so huge potential in the Himalayan region for generating renewable electricity. What we need is good regulatory policies to pump that electricity into the grid, transmit it over longer distances and produce hydrogen elsewhere. Okay, And why I'm saying that is because if you want to export hydrogen, which is a huge market, ready market available today, okay, it's better that you put the electrolyzers on the east coast. Even better if you were to put electrolyzers on something like the Andaman Nicobar Islands, okay, where there is a huge port that is being planned. You can produce, why not produce hydrogen in one of those one of those islands? Why not convert it into green ammonia there? And your entire geography for Far East, you know, Japan, Korea uh, becomes easily available to you. These countries are hungry for hydrogen today. Japan alone is is saying we want three to four million tons of hydrogen per annum because they don't have land to produce hydrogen. They don't have sunlight to produce hydrogen. They will be importers of hydrogen. Why should hydrogen come from Australia? Why should hydrogen come from Middle East? Why can it not come from East Coast of India or uh, an island like Andaman Nicobar, right? So huge potentials uh, for what India can do in this sector. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I invite all the scholars. Uh, the session is open for discussion. I think uh, Rohit Joshi from IHVT wants to ask something. Uh, sir, uh, one of my question is: uh, 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 Can you brief about what are what are the advancement we have uh, made? Uh, 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 while we move from the first generation biofuel uh, to now the fourth generation biofuel that are coming uh, 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 in our way. Uh, that's, that's all. Yeah, so uh, biofuels, of course, uh, 2G ethanol is is uh, really coming up in a big way now. Uh, people are now talking of 3G, 4G ethanol also, but essentially from cellulose to ethanol uh, is, is what uh, is the holy grail. So today, world over, you know, today you can import ethanol from US and from Brazil, the two largest producers of ethanol. And in the US, it is coming from cornstarch. In Brazil, it is coming from uh, sugarcane. Right. Uh, in India, we shouldn't be using starch because it's part of our food chain. We should be using something else. Sugarcane, yes, but it's even better not to use. Uh, sugar but to use uh, byproducts like molasses like uh, uh, bagasse so cellulose to ethanol is uh, is really the holy grail a lot of work is happening in that area in fact some of the world leading companies globally leading companies are india yeah? one of them is sitting right next to me in pune it's called praj industries it's one of the global leaders in making ethanol uh, bioethanol from biosources 
including from cellulose also these technologies are at a reasonable trl levels they are getting piloted now the economic viability is still doubted doubtful uh, but let me tell you that when we talk about economic viability we never really consider the cost of greenhouse gas emission we don't really put a tax on carbon and as a country our stand is that since our carbon emissions per capita are far lower than the global average and since we have not emitted all of those greenhouse gases today that are causing a problem our stand has been that we will not tax our our taxpayers for carbon for carbon emissions although we are globally the third largest emitter in the world okay our per capita consumption uh, emission is very low so it is unlikely that india will put any serious carbon tax in it okay and therefore unfortunately we will have to compare any biofuel or for that matter any other fuel with the existing fossil fuels that is the reality okay so in that sense uh, the biofuels are not there yet in terms of their economic viability technologies are getting developed to reach economic viability is going to require many more things thank you sir so we have no other hands raised if anybody is having any kind of query you can please raise your hand uh, let me can i just one thing you know dr lele sir can i just ask you one thing sure sure thanks i think that's a very nice observation you had uh, that our ladakh region has huge amount of potential because if you see the population density in some of the places is 2 person per square kilometer and you have around 50000 square kilometer area available and we can certainly utilize and along with ladakh if you see the cold desert areas of himachal pradesh which are which is around uh, say approximately 10 to 11000 square kilometers so it if you add both of them together and again the population density there is around 3 or 4 uh, persons per square kilometer so huge potential actually exists if you utilize some of our uh, these cold desert area for areas of our country and uh, uh, it can really play very very significant role so if we think of if we are thinking of making such thing into policy i think uh, two of these states really can play very significant role so i fully agree with what you are telling yeah. you know these two states have tremendous potential and sure i think and uh, what you said is right after 2 o'clock a uh, strong wind is start in these places and very difficult to stand so while the sun disappears winds come in and uh, once we visit those places then we experience it and i am sure that in arunachal pradesh also there sh there should be some such situations and also somewhere in uttarakhand so i think sir it will be very prudent to put this policy if you if you are moving towards this hydrogen uh, side i think it will be very prudent if we include some of these areas uh, for electricity generation and push it for hydrogen pro production so just yeah. wanted to add to this point absolutely absolutely yeah thank you i see one more hand here Yes, Doctor Nial, please. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Good morning, sir. It was a very nice presentation, and as our director said, that Ladakh and cold desert regions of India provide a very nice opportunity. Uh, sir, in these cold desert regions, you have a typical climate, sir, or a weather condition. Ah, uh, it is very, very high temperature during the day time. and extremely cold in the evening hours so what type of challenges such sort of environmental condition pose with regards to this hydrogen fuel sir so any your comments on this sir yeah very very, very nice question sanjay ji uh, thank you sir uh, 
so in in this uh, renewable energy generation uh, part of it for example in in uh, solar pv the materials of constructions have to be such especially ceilings uh, and the kind of glass that is used uh, is it has to be such that it it survives large uh, temperature changes because temperature changes induces thermal expansions right and uh, because they are never single material they are always a combination of various uh, materials so you have uh, you have plastic films you uh, as as encapsulating agent you have silicon wafers you have glass uh, you have uh, silver based adhesives so the multiple uh, materials that are put together to make a solar panel and every material has a different thermal expansion coefficient so if you go through very large uh, temperature changes during 24 hours Uh, all of these thermal changes the expansion coefficients uh, will cause problems they will induce stresses in the materials and it could result into cracking of glass cracking of silicon wafers and 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 so on so these are the challenges that one has to face although the technologies for this already are there because uh, these panels have been installed in many such locations in the world and if you select the right uh, type of glass you select the right ceilings uh, for for the panels uh, then these thermal expansions can be certainly taken care of uh, on the utilization side where hydrogen is used let us say in a fuel cell engine in an automotive uh, uh, you know like a truck or a, or a bus or a car uh, at very on very cold days uh, the water can freeze right and in fuel cells you generate water because hydrogen would react with oxygen and gen- generate water and if you have that water freezing in your fuel cell your fuel cell will shut down right now fortunately the reaction of hydrogen with oxygen is a highly exothermic reaction and therefore when the reaction happens the uh, a lot of heat is generated so you have to use that heat to make sure that freezing doesn't happen okay so today fuel cells are demonstrated in almost all geographies you know in in norway sweden iceland all the way to california desert uh you know, or even cars have run in sub saharan africa so fuel cell technology also has been demonstrated and is robust enough to survive uh, all these extreme climatic conditions right uh, so the technologies are in place today what is not in place today is the the demonstration of these technologies in india you know on at large scale so that's why i said that we must have several pilots that we should conduct in many cities and in multiple climatic conditions that are prevalent in the country so that we can really check how these technologies survive in india right so you know to answer to your question is uh, that the technologies are in place but we need to really prove them and and validate it for our indian climatic conditions thank you so much sir thank you sir thank you thank you sir okay now we will take one more quick question uh pralay sir yes uh, am i am i audible yes sir yeah so uh, first of all i would like to say that uh, thank you uh, dr rashis lele uh, you know as a chemist we always you know uh, attended your number of talks and really you teach us that uh, how the hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells is important uh, so i i don't have actually you know uh, any questions on doubt or doubt whatever the things you have told everything is clear uh, but just uh, i wanted to only ask one question uh, from the bio resource related you know that uh, as the and one question actually asked by our one scientist then you know we have a huge actually bio waste generated and all these bio waste contains huge quantity of carbohydrates or uh, hydrogen content and you know that recently number of technologies actually came to convert this bio waste to some solid materials so every time sometime i thought that if we uh, every times converted this bio waste to the solid materials then you know that the quantity of uh, carbon it is not coming exactly in the environment again uh, when we are talking about fossil fuels then it is okay because we have a huge quantity of you know another source of carbon and uh, then it is coming in the nature after this use 
But when uh, we look in the present status, means that whatever the environment is producing carbohydrates as a bio waste, then if the equal quantity of carbon, it will not come in the environment, then in a long term, sometimes I thought that it would break this balance. So uh, what is your opinion? So I thought that it is, it is okay that if we produce through the electrolysis from water, water to hydrogen, it is important. But at the same time, equally, I think that it is also important that we should have to think that the carbohydrate it produces, it captures the carbon, it should again come in the environment by anyhow, either to the fuel development or anything. But it should not be, the balance should always remain. So what is your opinion in this regard, Simon? Yeah, very interesting uh, thought, uh, Pillai. Uh, see, first of all, the climate change, if you look at what is causing, what has caused the concern on climate change? Okay, so if you trace human history and carbon emissions uh, for the past several millennia, what is interesting now is that in the last 150 to 200 years, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has really jumped up from what it used to be 100 or below ppm to now 450 plus ppm targeting now almost 500 ppm uh, in the near future and this jump has happened only in the last 150 years right what i'm trying to say here is that when we were not emitting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through uh, use of fossil fuel there was a carbon cycle already existing. For several millennia, it was working fine. Right? The carbon cycle is a very natural cycle in, in, uh, on, on our planet. And, and it, it retains the carbon balance. What we have done is disturbed that carbon balance. Right? We, in the last 150 years, through the Industrial Revolution, we have actually disrupted that carbon balance. And that is the main source of it. So even if today we stop emitting fossil fuels, stop emitting our uh, CO2, uh, the planet will return back to its normal carbon cycle. Now, I, I mean, theoretically, if that happens, it will return back to its uh, original carbon cycle. So stopping emissions from fossil fuel is not going to hurt the ecology in, in any way. Natural, nature has already found its uh, equilibrium and will go back to that equilibrium. Uh, in terms of using biomass uh, for energy, my personal opinion is that, you know, biomass has so many wonderful atoms in it. You have a lot of carbon, you have a lot of nitrogen, you have oxygen, sulfur. If you just convert that into hydrogen, you are uh, wasting all the other atoms unnecessarily. And in fact, hydrogen is the lightest atom, right? So you're actually wasting a lot of other mass for the lowest mass, which is hydrogen, for extracting the lowest mass from the biomass. So my personal opinion is that with all the biomass residue, one should only look at biofuels where, which are what we call oxygenated biofuels, uh, like methanol, like ethanol, right? Mm -hmm. Where carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, at least all of those are valorized, not only hydrogen. Okay, so that will be a far better option than converting biomass into, into hydrogen. That is a very personal opinion. Uh, there are other people who think otherwise, and there's a huge uh, interest today of converting biomass into hydrogen. Uh, but at a personal level, I feel it's better to take biomass, and if you want to use it for energy, uh, convert it into oxy oxygenated fuels. That is a much better option. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for sharing your valuable insights. And uh, your speech has certainly broadened our horizon of knowledge. I'm sure that hydrogen economy will be the next important shift in energy transition. And uh, your speech today will certainly motivate our young scholars to work on such demanding issues. Now, uh, I would like to share with you all a memorable event of 2019, a glimpse of student seminar series when it was conducted uh, offline uh, before the COVID era. So let's have a look.
But that sir, this lecture had been phenomenal, I would say. And it Thank has you so much for inviting me, Dr. Sanjay ji. It is my absolute pleasure to be here, and I really look forward to visiting you sometime. Yes, because you know we work on bioeconomy, so we will add now hydrogen hydrogen economy along with that. So I think some some thoughts have clicked in. We will be in touch with you, and we will have a lot, lot of discussion on this issue, Dr. Sir. Thank you I so think much. Fantastic exposure to uh, this area. Fantastic exposure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So over to students. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, your screen is st still sharing. So kindly unshare your screen. Sorry, I have unshared. Thank you, sir. enjoyed this and uh, now we will move with our further uh, session which is a very uh, special section and uh, in this we will uh, this is an expression of gratitude and this uh, respect to our astonishing indian gurus in the field of science this is a small effort to bring awareness about their tremendous contributions and to take motivation from their exceptional life so we will familiarize you with our uh, heroes who have done exceptional work in the field of science Our first hero is So first is Acharya Sir Prafulla Chandra Ray uh, he had discovered the formation of mercurious nitrate and in 1901 he founded the Bengal Chemical and Pharmaceutical Works Limited. The next eminent personality is Shankar Abhachi Bhishe. He was a revolutionary Indian inventor of the 19th century. Uh, he created an automatic flushing toilet, a telephone, and several kitchen gadgets. His most significant contribution was the show type of printing press. The next eminent personality is Rai Bahadur Sir Upendranath Brahmachari. He was the first to identify a skin infection which occurs in patients who have recovered from kalazar and it was named as brahmachari lashminoid after him he also discovered urea stibamine uh, the next is gopal swami dora swami naidu he was india's first indigenous uh, he has developed first indigenous motor in 1937 and uh, his efforts and donations also set the foundation of india's first polytechnic college that is the arthur cope polytechnic college uh, next we will like to introduce janki amal she was a female scientist who sweetened india by her work on sugar cane she was also the first indian botanist and uh, she had two awards uh, two awards were also instituted in her name one is uh, janki amal national award on plant taxonomy and janki amal national award on animal taxonomy to honor her contributions janki amal herbarium has been established in tripalayam jammu which consists of more than 21000 washer specimens representing 3254 species of medical aromatic and economic plants the next scientist is again a lady she is kamala sohani and uh, she has done work on jaggery and molasses she also received rashtrapati award for her work 
She was the founding member of Consumer Guidance Society of India. Next is Kamal Dalavi. Uh, her efforts led the foundation of Cancer Research Center and boosted it to have the first tissue culture laboratory in the entire company in, in the entire country. Uh, she happened to be the first scientist to pioneer cancer study through animal models. She also founded Indian Women Scientists Association in Bombay in 1973. The next uh, personality is Anna Mani. She was the Deputy Director General of Indian Meteorological Department, Pune, and made significant contributions in the field of meteorological instrumentation. In 1980s, she published two books that are considered to be standard reference text for budding scientists, The Handbook of Solar Radiation Data for India and Solar Radiation Over India. Uh, next uh, personality is Professor Dr. Gokul Nanda Mahapatra. He had authored over 95 science fiction and children's science books like Prithrim Upgraha, Prithvi Bhare Manisha and Madam Curie. He was the first Udiya who got Kalinga Prize for the popularization of science by UNESCO in 2010. And last, I would like to tell you about Dr. Ashok Sain. His recent important works include the attractive mechanism and the precision accounting of microstates of black holes and new developments in string perturbation theory. He received many prestigious awards like Infosys Prize in Mathematical Sciences, Fundamental Pri Physics Prize, Padma Bhushan, Derek Medal and Padma Shri in 2001. So I hope you will take inspiration from such uh, personalities who have captivated the globe with their work and uh, will follow their footsteps. All the best to all of you to enhance your scientific zeal. And uh, now Amit will carry you all forward with the next session. Thank you, Bali <coughs> My name is Amit Kumar and uh, I'm a PhD scholar in CSI IHBT and one of the conveners of a fifth student seminar series. I welcome you all to a fifth student seminar series 2021. And first of all, I wish you all happy Teachers' Day. Now it's time to invite our very own alumni who have joined us across the world. First of all, I would like to invite Dr. Dheeraj Vyas, who holds principal scientist position in our sister institute, uh, CSIR Triple M Jammu. Uh, Dr. Dheeraj Vyas has done his PhD in ecophysiology and adaptive bio biology uh, from CSIR Triple uh, CSIR IHBT Palampur. Uh, back in 2004, when internet was not accessible for everyone. From the era of no internet to connecting virtually today, it's been a long journey for Dr. Dheeraj. He has ex experience of teaching and uh, research for more than 20 years. He worked at University of uh, Florida on uh, regulation of cysteine synthesis in soybean. His work at uh, CSIR Triple M focuses on the regulation of the adaptive mechanism of high altitude plants in Ladakh. He is interested in elucidating adaptive biology, including the role of biotic factors at different level of organization and stresses, and understanding the role of genes, proteome, and metabolome in cold arid ecosystems. He has published large number of research articles in highly reputative national and international journals. Today, the talk of his talk is, uh, the topic of his talk is deciphering Shangshou, a researcher's paradise. Over to you, Dr. Dheeraj Vyas. Thank you so much. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Uh, what a great day today when I am sharing the uh, dais with my own respected uh, guru, Dr. Sanjay Kumar. So it's a great pleasure to be invited by the organizing committee. I really thank you all. Uh, Honorable DG, Dr. Shekhar Mande, sir. Uh, Honorable Director IHBT Dr. Sanjay Kumar, uh, Honorable Director uh, NCL Pune, Dr. Ashish Lele. What a great start to this event. I really wish I, it would have been offline event. I first of all asked the organizers that if it could be offline, I would be very happy so that I could also have worn that yellow t-shirt or the white t-shirt uh, as you all have worn. But uh, we all know that due to the pandemic situation, we, it is not possible. But the technology has made us you know, 
common today. And we are sharing my experiences with internet. So uh, I I would like first of all see whether I uh, screen can, is my screen visible? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So now I am putting it in presentation mode. So is it in presentation mode? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So the first uh, thing is to wish you all a happy Teachers Day. And I would always say to my students also that everyone is a teacher. So we should all wish each other like Teachers Day because we learn so much things from our uh, not only from our teachers but also from our students and colleagues. So when the organizing committee asked me to deliver a talk, I was very because the theme of the uh, you know the today's uh, uh, seminar is you know multidisciplinary science. So I was uh, uh, excited to say that uh, what could be the my the topic of my uh, talk. So I thought the first thing that the teacher should put inculcate in the uh, mind of a student is query. So I thought of giving this title. This is like deciphering Sangshu. A researcher's paradise. I am quite certain that at least a few of you must have googled this word. So Sangshu is, uh, you know, it's a plant of Ladakh. So my talk will be very, very useful. You know, it will be in continuation with what uh, the earlier speaker had already been, you know, talking about. And in the very fantastic lecture of Dr. Lele, we all heard about the potential of Ladakh. He talked about the potential of Ladakh from the other perspective, energy perspective, and we will. I will talk about the potential of Ladakh in a, in a slightly different perspective. So why it is a researcher's paradise? I will come to that later. First of all, it is my I will be failing in my duty if I don't pay respect to my honorable guru, Dr. Sanjay Kumar. It is in IHBT that I you know, joined as this young boy in uh, February 1998. And it has uh, been 20 years and still the path shown by Dr. Sanjay when he took me to Spiti region, the cold desert region of Himachal Pradesh. It was so fascinating and the kind of words he put in in my ears that this is a gold mine. I really tell you that his words still, you know, they echo in my head and I really can after 20 years, I can tell you, sir, that whatever you said that it is a gold mine, it was very much true. And I really uh, appreciate and thank you for your uh, words of wisdom during that time. And uh, in 20 years, it, I have been also been fortunate that I got the opportunity to work in cold desert, which you showed me, and uh, and still I am working in the cold desert. Another thing I would like to put here is that when uh, it is not, people have seen that people go to Ladakh and then they uh, do their science. We, along with Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Sanjay took us in his, uh, you know, there was a gypsy at that time and it was a two by two gypsy and we used to keep our spectrophotometers, our irgas, our all the instruments in that um, vehicle and we used to go there during that time there was no laboratory in Ladakh. So we used to take our uh, instruments and we used to perform research on the spot. So Dr. Sanjay used always used to say that when you took the, uh, bring back those samples, there is certain changes that take place. So that was the dedication that Dr. Sanjay had. And I, I, I want to just put one more uh, incident that it was not only that we used to do the experiments over there. We were only two in the first, uh, you know, visit in 1998, me and Dr. Sanjay, and we both uprooted the plants. We washed them, we crushed them, we took chlorophylls, and all the other things that was uh, that was necessitated by in that research area. So that was the time, and I really thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity, and I have the honor of your being your first student from IHBT. Thank you so much, sir. And this is the acknowledgement. This is uh, uh, I, I way way back in 2003, I put it in my PhD thesis, and I wrote at that time that it is not important that the, you learn techniques. What we learned in IHBT is that we learned to be a complete biologist. It, I, I, can, I can vouch for that, that probably it, is, it was at that time only one of the laboratory of, you know, maybe country in which you can uh, learn uh, 
ergas you can learn hplcs you can learn cloning and characterization you can learn making libraries so you see any arena of modern biological research we used to learn over there and what do you get obviously you do get phd's and you get uh, you know opportunities so uh, during after phd you always find that you want a job you want to do your you want to make your career so i just wanted to put some for this this is for the young scholars that yes these were the opportunities i got after i you know completed my phd from dr sanjay's lab and this is our lab madam richa is also uh, you know seen vayun is also there and these are my fellow colleagues who were there and during 2002 uh, sanjay gavana was missing too during that day but he was also there so we were like this was the group in 2002 and now you can see what is the transformation so uh, this black ones were the opportunities that i got however i selected only the green ones and uh, that 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 is the way and the power of the you know research that we have done in uh, in the area now coming back to the uh, topic so why it is known as why i call it as a researcher's paradise because what does a researcher require a researcher require that he should work in the area of interest and my area of interest was plant adaptation why it was plant adaptation also because i also belong to palampur i have seen the nature from very uh, you know uh, nearby i have gone to uh, cold deserts and i have seen what a beautiful ecosystem is there so my always the area of my interest remained plant adaptation also there is also a mandated area and i am fortunate that the mandated area matched with the uh, area of interest when i joined triple i am csi triple i am i was mandated to work in i was given the task to work in chemical ecology chemical ecology again coming from the interdisciplinary sciences it is not because if until and unless you mix chemistry with that of ecology and the other associated sciences that you can land up in chemical ecology the third area is obviously because we are also working for nation we also have to do something for technological arena of how things are you know to get something to the people to the masses and the third area is nutraceuticals in which i ventured and i tell you there is probably very less plants very very few plants in this planet which can fulfill all requirement of all these three areas the plant adaptation chemical ecology nutraceuticals and the plant is shengshu shengshu is a ladakhi word for a plant beautiful plant which is known as lepidium latifolium this is the life cycle of the lepidium latifolium you can see seed sprouts early vegetative phase and the mature flowering plant when you see the mature flowering plant you will see wow is it the kind of flower it's uh, the plant growing in the cold deserts you will see all green all beautiful flowers coming out of it the taxonomic status is it belongs to brassicaceae and the phylogeny has very important aspect to it because it is at the same lineage in which arabidopsis thaliana belongs so what happens actually is that you will have very much leverage of using this you know what whatever you do in this is you you take clues from arabidopsis thaliana and also you can put it back to the plant community in general so my task was very uh, made very easy by the earlier speakers and the questions they are after that what was important in shengshu so there has to be a striking visibility so after we visited spiti during my phd days uh, the first visit after that was in 2008 when i joined csi triple m and we were working in a climate change project which was uh, the nodal the nodal lab was ihbt during that time and it was a very very fascinating project and we were very excited to work on that project the first key observation that always any student any researcher should have that what is different from the other things so what we found is that although there are several plants growing in the region there is one plant which is shengshu or lepidium latifolium which has the widest amplitude why i call so because when you see kargil kargil is the you know the extreme end of one corner of ladakh and if you see the numa region it is the extreme other end this is numa where you know you always find the chinese in in you know coming on to our territory and kargil we all uh, you know very much aware of maybe by the kargil war and the recent movie shersha so this was the one plant which was there from kargil to numa 
and from all the north and the south region other plants were present other plants were present in small like 100 100 square kilometers 200 square kilometers however this plant was present in more than 500 500 or maybe 1000 square kilometers so that was the beauty of that plant so it obviously caught our eye it has the longer longest rather i would say vegetative period because other plants grow they uh, and then they you know shed their leaves and uh, all the annuals by uh, within 3 to 4 months however we found this plant for 7 to 8 months and the when we collected the information we found that it is wild edible plant people used to eat there and also when we looked at the literature we found that it is a commercial it has some commercial products in which it has it is, it is used as a diuretic but very very interesting uh, you know aspect of this plant was that uh, it is very invasive in western coast of america although it is originally from the mediterranean eurasia region in and the himalayan region however it was you know brought uh, to that western coast of america and now it is growing that is a very huge invasive uh, species and even um, you know whole the whole of the united states and canada and mexico they spend billions and millions of dollars just to eradicate this so we it, that that uh, that you know uh, really brought something to our mind that if it is so highly invasive in that area in that region why it is not or what will happen when the climate will change in ladakh because we all know that the climate change the first thing everybody understands is that glaciers will melt so if the glaciers will melt there will be more watery over there so our first question that came to our mind uh, i would just like to tell you that i will be completing this story i will be only putting you the questions and what we actually achieved what we and how we answered them the technical part of it you can always ask me later or whatever because of the shortage of time so our first point was can shengshu become invasive in ladakh just like it is in western coast so uh, the point was the most of the studies that have been done on this uh, invasive species was because of its reproduction through seeds and root, uh, root propagules or maybe it withstands long uh, floodings dry conditions it has a perennial rhizome but there was no information about physiological and biochemical plasticity so our first question was can the physiological and biochemical plasticity of this plant which we have observed because of its amplitude and the longer vegetative phase can that be the reason if the climate changes then it it can become invasive in ladakh and we all know that this is in ladakh is a very 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 ecologically sensitive area we cannot afford you know invasiveness over there so that was our um, uh, goal and we did all the physiological studies and what we found that this plant has a very very higher a very important or interesting evapotranspiration transpiration system which you know it covers itself with a layer of uh, it 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 actually changes the temperature near the plant and then it maintains its uh, you know growth so and we by ecological modeling and we found that you can see the uh, orange areas in the map and those will be the areas that we predicted that could be uh, you know uh, maybe inhabited by the in uh, uh, shangsho during later part of the climate change and therefore we uh, specifically put this in the sleeper weed category so that was the first part of our uh, our first question that we wanted to answer and that we found that this yes if if given the conditions it can become a invasive species in ladakh so the ne- next question which you know one of the uh, you know scientists also asked the question from dr lele that there is a huge temperature variations during diurnal temperature variations so similar was the case so how does this plant respond to this uh, you know short term uh, temperature fluctuations so we did all the studies uh, you know we put it in different temperatures and then we went back to the same temperature and then we did all the uh, you know how does the photosynthetic apparatus behave how does you know the photosynthetic genes what is the stability of those very interesting feature that we found that uh, one of these uh, secondary metabolite uh, glucosinolates have a hydrolysis product known as as uh, AITC uh, allyl isothiocyanate which helps in actually you know opening and closing of the stomatal uh, you know stomata so that actually helps this plant to quickly the vpdl dependent stomatal closing and opening is relatively takes time so this stom- AITC dependent stomatal opening is actually very quick so this is how it actually changes 
and adapts to its temperatures. So this is what we thought that, uh, and this, this has recently been published. So the second question was that, yes, it can manage temperature very well. So uh, it, therefore, this could be one of the reasons that it, it really ranges from Cargill to Neoma. So the third question then came into our mind that if it is so good going, growing, uh, you know, proficiently uh, well in Ladakh, so can it also grow in Jammu? But when we, you know, uh, ground truth the Jammu area and we looked at the literature, we did not find any situation where we, there is any report of uh, uh, Lepidium latifolium because it is also an edible plant. There are quite few chances that the people could carry seeds along with them and they would plant it in some of the lower regions. But we did not find this. So our second, uh, another query that we, it came to our mind that let us see how it performs in non-native conditions. And I tell you that we really come up with a very novel finding in this also. And we found that it really grew established in Jammu very well. And glutathione mediated redox regulations played very important roles in which it actually changes, you know, it increases the antioxidant content. Antioxidant enzymes are induced by this glutathione. So this is another part which we did and uh, we found that yes, but the question then remained that why if it is, you know, if it is easy to grow in Jammu and it is good, then why it is not growing in Jammu? That was our first, you know, that always came to our mind. The reason I will now tell you, because when we grew this in Jammu, we found that there is a huge herbivory load. And this herbivory was mainly because of Pyrus basiki, a very you know uh, uh, in, common in, insect of Brassica family. And what you can see in the this 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 picture, you will see, uh, you know this 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 is the kind of herbivory you would find, and this is the kind of what remains after this. So we did not find any flowering in Jammu region. And this, this plant, what you are seeing, is also because we physically removed the larvae from the plant uh, just to make it like to appear like this. Because otherwise, uh, the herbivory is so huge that it doesn't allow the plants to just come out of its vegetative phase. So this was one interesting observation that we got. So we thought that why it is so that it is, you know, so much herbivory in Jammu and very less herbivory in Ladakh. The obvious uh, reason, you know, the reasons comes that obviously the insect incidence is lesser over there and you will require more over there. So these are the kind of things we were trying to put together to make a story. And we thought, uh, what, what important, like whenever we see brassicales, the insect interactions are followed by glucosinolate myrosinase system. Glucosinolate is an, uh, you know nitrogen and containing secondary metabolites, which hydrolyzes and form different hydrolysis products. And I tell you, these each hydrolysis products that you see over here, nitrile, isothiocyanates, isothiocyanates, epithionitriles, these are independently or in combination with each other are dependent upon, they, they make sure that which insect will visit the plant and which should not visit the plant. So if you have more of nitriles, you will have more of like journalists coming to it. Um, it, it, it more isothionates, you have more specialists coming to it. And you have like in general also some of the predators will be, you know, they will be resisted. So it's a huge and a very complex ecological effects that come up during this whole story. So our first thing was that uh, we should characterize this uh, glucose inlet myrosinus system. And we understand because we have found that the redox, redox regulations was playing very important role in the, uh, you know, in the earlier study. So we thought of finding, you know, mixing those two. And what we found was really interesting, very, very interesting. And uh, this, this was that redox regulation actually change the insect interactions. And they change the interactions by changing the transcription factors that actually induce the aromatic, indolic, or uh, the other kind of aliphatic kind of glucosinolates. And we, we did this with several redox modulators. We did it with the choice biases. We did it with the field studies. Whatever, this is the kind of, you know, um, experiments that we did. We did mutants analysis, we did complementation studies, bioinformatic analysis, GFP fluorescence analysis. So we found that this, GSG, this GSH over GSHG ratio is very important. I tell you, we have not still published this paper because we are still waiting for some of the very, very key results uh, through confocal. We wanted to prove, prove this. So we are still waiting for those. 
however this is uh, um, this some uh, one of my student has already published her thesis in the preliminary part so the second question comes uh, after this that whether whatever hypothesis we are saying is it true for all the species or is it only true for lepidium and probably uh, pyrae brassica so we thought of uh, doing these studies in arabidopsis thaliana because i told you that arabidopsis thaliana is just uh, just a very near to this um, um, lepidium latifolium in phylogeny and we also took plutula zestola and i tell you uh talking you know uh, looking back at the interdisciplinary whatever a chemical ecology we were uh, able to do is only because of the interdisciplinary nature of our institute we have very beautiful lcmss and gcmss using those we really deciphered and find out that which was the uh, glucosinolate what is the hydrolysis product that is coming out this is only possible because of the help of my chemistry colleagues so interdisciplinary is very very important i also i would like to tell you that all the studies that we did in uh, native conditions using irgas you know irga is looks like so very simple instrument however it is a one of the masterpiece of i would say uh, the biomedical sciences bio uh, you know instrumentation so it it takes lot of parameters into it and then comes out with the reasons and the solutions of in the in the in the, in the reason of uh, values so uh, coming back to our story that the arabidopsis thaliana and plutula we wanted to see whether it is valid over there and we used redox sensitive transgenic lines which we uh, you know uh, got it from abroad and we we really suggested and we 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 also published it i would also like to tell you that how collaboration works and this work i really thank my colleagues from ci csi rajb de palampur they provided us the plutula larvae and we did all the studies some of the studies have been done at ihbt the bioassay studies and we found that yes the glucosinolate regulation the hypothesis of glucosinolate regulation was also valid in other plant and other insect species that suggests that it is a universal kind of uh, you know hypothesis and which we can always you know uh, look in other plants also and thought think of something you know making some good uh, inroads into that also we uh, when we uh, there is always a chance of bio prospection so we looked at the different perspective how that we should characterize this glucosinolate hydrolysis system in lepidium latifolium and we we found that one of the enzyme which hydrolyzes glucosinolates into hydrolysis products it was found to be again redox regulated so you have a very efficient system in which change in the redox actually changes the you know uh, induction of the glucosinolates it also changes the hydrolysis part so what happens because hydrolysis is the key for insect interactions so here we found that there is a thiol regulated behavior of this enzyme myrosinase in which its monomeric or the dimeric form they are actually change the insect behavior and recently we also found that there is another hydrolysis product which is cetp which is a very important component of insect interaction this was never uh, you know uh, this was never discussed earlier and even if it was, it was not found earlier so with the help of my uh, chemistry colleagues we found that this is the prominent hydrolysis product that we get from the uh, uh, lepidium latifolium and then this is one of the component which along with the other smaller components of nitriles isothiocyanates there is a combination of all the components and then this really changes the uh, insect paradigm in lepidium latifolium in jammu so most of our things were coming out and out and out and out so these this uh, with this we thought that okay this was like scientific part of it that this was also a uh, you know um, uh, that uh, interesting part of it and the core hardcore science we do however we also thought that why not we for foray into some of the areas where people have you know people have been using this plant uh, ethnobotanically so we thought let us first of all uh, it was used but uh, since centuries but without any scientific validation so our first point was can we scientifically validate this if we were able to scientifically validate that uh, people will start you know other people will also start taking this and therefore we thought of you know using this uh, modern uh, tools in analytical chemistry to uh, find out what is the glucosinolate content what is the fatty acids what is the other uh, nutraceutically important uh, things and we found that this is one of the plants which has very very high content of glucosinolates i tell you we all eat broccoli we all eat wasabi 
and as a sources and we pay many many you know uh, many dollars or maybe rupees for this purchasing this wasabi and sini green uh, sorry sorry this uh, broccoli but this contains more glucosinolates than those so we all eat broccoli because of its anti cancer properties and those anti cancer pro properties come from glucosinolates and if you have an home grown and plant which is actually giving you uh, you know more glucosinolates and those also the better glucosinolates that are used in nutraceuticals so you would always go for those plants and we proved and we established that this is a phyto food this can be used as a functional food and now the second question comes but you know you cannot ask your farmers to just grow plants and then collect leaves and start eating it so another question then came into our mind that how could we could technologically put something into this so that people can start their own units so that they can send some you know these things to other parts of the country so that like wasabi broccoli sprouts whatever is coming in there so what we decided to go for uh, you know shangsu sprouts and we interestingly what we found that although leaves are very good it it has got very good uh, this sini green vin bhai hari very high content the uh, the sprouts contain glucotropolin also so you have like 100% 90% of sini green in mature leaves however in um, in sprouts you also have in the similar amount uh, concentrations the glucotropolin also present in the sprouts so you see you have not a single thing but you also have two different glucosinolates and at a very very high concentrations so uh, the whole um, again coming back to the interdisciplinary part of it so this was like how can we ask somebody to eat but we should have all the toxic uh, toxicology studies in place before we you know proceed further so our again introductory our uh, pkpd toxicology division at csi triple im they did all the toxicology studies and we found that it is quite safe to have and all the glucosinolates they are actually well reported but also we also proved the efficacy and toxicity at our own end so this is like kind of Uh, the third part of the technological arena that we went to, and this lab sprouts that we have kept the name for our product. This is a certified product. We are now planning to put myrosinase, which is again our uh, myrosinase, to put it into uh, in the same, and then we will have more of hydrolysis products of the similar nature. So this is uh, again whatever I am showing you. I am just telling you the story of it, and all this have been published in journals. so this thing uh, again the another part is that obviously we wanted to test whether there is a there is a preference performance hypothesis of this novel host because uh, this is the host for you know this is the plant which is there in uh, ladakh this plant is not here in jammu or maybe the other subtropical regions or other lower regions so we wanted to see whether what will happen if this plotula comes to the, in contact with the sini in the sini green high sini green containing plant so we found that obviously what happened that the moth was very much attracted to this plant because of x reason and then you have the high content of sini green which is actually problematic for the larvae so see what a beautiful crop or plant it is that you have all the moths coming and ovipositioning onto this plant and then the larva is actually not able to grow uh, you know but this we needs to we need to prove or we need to see so we have not uh this is just a scientific study we have not done it yet in uh, the field but we are trying we are thinking of putting it as a trap crop we have given this concept in our paper but we have not yet completed this uh, study because uh, you know uh, we wanted to see if this is only the sini green or other components that are actually helping it to uh, prove this point so uh, i i just uh, you know i have this is just half of the story of lepidium nativifolium i can go on for like 15 uh, 15 20 minutes more but the organizers were, were uh, you know we keeping on to the line time limit these are the publications that are coming only from this work and this uh, crop and this plant so uh, we i just try to put it to you as a form of a story so that uh, people you know can understand or relate that how uh, there is we, we all have this in our mind that how this Uh, establishment of a species takes place so we have found that uh, yes there are abiotic filters so because you have long or high mountains that the plants cannot come here and then you have uh, but during these area uh, during this kind times and conditions when you can people can always bring in the seeds we were uh, thinking that what is the next uh, filter so the, we always uh, 
found in our books that there is a biotic filter also. So we presume and we hypothesize that it is the biotic filter in the second phase which you know prevents this uh, uh, Lepidium latifolium or Shengshu to come to Jammu and maybe become invasive over here. Because if it comes to Jammu, it will have more of the similar type of conditions. Maybe not in Jammu, maybe in Srinagar, Kashmir area where you have a lot of water, you have like plain area. So it might come there as and it will form as an invasive weed, which will be a problematic for us. So see, we have nature giving us filters after filters and it is our duty to decipher all those filters. So here comes the end of my talk. I really want to thank the organizers and these are my uh, you know, collaborators. Uh, I, I'm sorry, this is my um, support. The CSIR was very much kind enough and I was really, I tell you, I was fortunate to get the, uh, to train from the CSIR system and coming back to the CSIR system. So I was very, very lucky to, and uh, CSIR supported me with the, uh, the first climate change project. Then you have adaptive biology project. They are supporting with nutraceutical project. And also, Sarb also gave some projects on this uh, reason, in this area to me. I thank, uh, you know, the students of my lab. These, so these are the students, they always keep changing, but I put all the students, try to keep, put all the students uh, in, the, in the picture. And I, I really uh, thank my fellow colleagues at CSI, Triple IM and all over who contributed to this work. I really thank Dr. Ram Vishwakarma, who actually, uh, you know, asked me to work in chemical ecology when I joined this Triple IM Jammu and the present director, Dr. Reddy also, who continued, you know, who let my, you know, uh, interest continue in this area. And I really thank you all, thank all of you uh, for this uh, nice opportunity that you gave me. And once again, I put all my respect to all my teachers um, uh, from the school to, the, to, to this stage also, and especially to Dr. Sanjay, he has been instrumental for, for you know, uh, telling us uh, it's not always, he always inculcated the habit of, uh, you know, understanding more than doing the things. So first one, you, when you understand, then you will be able to perform. So I really thank you, sir. And I really am obliged by the opportunity given to me by the organizers. I thank you all. And I, uh, you know, I am open for the questions that you want to uh, raise. Thank you so much. Thank you. The session is open for uh, questions. Any questions? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Upendra Sharma. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ask your question, sir. Yeah, uh, good afternoon to all. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Uh, nice lecture, sir. Just I have one basic query, sir. It may not be right. So uh, what you said that generally we are hearing from biotechnology people like adaptability. But uh, if you put this thing in other perspectives, suppose uh, you are saying that higher altitude plants are growing and then it's maybe impossible to grow those plants at a lower altitude. So no. is, it, is it adaptability or requirement? Because if it is adaptability, then it's uh, possible that after some time, these things can happen in lower altitude also. See, uh, to this, I would answer in a different uh, way. So uh, the question comes that the adaptive adaptability is certainly the key of the uh, nature. So you always put some stress to uh, a plant and it will keep on increasing, you know, it will keep on responding to that and certainly some genes will try to induce and something will other uh, come. But when I put this uh, Lepidium latifolium, I put it in the perspective of what it could, you know, do to the ecological setup, what it could do to the Ladakh ecology. So if, you know, this adaptability is there, you have a potential adaptable, adaptive plant, which is there in your uh, vicinity and you change the climatic conditions, you change the climatic conditions to you know more soothing to that plant definitely that plant will have more opportunity to grow so in that context when we think of adaptability and uh, ecological balance we think of uh, you know understanding this adaptability uh, otherwise yeah adaptability is a key feature of all the plants you put anything in uh, this is my take 
I hope uh, your question is related to that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. sir. Okay. So the next question is from uh, Dr. Jinta. Uh, hello everyone, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, leaders, uh, thank you for uh, these powerful words that you took, you know, lab, outside the lab to the field and learned a lot of things there and, you know, in the form of a lot of publication, you, you, you know, disseminated that knowledge. So in terms of lepidium, I have, you know, two or three basic questions. Uh, what is the origin of this species? I mean, is it also invasive in Ladakh or, I mean? No. So yeah. uh, when we come to the origin of this plant, this plant is actually uh, originated in Mediterranean region. So it is like more of like some of the studies also show, uh, papers also show that it is a uh, native to Himalayan region also. Yes. However, uh, it is original, originally from Ladakh also. There it doesn't grow in, you know, it grows in a wider amplitude, but it grows in sporadic patches. It doesn't grow like uh, what, how it grows in, uh, you know, western coast of America. So when somebody must have taken some of the seeds, probably due to some reasons, maybe medicinal reasons or maybe some, uh, you know, uh, nutraceutical reasons. And then probably after maybe uh, 150 years back or 200, because this this invasiveness, the problem of invasiveness in West Coast of America came in 1930s. Earlier, there was no report of any invasive species like that. So it probably could be the one of the reasons that, yes, the uh, since the ecology totally changes in the western coast, you have a riparian plains where you have a lot of water over there. So that is the kind of, you know, and that was the preliminary reason that we wanted to see that, yes, it is originally from Ladakh, but you see the conditions of Ladakh are at this particular point of time is totally different from what you can see after maybe say let us say 50 years so when you have uh, glaciers melting you will have all those plain areas that you many of you must have seen those areas of you know low fill areas where you have indus valley you know so you have like at least 5 kilometer areas which is quite a plain area so you have water over there and if you it increases so that was our you know reason for it. The second question is, I mean, you are, you know, most of your work is on, on, on glucosinolates. Uh, mm -hmm. In my PhD, I will also work uh, on, on glucosinolates partially, not, you know, fully. Uh, but the thing is, here you are linking sinigrin with, with, with water use efficiency. Get him a point. So, so how, uh, I mean, what are the mechanistic basis uh, for that? Most of the time, if you see, I mean, sinig I mean glucosinolates, as in your slides also, you linked it biotic stresses, herbivory, insectivory. I mean, can you shed some light on the role of glucosinolates in abiotic stress, particularly with the, um, the you know, water use efficiency? Yes. So uh, what happens that this is a very interesting question, actually, you asked. And, you know, it covers both of the your first question and second question comes. Uh, I will answer it. I will try to answer it in, in a sequential manner. So obviously, the sinigrin is not there in uh, Lepidium latifolium for us to eat, obviously. So it is there for some of the reason uh, for the abiotic stresses that are actually present in Ladakh region. That is what our take, general take is. So the second question is that what is it used for? So when we search the literature, we found that there is always, you know, uh, enzyme dependent hydrolysis of glucosinolates and there is also spontaneous hydrolysis. So spontaneous hydrolysis of uh, glucosinolates actually put, uh, you know, uh, uh, gives you AITC, allyl isothiocyanate. So allyl isothiocyanate has recently been in the last five to 10 years, have been found to be very, very effective for stomatal conductance. So it actually changes the stomatal conductance and water, you, uh, water conductance I would also include in this because if you have stomata opening and closing, so you will also have the uh, water conduction in that perspective. So it actually changes the uh, uh, stomatal conductance and this stomatal change in the stomatal conductance is different from what you will find in VPDL dependent st stomatal conductance. So that I already mentioned in one of my slides. So yeah. this, this sinigrin is actually, we found that yes, during this uh, temperature stress also during high temperatures and even because when, when I uh, showed you the pictures of Lepidium latifolium, they were not in, you know, near to the water. They were in area where you have sand only and you have very, very less vegetation. 
so what happens that you have large roots over there and they use this uh, you know for this water use efficiency and again coming back to the first question that how it changes the water use efficiency and that is precisely the point what happens in riparian plains this is our wild guess i don't know we are trying to uh, you know uh, find the answers but this is my wild guess that what is happening is that this uh, high glucosinolate content uh, leading to the high iitc content and this changing the you know stomatal uh, behavior and in the when you have lot of plenty of water over there so so you really enjoy water you know in in circumstances which are abiotic or which are problematic conditions you have you want that efficiency to be very balanced but in uh, in the in normal so, so for instance if you are you know pharmacologically applying sinigrin from outside to arabidopsis let's say so does it make uh, arabidopsis yes, uh, yes also? it has it has yeah. already been proved it has already been proved that aitc changes the stomatal conductance okay. and it has been proved by several papers and recently it also changes the uh, you know redox behavior also so we are also working on to that but those studies are still not complete so i did not want it to include in my story Thank you very much sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for the interest. Thank you so much sir for an amazing presentation. It was indeed knowledgeable for us. Thank you. Now now we'll move for uh, next session. Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Thank you sir. Thank you Sanjay sir. Namaskar sir. Okay. Now we'll start with our first session of student seminar series. Oh, very good lecture man. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Since we are uh, already running out of time, so we'll start with our uh, first session. Uh, I'd like to brief you all about uh, seminar rules. Each presenter will be given eight minutes for oral presentation. First bell will be uh, will ring at six minutes. After that, final bell uh, ring at eight minutes, and then after that, uh, two minutes for discussion session. Uh, and kindly be strict with the timeline uh, because uh, we we don't have much time for the, for the session one uh, here are the list of uh, judges for uh, session one uh, so the judges for this session are dr vipin halan dr ravi shankar dr upendra sharma dr rajesh singh and dr satveer singh uh, before the commencement of oral presentation competition i would like to invite our another alumnus dr upendra k sharma who holds senior scientist position in university of leuven belgium he has joined us all the way from europe and we are grateful for his presence dr upendra sharma received his phd in uh, 2011 uh, from csr isbt palampur and then uh, and after that in 2013 he joined uh, a research group in university of leuven belgium uh, and has been working there since then Dr Sharma has built a strong expertise in the, the field of catalysis and flow chemistry over the years and has been acting as co-promoter for several projects. His research interests include the development of new synthetic methods for biologically relevant molecules employing modern uh, methods for methods of synthesis flow chemistry uh, photoredox catalysis and transition metal catalyzed uh, CH functionalizations. Today he will be talking about flow photochemistry as an enabling tool in organic synthesis over to you dr upender keshav good to see you upender need to unmute boss uh upender you need to unmute yourself good morning to everyone and uh, nice to see you dr sanjay and everyone and uh, thank you very much for this nice opportunity you can hear me well i believe yes very well yes can you see my screen please yes yes, yes. okay so i i couldn't agree more with uh, this with the with the dr vyas that uh, hbt just doesn't it just uh, made us a scientist it has made us a complete person because this is true and uh, earlier today uh, there is a very there was very nice and informative lecture about uh, about about the energy requirements of the country and the steps being take, taken uh, towards uh, realization of national goals and indeed solar energy will play an important role in it 
So for me, the today's topic is flow photochemistry as an enabling tool in organic synthesis. Okay. So uh, this is where I belong in the center of Europe, the Catholic University of Leuven or K Leuven simple and simply. Uh, this is how our department, uh, the building of the university, or the old building of the university looks, and this is our department of chemistry, which is very modern, but again, nothing can match the serenity of HPD. So what we do at uh, K. Leuven and our laboratory, the laboratory of microwave assisted chemistry, we work with the uh, various uh, technologies and chemistries. The first is the antibiofilm compounds where we synthesize uh, and evaluate the biological if efficacy of uh, two amino amidazole especially and uh, then check their efficacy in uh, prosthetics, prosthetics for antibiofilm evaluation and side by side we also do some uh, total, synthesis, uh, total synthesis of some two amino amidazole based natural products. And of course, uh, CH functionalization has been the topic of interest for a lot, so many years. We also do multi-component chemistry where we synthesize uh, uh, small molecules, uh, linear molecules, and then do the post multi-component cyclizations towards very simple four member ring or five member ring to some very uh, typical uh, complex molecules and also the photo flow chemistry which we just started two years back i in fact i started two three years back as an independent researcher in this field and this will be the uh, topic of today's talk so what is flow chemistry in flow chemistry the regions are continuously pumped through the reactors and products are collected at the other end As, as you can see in this slide, so product at collect, collected at the right end and you don't have to work like Mr. Bean or mixing chemicals like this and you can easily avoid these, uh, these blasts or explosion in your chemical laboratory. And in fact, we do our chemistry in these small micro channels, tubes, uh, and these are also very easy to scale up. The benefits, uh, this allows for easy scale up and numbering up simply by numbering up or longer operation times. And in case of photoredox catalysis, it gives more uniform irradiation of the visible light and lower catalyst losing shorter reaction times and less side product formation. And of course, it has high heat and mass transfer uh, of uh, of the chemicals due to the high surface to volume ratio and of course the safety of operation when when we do scale up because of the exothermic reactions or dealing with explosive or toxic reagents so this is the book we published in 2018 about the flow role of flow chemistry for the synthesis of vitro cycles what is photoredox catalysis photoredox catalysis allows for the absorption of uh, wavelength in the visible region of uh, in the spectrum and we use very cheap and low energy light sources like CFLs, LEDs or and even sunlight and this indeed provides us with uh, new opportunities in organic synthesis. We use uh, ruthenium complexes or iridium complexes or simply organic dyes which when absorbs light uh, they get excited and then they transfer their energy to the reactants and which then uh, later do chemistries as we as we design so the benefit of these uh, catalysts are they absorb in the visible region they have stable and long-lived excited states and they are or they act as single electron transfer catalyst they have effective uh, excited state which can either act as an oxidant or as an reductant and they are easily commercially or easily, they can be easily synthesized and they are also commercially available. Uh, sorry, sorry to uh, interrupt you, Dr. Pindar. Uh, would you like to change your presentation settings because we are seeing two slides uh, here. Okay, see. Okay, I will just get off this mode. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Now it's fine. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Now it's fine. Okay. So, what is photoredox catalysis? Come back to photoredox catalysis again. So, today all I talk about the scale up, how we scale up uh, photochemical reaction or photoredox reactions. Because uh, to make a long standing impact and have a wide applicability in pharmaceutical industry or in medicinal chemistry, we have to scale up and we have to deal up with these scale up issues. And the most important is the light attenuation effect, which means that if you see in this uh, uh, in this uh, picture that uh, there is a laser light uh, pointed at uh, this uh, uh, reaction, uh, this uh, chemical compound, and you see there's only two centimeter of uh, penetration depth. And this is the problem with the scale up of uh, batch, uh, batch photoredox catalysis or photoredox reactions. The solution for this is the continuous flow chemistry where you continuously pump your uh, substrates from one side and you collect or your product on the other end and then you can do your chemistry in this small reactor which is visible which is irradiated irradiated with the visible light so uh, i'll just discuss one example for today because of the time restrictions and this is about the generation of alkyl radicals and its uh, and its application in uh, organic synthesis so alkyl radicals, they are everywhere. They are like in chemical processes, in biological systems. But to synthesize or to generate these alkyl radicals in a photocatalytic manner, a lot of work has been done in last 10, 10 years, especially by, and there are more than 10 papers or 15 papers just on the topic in nature and science. So mostly this deals with uh, like trifluoroborates or silicates or uh, acid as an alkyl radical precursor, but if you look them carefully, they are all charged substrates or they are salts or they are or simple acid which needs inorganics for their activation. And if you want to scale up them, you need uh, you need you need uh, this will cause problems and especially clogging issues or again the uh, efficacy issues in flow chemistry. So we were looking for alternatives, like uh, alternatives to these trifluoroborates, um, because as you can see in this slide, they have uh, on the left hand side, the, these trifluoroborates, they have poor solubilities and we need diluted condition. This poses some workup issues uh, for these uh, chemicals and there might be generation of uh, or precipitation of salts. So they're difficult to use in flow. On the other hand, um, boronic ester, which has high solubility, they are also commercially available. They are one step less to make as compared to trifluoroborates. And uh, in, until 2017, there was no report of them as a radical source, and they can be easily used in flow. So keeping this in mind, we came up with a concept that uh, tri, uh, these boronic esters, they have vacant p orbitals, and they can make a very uh, a strong uh, 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 bond with uh, the electrons of a uh, Lewis base or nitro uh, nitrogen or phosphor base, uh, Lewis uh, nucleophilic Lewis bases, and these uh, redox, these complexes, these in situ generated complexes are redox active, and uh, they they can uh, generate alkyl radicals, which can be used uh, later for multiple applications. And this system was uh, totally. Uh, flow compatible, but still had some issues be because of uh, of its scope. Because the condition that we use were not really compatible with uh, all the things that we the reaction that we do. bit more mild and then we came up with an idea okay why not to use free boronic acid if you see in this slide boronic acids they lie on the extreme right hand side of this uh, this uh, picture and they have oxidation potential range more than two and this is beyond the catalyst that we have today so we can we can have you know the, all the green or uh, yellow that you see they are easily manageable under the catalyst that we have today 
So the most important factor was the tuning of the oxidation potential. And there, uh, after 2017, after our work, there was a lot of paper published about making boronic esters or acids photolabile. But again, most of them were again uh, were charged substrates or had low atom economy. And again, they will cause clogging issues in continuous flow setups. So we were again looking for alternatives. And as inspired from biology, uh, these boronic acids, they are serine protease inhibitors. They act as serine protease inhibitors. And because of, uh, and you see various representatives here like bortezomib or exazomib, they are biologically active compounds. And you see there's O nucleophile from this uh, serine side chain. They can attack uh, this boronic acid and make a stable transition state, which cause the enzyme in activation. And we thought the same. Why not to use some simple and uh, uh, O nucleophile based uh, either solvents such as amide solvents or even water to activate these uh, boronic acid to work the generation of radicals. So we came up with this concept where we uh, use uh, amide based solvents like DMA, dimethyl acetamide, to make a complex with boronic acid, uh, which then reduces the electron dense density at this boron center, which where afterwards where these DMA molecules and other DMA molecules can make a bond with this boron and oxygen. And this complex was again redox active and generated the radical. So this was the cycle of the catalyst uh, of the matter that we developed. So this is a, an organic uh, organic molecule, uh, carbazole based organic molecule, which absorbs blue light and gets to the excited state and then absorbs and then transfer its energy to this complex and this radical is generated. This radical is then uh, quenched by this electron acceptor that we have here and generate this intermediate P. Now this intermediate P gives its electron back to the system and generates this anionic species. Now this anionic species can simply undergo protonation, uh, uh, protonation to form your desired product. On the right hand, you see that uh, we we were able to quench this radical, radical R radical from boronic acid using tempo and quencher. Uh, which we detected through GCMS and we also isolated. And for uh, proof for the last step was that we, when we used uh, D2O or heavy water, we could observe 60% of the deuteration at this position, which means that indeed the last step is protonation. So this is the optimization table when we have for this reaction. So when we have uh, conditions, this catalyst, DMA and argon atmosphere under room temperature or 30 degrees Celsius here, under 14 watt of blue LEDs, in 20 hours, we have 77% of the yield and reaction doesn't work in absence of light or photocatalyst or in the presence of tempo. Air also causes this reduced yield of this reaction. And very surprisingly, the reaction was also working in the presence of water, which was very important for us. I will discuss that in, uh, in, in the next few slides. And when you uh, did the optimization in flow, the, we, then we transferred the same condition in flow, the, the yields was not really great, but this was mainly because of, you know, DMA is uh, a viscous solvent. So, the, you know, the movement of uh, movement of the substrate or radical uh, is not really as fast as in batch reaction because you, you have very fast mixing in batch and on comparison, you have some different sort of mixing patterns in flow chemistry. And so we were we have to add an acetonitrile as a co-solvent to increase the yield. We also did some mechanistic investigation for this uh, reaction and for fluorescence quenching experiments. We found that the boronic acid and DMA indeed when they are together, when they are in a complex form, uh, they can quench the excited state of the photocatalyst. And this was proven by this uh, Sternwormer equation, which was a straight line. And we also did some NMR experiments to prove that indeed there is an hydrogen bonding. And this you can see that as soon as we increase the amount of DMA, the amide solvent, there was a downfield shift in the, you know, the OH, OH proton of this boronic acid, which means that you know, indeed there is an hydrogen bonding. And there was also small upfield shift uh, for this uh, position next to boron center. So we also did some cyclovoltammetry analysis just to prove that, okay, the in, and the interacted form of boronic acid DMA is within the range of this 
catalyst, the oxidation or oxidation potential or the redox potential uh, window of this photocatalyst. So this is why this boronic acid and DMA can make alkyl radicals. And on the right hand, you see it's not possible with simple boronic acid or simple DMA because the more both of them are beyond the range, like more than two poten two volts. So in this competitive experiment, we we get the idea, okay, boronic acid are working, but in, what about the boronic ester? So we found that the reaction is very specific to boronic, uh, boronic acid only because, okay, this can make hydrogen bonding interactions are only possible in case of boronic acid. So boronic acid was not really working very nicely, as you can see in this, uh, in this slide, and we got only alkylation product from boronic acid. So this is the scope of this uh, reaction. Uh, so we have on the right hand side, we have scope in batch and on the left hand side, we have reaction in flow. So we were able to convert various vinyl pyridines, both in batch and flow. Of course, the re re reaction efficacy was better in case of flow, flow, flow reactions. And uh, especially you can see some slides, uh, there's some reactions where the yields were very high on in underflow conditions. We also make be able to make the analogs of, you know, antihistamine drugs, phenyramine, like shown here. The most important thing was that we, we can sustain this BPIN uh, functionality in our system by still, so the condition was so mild that this was indeed possible. And you have these uh, molecules which are again available for orthogonal coupling reactions. Or when we studied different Michael acceptors, we found that Okay, all the Michael acceptors or electron deficient species are working nicely. And uh, here is the scope of dehydrogen. We also tried some dehydroalanine based amino acids as uh, our coupling partner. And we found that, okay, they are also successful in this reaction. But again, you know, the batch and flow comparison, the flow was always winning in these cases. And we were also able to make a dipeptide and use this as our substrate. And this reaction only worked in flow. We couldn't able to isolate the product in under batch conditions. So uh, again, these, these re this reaction is, you know, we can be, can be applied to small peptides as well. So this is the scope of elimination reaction. So I'll come back to the mechanism again. If you see here, in the last step of the reaction is the radical generates uh, anionic species. Now this anionic species can undergo protonation. It can also undergo uh, elimination reaction if you have some group which leaves, uh, leaves the substrate. So in this case, here is a trifluoro where fluorine leaves. And in this case, there is a tocyl group which also act as a leaving group. So these kind of reactions are known as even CB, follows elimination mechanism or even CB mechanism and gives you the desired product. So this was a, a plus point for our method because in our earlier case, this was not really possible. We, we could also able to scale up this reaction in flow up to a multigram level and we synthesize some non-natural amino acid as you can see in this slide and so the, we have very short irradiation time of 50 minutes versus 20 hours in batch and we have very less byproduct formation no sluggish reaction and this was our first step towards our overall aim of biocompatible visible light chemistry where we want to develop ambient reaction conditions chemo selectivity and functional group compatibility tolerance and the catalytic stability. So right now we are working with small molecules. We are upgrading to biomolecules like peptides and uh, sugars, and we want to work. We we are we are working with them. But our ultimate aim is to go to work more towards this red. So the most important factors here are room temperature, chemistry, natural or neutral aqueous conditions, chemo selectivity, the functional group compatibility and tolerance, and reaction should be able to work under air which is not really possible right now for us but we are working in this direction and the stability of catalyst so there was there was another uh, modification of this reaction which we did recently and so instead of electron deficient alkenes we we used a three component reaction where we formed imine in situ and again the same reaction which gives this secondary amines so in this case so in this case, uh, 
the re and this reaction uh, works uh, as a, in a three component man manner and this is a very well known famous name reaction patasis reaction so we gave we gave a photoredox version of this uh, multi component patasis reaction and uh, as you can see when we have very sensitive substrates uh, as in this benzyl radicals or this uh, uh, allyl radicals uh, we have better yields in continuous flow this paper was recently published in i science as an invited article the last example that i'm going to show you today is the about the odorless isocyanide chemistry uh, so we were we were we as a multi component lab we work also with isocyanide which are a very important component of uh, this multi component chemistry and some of you might know that these are very smelly compounds and difficult to deal with so we thought that why not to and they are also not the compound that we synthesized was not stable so we thought why not to use utilize flow chemistry for the synthesis of these uh, uh, these compounds so we started from scratch and using this formamide as a substrate and we did, we did able to make these uh, isocyanides in this very complex this system looks very complex but this is very simple these are just pumps this symbol is for pump and the salt uh, your substrate your your amine and your dehydrating dehydrating agent pocl3 this mixes here and within 4 minutes you have your product ready and for the aqueous extraction like liquid liquid extraction that happens also in this in this telescopic manner here this is the symbol for that so on the right hand side you have an aqueous waste and on the left hand side you get your product which we then purified in line with the silica and dried with molecular sieves and you have your pure dried product here and which then we simply worked in a batch conditions for the synthesis of this again complex molecules starting from this simple substrates we were also able to generate enantio selectivity in this case because we have a chiral center here and this we it was moderate but we are still working in this direction so this was the setup which looks uh, which represent this scheme you see that you have formamide you have amine you have pocl3 here all these mixing in this tiny uh, tiny uh, tea mixer and then you have your reaction happening here in within 4 minutes and this is the inline separated which do, which does the uh, aqueous aqueous and organic extraction and you have your final product this isocyanide then reacts with the after purification with silica and drying with molecular sieves you get your final product in this batch reaction so we simplified or i would say it looks complex but we simplified the problems a student face on a daily basis about working with such uh, smelly or unstable compounds so in conclusion i uh, i just presented that we can tune the oxidation potential of boronic acid for the generation of alkyl radicals and i showed you the application of, of our drug activation method for gz type additions for elimination reactions for patasis reaction and i showed you one example of continuous flow application it was the odorless isocyanide chemistry so finally i would like to acknowledge my research group uh, and all a uh, research group where the person in red are my phd students they are free for phd students right now serena monica su and laura uh, in at kelu one and uh, earlier work the first work that i showed was done in collaboration with professor lay at university of cambridge and i would also like to on this occasion on this day teachers day i would like to acknowledge all my guru uh, like professor timothy noel professor claf yanson at mit with whom i'm going to work uh, Uh, next year as a visiting scientist at mit and professor shuli yu and of course uh, dr professor dr ak sena so all these people they are mixture of engineers uh, chemist and as well as some biology biologists so again we we are working uh, in a in a very interdisciplinary manner a team of engineers chemists and uh, biologists and of course the financial support from uh, research foundation of flanders is duly acknowledged and finally i would like to acknowledge the organizing committee and especially dr sanjay for this wonderful opportunity thank you very much
Thank you so much, sir. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. We don't have any questions for now. So uh, we are entering the next oral presentation competition session. Okay, okay. We have one question from Upendra, sir. Yes, sir. You can ask your question. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I hope Good you are doing fine. Yes. So uh, I have just a general query. See, photochemistry itself is fascinating, and then you are trying to combine with flow. So it's great, and surely there will be a lot of application in coming times. But just I have uh, means two doubts. First thing, if we start with the heterogeneous system, mm -hmm. then uh, how it can be tackled? And second thing, if we are getting a product where product itself is precipitating, maybe mm -hmm. during the flow, mm -hmm. and Third thing is, uh, see, in batch we define suppose the scale, maybe it is a uh, tons or something. But in case of flow, how how we will tackle the scale up process in future? So, so I'll I'll start with the scale up. Uh, start with the your second question about the scale up. So in flow, we don't have a set, uh, you know typical batch setup. We we are pumping uh, a lot of solvent, a lot of uh, chemicals on from one side and collecting product from the other end. So this setup on the left hand side can be a big, big, this can be an industrial scale big. And this that will take that will take time because you have to finish your whole setup on the left hand side and you can then work your reaction may, uh, on in a flow reactor and you collect, collect the product on the other side. So this is a continuous process that that's what I mean it means you are continuously working on it. So that's why I in one of the slide I represented that we have, you know, uh, the yield at per hour means in one hour, how much of the you know, product you can accumulate on the right hand side. And uh, and uh, for further scale up, either you can increase the dimension of the reactor or what you can do, you can also, you know, uh, make them multiple reactors so one you know staking up of reactors one two three four so you can make multiple reactors so this is how you can also increase your throughput and then coming to your second question about the heterogeneity and the problems that you face in flow chemistry of course the the one of the solution to deal with such you know heterogeneous uh, substrates or you or the product or intermediates insoluble intermediates do you have you have to they uh, either work with you know ultrasounds to just to remove th those clogings or you know, flow chemistry has also evolved in solid phase synthesis means you can also work with solids in flow chemistry but for us for a generation of this uh, radical intermediate the most important thing was the homogeneity homo homogeneous homogeneity of this uh, reaction mixture so our aim was different to generate these radicals and then see uh, the application and scale this application from simple molecules to uh, biologically relevant larger biomolecules. And of course, we wanted our system to be as mild as possible. But indeed, it is possible to work with solids in flow chemistry. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hope I answered your question. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. So please unshare your screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay, and thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, sir. Okay, now uh, we are moving forward with our oral presentation competition. And uh, the presenters in this session are Dr. Romit Singh, Sumaya Praveen, Mohit Kumar Swarankar, and Tanvi Sharma. I request all the presenters to be ready with their presentations and those who are not presenting, they can unmute themselves. So uh, I request our first presenter, uh, Dr. Romit, to please present.
जब तक ये प्रेजेंटेशन लोड होते हैं हमारा उपेंद्र किधर चला गया तो चलो एनी लेट प्रो मिथ इस Am I audible, sir? <coughs> Hello. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. <coughs> First of all, thank you, everyone, and thank you uh, on the organizers and conveners for providing me this opportunity to present on this auspicious occasion. So, my name is Dr. Romesh Chetty, and I did my PhD from CSI RICT uh, under supervision of Dr. Ram Kumar Sharma, and I am here presenting my recent work on T. <coughs> So basically, tea is the most widely consumed uh, beverage across the globe, and if we consider, we see here, so its its consumption is being uh, growing every year. Uh, however, there is a major quest which is like increasing the uh, the increasing temperature, which is due to the global warming, which has uh, severely hampered the major tea growing region in India. So. based on this we 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 try to understand that how uh, we can overcome such problem by understanding the heat shock response heat stress response in tea so we uh, we in in the first step of our experiment we performed the uh, phenotypic we evaluated 20 quality cultivars of tea and identified the two con uh, contrasting cultivars the heat sensitive and tolerant cultivar and subsequently we further proceed to study the leaf stress injury analysis using physiological uh, analysis when we found a significant decrease in the relative water content cellular respiration chlorophyll content in the sensitive cultivar uh, with enhanced membrane damage in case of sensitive cultivars which was higher in the sensitive cultivar as compared to the tolerant cultivar so to really understand the transcriptional insights Inside uh, under uh, regulating this type of physiological uh, behavior, we perform the transcriptional profiling of the uh, two contrasting and uh, contrasting and uh, cultivars, and we identified 2,831 significant differentially expressed unigenes, which were successfully mapped to 15 chromosomes. And on further predicting the transcriptional interactome network, we identified uh, significant enrichment of each of proteins and each of transcription factors. Uh, in in case of tolerant cultivar which was uh, significantly higher in tolerant as compared to the sensitive cultivars so further we uh, based on the trans predicted transcriptional interactome network we identify that how does these genes <coughs> the heat shock proteins and heat shock transcription factors are relating to other physiological processes and here we found that there was a significant positive correlation with other physiological processes like apoporins starch metabolism calcium signaling phytohormones and cyp thiolene signaling along with this it was also hampering the uh, photosynthesis related metabolic activities and quality related metabolic activities which were having slight negative correlation with the these proteins so the uh, subsequently we also predicted the heat stress associated uh, pathways which clearly showed that significantly higher enrichment of hsf1 activation which was being regulated by hsp90 chaperon protein so with this we got a lead of hsp90 chaperon protein to uh, to to really work to really study that how this hsp90 chaperon protein is working in case of t in regulating the thermal response so we predicted the structure of this uh, t specific hsp90 protein which was found to be a homodimer of uh, 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 90 kilo dalton protein and we performed the molecular docking of this uh, particular protein and we identified that the this uh, a, a gelatinomycin which is commonly used to or uh, uh, using the inhibition of this uh, CS, uh, hsp90 was also actively inhibiting our uh, t specific hsp90 uh, by blocking the n, uh, n terminal domain atp binding sites in the n terminal domain further we identify we, we studied the uh, uh, physiological response or using the leaf disc, in, disc inhibitor assay and this thing gives something interesting where we found uh, slightly uh, uh, significantly decrease in the electrolyte leakage which enhanced the photosynthesis active oh, sorry uh, rest cellular respiration activity which was significant so we uh, further we also identified that there are certain uh, cascade of hsps which include uh, the hsp101 hsp70 hsp17.6 along with the heat shock transcription factor hsf a2 
so these were significantly enhanced on perform uh, on on attributing this uh, the gda so this probably indicates that in presence of gda this cshsp90 uh, generally in under normal condition the cshsp90 is used to uh, inhibit the heat shock transcription factor protein which in the presence of gda got inactivated and resulting in activation of the hsf a2 protein which subsequently leads to heat shock response so, so so therefore we we we, we derive a conclusive hypothesis based on this when we identify that how does uh, this change in environment uh, the 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 plant the tea plant uh, senses the heat stress and how it responds to the various environmental to to uh, at the cellular level but what is the transcriptional regulation in a coordinated transcriptional regulation which is response, which uh, resulted in uh, regulating the various metabolic activities like aquaporin, starch metabolism, chlorophyll biosynthesis, calcium, and its highly mediated plant signal system. So, in, uh, so we here we find out that there was a com a, a comprehensive uh, network which is being regulating this type of metabolic activities, weighing the calcium sensors, the CDPK, which was having direct interactions with these HSPs and HSF proteins were found to be involved as a, as a sense calcium yeah. sensors during the heat stress, which subsequently regulate the transcription factor families inside the nucleus, which are present like uh, Burki, ERS, MAP, kinase, and HSS, which we have also identified in, in silico, the, the location which were, uh, we have identified using in silico analysis, the nucleus location. Along with this, we, uh, how these, these transcription factor families are regulating the uh, phytohormones and starch metabolism uh, regulating the thermo tolerance in case of tea. Additionally, we also found that there are a certain number of uh, candidates which are regulating this comprehensive network to to acclimatize the plant, to to really pl to, to to providing the uh, plant to sustain the harsh environmental condition to overcome such type of uh, uh, harsh factors. So this uh, our research article was recently published in uh, Nature Horticulture Research recently in uh, uh, May 2021. And uh, so further, we are uh, trying to understand uh, in a way forward that how other proteins, how other genes are being regulating, uh, uh, are being involved in regulating the heat shock response in case of the, apart from HSPs, the other uh, nodes which are being, uh, the, 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 the uh, nodes which are being not being known, which, which, are, which can be novel nodes, which can be regulating this type of thing, which we found in our uh, transcriptional interactome network. How can it be used to further uh, provide uh, uh, or to generally develop, uh, to develop a thermo tolerance tea cultivar? So thank you. That's what, that's all what, what my presentation is. Thank you very much for providing me this wonderful opportunity. So. Now the session is open for discussion. Okay, uh, Romit, uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, I have a uh, couple of questions. First question is regarding the thermoresponsive elements. So which is the most important thermoresponsive element uh, which you identified by analysis of the susceptible and uh, the resistant cultivars? And does the epigenetics has any role to play in this process? Yes, sir. Thank you. So thank you for this wonderful question, sir. Uh, yes, there is a role of thermo. Uh, uh, they, uh, they actually, in this study, in the current study, we identified uh, HSP90 protein, which was found to be involved in uh, regulating the heat shock response, and uh, uh, which we also tried to validate using the uh, you know uh, the GDA mediated key, uh, inhibitor assay, which which was uh, which showed somewhat increase in the thermal shock response in case of the in a leaf disc assay. So, however, uh, regarding the epigenetic, epigenetic is also playing an important role and we are, uh, further we are also going into that aspect also because uh, for, uh, to, uh, this, this, this is the, the, the targeting the epigenetic effect, uh, you know, it, uh, we need a, a specific that point, specific, because that is a specific, uh, 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 we need to get a specific pattern into that. So that's why we, uh, we we are we are interested. We are also interested in that how epigenetics can be uh, in uh, change, uh, changing this type of uh, behavior in case of tea. Right, right. 
Dr. Rajesh. Yes. So I have a question. So thanks so much for the presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is just a basic question that uh, when you consider the heat stress uh, thermal tolerance, you would screen different varieties. Was the yield only parameter, or or the quality was also a parameter? So it's no, the leaf size or the yield. Or the quality, the D quality is also somehow com uh, compromised when there is a heat uh, stress or basically we can in this. So it's a very good question. So actually, uh, the quality is hampered during the heat stress because that is that we also uh, studied in our study also because there was a, a strong negative correlation of heat stress with the quality attributes. Uh, however, for uh, for screening the 20 cultivars, quality cultivars, we use only the uh, scorching effect. That how the uh, the heat stress is, uh, is is scorching the leaves or is limiting the uh, plant from general growth. So that's why we we consider only the leaf scorching effect in this case. Okay, thank you, <coughs> Doctor Ravi. Dr. Ravi, mm -hmm. Dr. Ravi Shankar, you after oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Are you audible? Are you audible? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. Uh, Ravi, Ravi, yes. Uh, Ravi, 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 Somebody else can ask. कोई बात नहीं आप पूछ लो पूछ लो इतना आवाज समझ में आ रही है आप सवाल पूछ लो अपना एक एक मिनट इसमें जैसे हिट शॉक फैक्टर प्रोटीन्स जो है ये मेरा जो इसमें अंडरस्टैंडिंग है कि ये बेसिकली जो है इको ट्रांसक्रिप्शन फैक्टर्स भी होते हैं एंड दे बाइंड द डीएनए इटसेल्फ and uh, their association with uh, binding is so much strong with respect to the uh, repetitive element, complex repeats. So, when you look at it, the complex repeats, where the genome cover, they actually hold the site for HSF binding. Okay? So, in this angle, I have a question from Dr. Hallan, that was very much relevant in your case, actually. Where the stress is seen by the heat shock factor, so, there is epigenetic regulation in the same way. And epigenetic expression is a hot spot in the same way. So, in this angle, there is a lot of people who are not able to do this. They 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 are जो एपिजेनेटिक मॉड्यूलेशंस है उसको स्टडी करने की कोशिश करना है कि किस तरह से एचएसएस फर्दर मॉड्यूलेट करते हैं और इसके लिए कुछ अगर कैंडिडेट्स के लिए हम कंसीडर कर रहे हैं सर जैसे कुछ ऐसे कैंडिडेट्स जैसे जो वाटर चैनल्स को रेगुलेट कर रहे हैं और कुछ अलग जिसकी वजह से शायद लीफ सरफेस टेंपरेचर जो वो मेंटेन करते हैं उसको भी हम कंसीडर कर रहे हैं उस केस में तो एपिजेनेटिक प्रोफाइल तुम्हारे पास एपिजेनेटिक प्रोफाइल्स हैं इनका एपिजेनेटिक प्रोफाइल से इनका डीएनए मिथाइलेशन का एपिजेनेटिक प्रोफाइल डीएनए मिथाइलेशन का प्रोफाइल वो हमारा तो नेक्स्ट स्टेप अभी हम कर रहे हैं सर उस स्टेप पे ना वो भी करना है अभी अच्छा ठीक ठीक डॉक्टर उपेंद्र हेलो डॉक्टर रामित Hello. Hello. I have just a general question that uh, when you are concluding something on T, so this conclusion is specific for specific region or how much diversity you have covered? Uh, you got my question? No, sir. Can you please uh, repeat the question? Uh, yes, I'm asking that when you are concluding something on T, suppose, whatever conclusion you have made in your presentation. So this is applicable for specific region T or it is means applicable for T growing anywhere. Means how much di uh, diversity you have covered? Uh, 
सर इनिशियली फॉर स्क्रीनिंग पर्पज वी हैव कवर्ड गुड डाइवर्सिटी बट बेसिकली वी हैव कंसिडर्ड ऑल दीज दीज आर गोइंग हेयर इन अवर करंट हिमालय पालमपुर रीजन ओके फाइन I think now there is no further questions. I request all the presenters, upcoming presenters, that you can please stick with the time limit. Your time limit is ten minutes. The first buzzer will come on six minutes eight and two. So kindly stick to time. And uh, thank you, Romin, for your presentation. Thank uh, you. And now I invite Sumaya Praveen from CSI Triple N Jammu. His topic is amalgamation of bioinformatics in tuberculosis drug discovery and translation medicine. Sumaya Praveen. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So we will be sharing your uh, presentation here. Yes, sir. We will be sharing your presentation here. Okay. Okay, sir. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Not now. You may proceed. Is it okay? Yes, sir, it's okay. Okay, you may proceed. Okay, sir. So, good afternoon, everyone. I, Sumeya Parveen, pursuing my PhD from uh, CSI Triple I, Jammu. I'm going to give a presentation on amalgamation of bioinformatics in tuberculosis drug discovery and translational medicine. So, kindly move to next slide, please. Okay. So, first, we should discuss what is tuberculosis and why we need an emergent essential drug against tb so tb is an contagious disease that is usually caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and according to who global tb report the 10 million people fell ill with tb in 2019 with highest burden on india that was 27 percentage so how tb uh, spread from one individual to another is when an infected person it they cough or sneeze they release some aerosol particles these aerosol particles they contain the bacilli mtb bacilli these bacilli when enters uh, or inhaled by a new host the pathogenesis in the new host begins from there so when these bacilli are inhaled alveolar macrophages are the first one to phagocytose these bacilli and try to kill these bacteria if they are able to succeed in that then there is a clearance of infection but if not then the other immune cells like neutrophils basophils then lymphocytes and uh, dendritic cells they will form a granuloma like structure to contain the spread of these uh, bacilli from one side to another so under the this this will uh, be called as a latent tuberculosis state so if there is an immune compromised state develops in an individual this granuloma will disintegrate spread of the bacteria or bacilli will occur from one side to another causing active tuberculosis So kindly move to next slide so we are having drugs for the treatment of tuberculosis we are having front line drugs that is first line drugs and second line drugs so first line drugs are basically given to individuals which are having drug sensitive tb and that comprises of isoniazid rifampicin pyrazinamide and ethambutol these are given with the some combinations for a period of 6 month then if there is a development of resistant to one of these first line drug then we go for the drug resistant tb treatment that comprises of group a medications then group b medications and group c combination of drugs from these groups are to be given to individual they that, that have developed this uh, resistant tb conditions so kindly move so why do we need a new drug why there is a very necessity for a development of new drug because first is lengthy duration of tb chemotherapy the drug resistant tb that i talked about 
the treatment for that uh, tb is of uh, two years 24 months minimum so that is very lengthy duration to uh, reduce the duration we need some new drugs that will uh, decrease the durations of this treatment then associated toxicity like uh, nephrotoxicity hepatotoxicity then gastrointestinal uh, complications are also associated with these drugs then comes non compliance of patients that is because this due, uh, due treatment therapy is very long people withdraw uh, at early stages of this uh, treatment and then they develop mdr and xdr that is prevailing a lot in the population multi drug resistant tuberculosis or extensively drug resistant tuberculosis kindly move to next slide efforts in the identification of new drugs are going on and it required uh, various approaches for the drug discovery that is uh, collaboration with uh, medicinal chemistry division where, where, where they will synthesize new drug candidates against some specific targets then we also need to screen FDA approved drug libraries against mycobacterium tuberculosis and we can identify some drugs that will be repurposed for TB. Then also some compounds or some active inhibitors that will modulate the host pathogen interactions, killing the MTB in a host directed manner. And then comes the informatics, the where we can apply computational tools for the drug discovery process. Kindly move to the next slide. So bioinformatics is a central field which has an integration with all the other fields like computer sciences, chemistry, biochemistry, biology, statistics, mathematics, engineering, everything. So according to NIH, bioinformatics is a research development or application of computational tools for expanding the use of biological, behavioral or health data to acquire, store or organize such data. So it has different tools like databases, then tools for structure function analysis of protein, then tools for primary sequence analysis, then uh, for phylogenetic analysis. All these tools, they actually help in uh, vast collections of information about biomolecules, and it also helps us to understand various constituents of a biomolecule, predict a protein structure, and also its function. It also helps in construction of phylogenetic uh, interactions between the molecules and the targets. Kindly move to next slide. OK, so computer aided drug designing that is CAD. It was uh, first uh, uh, it was first discovered by uh, Judith and uh, Hans and Fujita in 1960. So actually it helps in expedite the drug discovery and development process by minimizing the cost and time. So CAD is used for rapid assessment of chemical libraries in order to speed up the uh, development of new active compound. It is basically of two types that is structure based drug designing and ligand based drug designing. So structure based drug designing helps in identification of inhibitors for the targets that uh, for the target of proteins when we have the three dimensional structures already available for them. Like uh, we, here we can use uh, uh, software, um, here we can make the use of molecular docking, then MD simulations, and then comes the ligand based drug designing. In the ligand based drug designing, the three dimensional structures of the proteins are not available. So the information derived from a set of active compounds against a specific target that can be used in the identification of physiological and structural properties that will be responsible for giving the same biological activity. This is based on the fact that uh, structural similarities will give the similar biological activity. So CAD is being used, utilized to facilitate the target identification, validation, discovery of lead, uh, discovery and then lead optimization of uh, drugs against TB. It is also helping in screening different drug libraries, then modeling, homology modeling and molecular modeling also. It actually helps scientists to minimize the synthetic and biological testing efforts by focusing only on the most promising compounds. Kindly move to the next slide. Okay. So in silico screening approach, advantages that were associated with uh, computer aided drug designing, they have attracted the researchers towards high throughput in silico screening. In high throughput in silico screening, the huge compound libraries, they are screened uh, against a specific target to filter out the compounds that will not be showing activity against the target. So different libraries are taken like Campbell or Cambridge. 
and then the molecular docking are done using the softwares like C-Docker, AutoDock, Vina, Glide, Pymol, Pyrex. Then MD simulations are performed using the softwares Charm, Gromax, Amber, Desmond. And then we get the some binding energies of the interactions between the target and the compound. The compound with the most potent activity will be the one that will be showing the highest negative uh, binding energy. So the potent compounds will be the uh, highest negative binding energy will be considered as the most potent against the target. So kindly move to next slide. So here are some of the docking studies that are performed recently. For example, Cheswal et al. They have uh, screened Campbell and Zenk uh, database library containing of 60,000 compounds using the software Schrodinger software against the MTB FAD A5. So FAD A5 is a protein that is required for cholesterol aliphatic chain degradations in MTB. And they have found seven potent inhibitors against this FAD A5. Next is Kumari and Subarao. They screened Campbell library 56,000 compounds and they also performed uh, molecular docking using the Schrodinger software and against the target that was glutamine synthetase. And they found two compounds from this library. Kumar et al, they have also screened the same uh, database of uh, 40,000, uh, 4,000 compounds and they used uh, Schrodinger software against the different target that was NAR-L. NAR-L is required for nitrate or nitrite response regulatory protein in MTB. And they have also uh, found out two important or potent inhibitors against this uh, protein. Kindly move to next slide. So with all the data and the information, we can conclude that tuberculosis is killing millions of individuals all around the globe. And uh, with the most, uh, like most number of uh, mortality is in India that is 30 percent. So we require a novel treatment for TB to completely eradicate it from the population. New approaches are to be looked upon to facilitate this drug discovery process and bioinformatics is providing us with that uh, new possibility to explore the drug protein interactions and also determine novel drug that will be effective against the TB. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sumaya. You are uh, working for your PhD there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have uh, enrolled in August 2020. So, so uh, this was basically a uh, review, uh, sort of a review which uh, you have presented. Is, uh, any data that you yourself uh, generated using these tools? No, sir, not yet. We are uh, getting our hands on these tools. We will be uh, surely getting some data in coming future, not yet. This is just a literature review for the presentation, sir. Right. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks, Sumaya, for the presentation and for the information. Uh, just uh, it was more about how bioinformatics can play a role in finding new drugs for tuberculosis. So basically, you are talking about newer methods. And so, okay, you have shown that there are different advantages of using bioinformatics. But if I ask you a question, comparing the old traditional method of uh, finding a new drug, what is a disadvantage in when you are using a bioinformatic application? So here you have shown all the advantages. Okay, yes, so this sort of the times you can screen more libraries. But what limitation do you find out or do you see using this bioinformatics tools uh, compared to the other older techniques for doing this? Sir. What I think is because it's a technology based, computer based, the researchers or the person who will be utilizing these uh, applications or tools, they should have a very uh, good knowledge about these softwares. Like it's very uh, like molecular docking, then MD simulations, they are performed with the help of computational tools, but we require a basic knowledge that how to interpret the data from that, uh, uh, from the um, results that we get like uh, for example if we perform a whole cell screening, for, uh, um, whole cell screening against uh, this bacteria for uh, uh, the inhibitors that we get or the compounds that we get we'll just uh, visualize uh, like the results are basically visualized uh, we can see or interpret color change and that but in, as compared in the computer sciences or uh, bioinformatics field they will give us like numbers then we have to determine what they 
correspond to so that is i think uh, we need a good understanding of bioinformatics and the software also okay let's call question again that yes. how do you nullify the effect because when you are studying mathematical you are studying one to one interaction one yes. drug one target but in real world condition when you are treating a patient or in the, if it is working in a cell there are other factors as well so which can interfere so how do you uh, remove the such factors when you are doing a mathematical analysis okay uh, sir for this question i will i am not very sure how we nullify it but uh, because yes there are certain factors when we come into a, a clinical phases then uh, then we face some problem but here in computational do we are basically uh, performing one to one interaction as you said with the protein and the target we are not uh, considering the all the others that's why we go forward for mechanistical studies whether it will be targeting the bacteria or not killing it in the lab conditions or not then there there is a clinical man, clinical uh, trials also done so that is the thing we have to perform some mechanistical studies after that then after these studies if we get some good results then we can say like bioinformatics will help in the starting process not the complete thing एप्लीकेशन फॉर ड्रग डिस्कवरी डेट इज ओके सो what uh, i want to specifically ask if you come down very uh, you have mentioned about structure based screening as well as you have mentioned ligand based screening so yes. what do you think that uh, which two method perform better and if you want to start with so which kind of a method you want to go okay sir so i will be preferring first the structure based uh, drug designing because for that we are already having a chem like uh, structures of the target protein and then we can directly just uh, analyze whether the inhibitors are interacting with these targets or not then if we are not having uh, if we are going to find a novel target that for uh, whose structures is not defined or not present in the uh, scenario then we can go for ligand based drug designing and we can identify the in study the inhibitors that will be acting upon the target and then we can analyze what what is the binding site then what is the uh, why they are having showing the activity how they are showing the activity that can be later on uh that is okay but still if you have started from a chemical base uh, chemistry because you have mentioned that uh, from triple im jammu you want to collaborate with uh, chemistry lab then you are going for the chemical leads also so that yes. means then at that time you will say that i want to go about a structure and you want to uh, search for all the leads again that a particular Uh, structure that point okay so that is the yes. advantage of this but still uh, people that uh, people are asking that i was thinking that you can come into the more specific point okay. more specific okay. uh, okay. strategy then it give you better view okay thank okay. you sir for this thank you thank you okay. Okay. thank you smaya smaya now we think uh, the session is completed uh, and we are uh, getting out of time so uh, we are moving towards our next presenter mohit kumar solkar he is going to uh, presenting his work on dissecting the molecular mechanism of fecal uh, morphogenesis in rose mohit kumar i request all the judges kindly uh, come uh, complete your questions and the session within 10 minutes uh, very good afternoon everyone uh, are my slides visible hello yes 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 thank you sir uh, 
respected bg sir uh, director sir and the other faculty members a very happy teachers day to everyone and uh, i am going to present here one of the very interesting uh, about the rose as we all know that roses are very beautiful and sometimes the presence of prickles makes them a little uneasy to uh, handle and very uneasy to be the economical economically and sustainable so here this is the first effort in order to dissect the molecular mechanism of prickle morphogenesis in roses so roses are uh, universally recognizable flowers in existence and uh, about 15 million years ago the, they had come they might have come and domesticated about 5000 years ago probably in china and till date there are more than 30000 species uh, present in the world so they are mostly uh, commercial uses as cut, cut flowers rose oil rose water and folk medicines also so uh, every flower exported out of india every fifth flower is the rose so the economical and the sustainable benefit of the uh, you know in terms of the market share is very high so therefore these the presence of prickles becomes the major bottleneck which affects yield harvest storage and transportation so as an undesirable trait we try to identify what is the molecular clues we can get it from the initiating prickles soft prickle and hard prickles on the basis of their size so whatever varieties which are present till date they are largely genetically stable unstable that means they can recur recur the presence of prickles after a certain generation so uh, with the, we are thankful to the presently available biotechnological interventions which is very beautiful and uh, uh, implementable approaches for dissecting the molecular mechanism for that we have used the emerging tiny initiating prickles soft prickles which can easily break and the hard prickles which are not easy to break in order to get the morphological and anatomical changes comparative gene expression profiling and targeted metabolic profiling for getting the clues so for morphological uh, changes what we observe the initiating prickle is uh, is actually from the epidermis which is the very organized cellular structure and uh, leading to the initiating prickle uh, from the epidermis uh, uh, right entangling from the cotinga parenchyma and, and protuberance towards the outer surfaces okay. and uh, in the hard prickle we observe the lignification of highly lignified cells and which is also corroborated corroborated with the sam and tam studies okay. and uh, we have found some some vesicles which are present into the hard prickles and these are elongated cells which are present in order to make the more lignified product into the cell after that we have observed the high content of lignin compared to sp in initiating and soft prickle and uh, the high content of tpc the total phenolics compared to sp leaf and stem that means the hard prickles are very much interesting to note that what all features are going on as far as the chemical and biochemical is concerned and the molecular events we have deciphered using the rna sec analysis we have used Uh, the uh, ip sp and hp with uh, independent technical uh, three biological replicates and we have done the uh, rna sec data and this is the data analysis pipe pipeline we have performed uh, the reference based uh, mapping and assembly and uh, followed by annotation differential expression by uh, followed by rt pcr q pcr validation so in comparative gene expression profiling we have seen there are the mapping number of reads have the high fraction with the reference to the rosa chinensis genome and the commonly upregulated genes we have divided this study into the three comparisons the comparison a high hard prickles versus soft prickles comparison b hard versus initiating prickles comparison c soft versus initiating prickles and out of this the commonly expressed facial expressed genes were annotated and find out that that there are the upregulation of nitrogenoid metabolic pathways mitotic cell division secondary metabolic processes developmental processes and others so after that we have we were very keen to know that how these differentially expressed genes are there they are basically belonging to the set of secondary metabolism which are very validated by the real time qpcr and further this secondary metabolites accumulation we have confirmed the presence of uh, tissue specific localization in initiating prickles soft prickles and the hard prickles which is coming as a intracellular species so after that the analysis of transcription factors give us the very uh, interesting uh, observation that if, even if 
the presence of these particular transcription factors a set of transcription factors basically belonging to the mbw complex this mbw complex states the mip and bhlh and wd40 uh, transcript ttg1 gene which actually comprising of the activator and inhibitor complex when the r2 r3 may be present it act as a activator and when tcl1 only only r3 may a uh, transcription factor is present it act as a inhibitor so this becomes very interesting so all the hypothesis was if at all it has the role in the prepel demophogenesis it should uh, low or no expression in the bark so we have validated the uh, the expression profiling uh, using real time qpcr in in uh, in our this interestingly tcl1 and cpc were heavily heavily expressed in initiating prepel suggesting the role and one of the interesting thing about this mbw complex this is the secondary metabolites accumulation complex known to involve in the trichome development and epidermal cell differentiation so for that surprisingly we have validated this mbw complex in trichal and trichal nesthonal phenotypes there we have uh, seen the role of gl1 gl3 in all the transcription mbw uh, transcription complex with highly down regulated in case of Himalayan wonder, which is the prickleless variety. Interestingly, TCL1 and CPC was very high in the case of uh, prickleless variety. And uh, after that, since there are some transcription factors, TT2 and TT4 and TT8, they are involved in the accumulation of uh, flavonoids. So we were keen to know how, why these uh, contents are available. So we have compared using the HPTLC approach and find out the uh, accumulation is very higher compared to. soft and leaf and the stem of the roses and we have validated with the uplc and quantified that the catechin contained was almost double and uh, six fold uh, changes in comparison to ip and sp therefore in sub to summarize the work we have proposed the gene regulatory model which might be the indication of hormonal balance which actually activating this complex further to differentiate into the prickle on the other hand TRP, TRY, CPC, and TCL move to another cell, and then there is no prickles. So, therefore, to summarize my work, morphological analysis of reveal uh, reveal these are the sharp pointed structure, which are very distinct, hard and lignified. And RNA seq analysis showed the prevalence of secondary metabolites during the prickle formation. And differential ex expression analysis of transcription factors, validation in the prickleless plants, metabolite accumulation. which confirms the role of canonical mbw complex in prickle morphogenesis therefore the prickle morphogenesis is coupled with the secondary metabolite accumulation especially flavonoids and this is the first report for the presence of catechin in the hard prickles likewise we have also seen that there is a catechin cuticular wax deposition uh, which is regulated by gly so therefore we have published this article in the uh, plant and direct journal american society of plant biologists and the, this mbw complex is known to up just after publishing this after few weeks we have two interesting papers in the line of the uh, role of mbw complex we i am thankful to my guide my mentor dr sanjay kumar and funding from csi hbt thank you so much thank you so much sir now the session is open for discussion uh, so mohit uh, i have uh, a small question yes sir uh, because uh, roses are uh, Uh, i think uh, they originated in the himalayas yes sir probably uh, they were originated in the himalayas like rosa vagiana is right are there some are there some natural uh, cultivars of species of roses which are thornless sir till date i have not observed anyone uh, which is reported as a naturally available prickleless mm -hmm. And uh, does silica has any role to play in the development of uh, prickle? Silica, sir. So silica is mostly uh, developed as a phytolith in the thorns. They are reported as a phytolith. I mean, all the discarded materials after the death of the uh, cell, which actually deposits as a silica. Okay. Uh, Mohit, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Tell me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I have just a basic question. So you mentioned that rose uh, prickle is an unwanted trait. Yeah. So what's the basic function in it in it in this rose when it is present? What's the basic function of the prickle? If plant is put, putting some energy into it, something is storing there. So there might be some natural role or some role. And how that is unwanted trait? Actually, sir, after uh, 
you know domestication of yoga especially the people have found that there is no need because they are actually known for just for herbivory for protection of the flower for protection of the plant and from the wild animals and insects or bacteria or many so many cases so therefore the main role of presence of prickles is just for the uh, as a herbivore so after domestication people are available you can easily observe the things therefore it becomes the an undesirable thing as far as i know but uh, yeah and second thing have you tested that okay if it is a herb related to herbivory something else if you uh, grow this plants in some other conditions and compare whether this is more susceptible to herbivory or something else or some other kind of uh, different stresses or anything else because still it is not clear what is the actual role so what i observed is in the prickleless roses the flower quality and the vase like become uh, vase like becomes a little less so that is what the observation which has been made uh, in the prickleless roses flower quality and vase like this yeah is become less becomes less it becomes less yes okay but uh, uh, as far as i know this uh, base life is mostly dependent on clean because flower of seasons and these things is uh, clean dependent uh, yeah that could be regulated by okay yes. yes thank you okay thank you we are out of time so drop next doctor ravi thank you sir now we are moving towards our next participant uh, tanvi sharma from <laughs> एक पूछ लेते हैं बाल यस सर हेलो यस सर हेलो आवाज आ रही है हाँ हाँ आ रही है सर अच्छा इन दो स्लाइड आई सॉर्ट डेट डेट यू यू हैव एनोकेटेड इन प्रोन्स एंड एक्सोन्स आल्सो सो यू हैव गोट जीनोम ऑफ रोज और व्हाट So, sir, the genome is already available. That, uh, there are two genomes are available, like Rosa multiflora and second one is Rosa chinensis, which is believed to be the most primitive one. The old plus DNA, uh, the double haploid, is believed to be most primitive one, and where the genome is available, we have used that as a reference for our RNA seq data analysis. So, any any attempt to, to find out if कोई उसका जो स्प्लाइस वेरिएंट्स है कोई वो प्रीडोमिनेट कर रहा हो इस तरीके का उस पर्टिकुलर टिश्यू के लिए दैट वुड बी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सर थैंक्स फॉर द क्वेश्चन बट सर वी आर वी वर ओनली इंटरेस्टेड टू फाइंडिंग आउट द जीन्स फर्स्ट एंड देन ओनली वी वुड बी लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड फॉर द स्ट्रक्चरल वेरिएंट्स लाइक स्प्लाइस वेरिएंट्स एंड ऑल ओके थैंक्स थैंक यू सो मच सर थैंक यू सो मच Now I invite Tanvi Sharma from CSR HPT. She is going to present his work on the draft genome sequence of Picoriza curva, an endangered Himalayan medicinal herb. Tanvi Sharma. Hello. A very good afternoon to all. Decoding the sequence of DNA that constitutes the genome is a fundamental resource in biology, and my PhD work uh, involved development and analysis of draft genome of Picoriza curvua. Picoriza is a medicinally important endangered plant species of Plantagenesi family, and the estimated genome size of the species is 1.76 GB, and the diploid chromosome number is 34. The medicinal properties of this plant species are due to monoterpenoid picrocytes present in leaf, root, rhizome, and inflorescence of the plant. And basically, four major pathways are involved in picrocyte biosynthesis: MEP, MVA, phenylpropionide, and iridoid path pathways. The iridoid moiety is obtained from geraniol diphosphate, which undergoes a series of cyclization steps in a, in the iridoid pathway. And the sediment and valinate moieties of the um, picrocytes are obtained from phenylpropionide pathway. In spite of its high medicinal importance, little information regarding Picurua genome is available in literature, and there is no reference genome available for this species. So we uh, undertook this task to uh, sequence its whole genome by using two uh, next-generation sequencing platforms. One was Illumina, and the other was PegBio. Uh, I want to share with you all that this is the first in-house developed genome of any Himalayan plant species that has been deciphered, and it was solely done in-house by uh, 
using a novel strategy which was developed by the bioinformatics group of our institute and uh, it involved uh, the uh, repeat annotation of the primary assembly draft first and thereafter uh, unique regions were searched for further scaffolding purpose and uh, this table represents the draft assembly statistics and the n50 of our primary assembly draft was 129.6 kb so then we validated our assembly by using four approaches first one uh, we uh, assessed the completeness of our assembly by using busco and uh, which showed that 94.2% of the viridae plant genes were covered in the genome we used uh, plaza for gef families for uh, this uh, for uh, validation of our assembly and it's uh, we found that uh, the our picoroa was successfully clustered in lemier's order and further uh, we also uh, mapped Uh, already available and functionally validated picoroa ESTs onto the genome, and we were successful in that. Further, we selected 11 supraconductors, and we uh, uh, amplified their 3 dash and 5 dash ends using PCR and confirmed them by sequencing. Then we annotated the whole genome, and uh, we found that 76% of the genome was repetitive, and major fraction was composed of gypsy and copia repetitive uh, elements, which are LTRs. and uh, among protein coding genes uh, highest represented families were cytochrome p450s and ubp glucosyl transferases and uh, these families may be involved in the cyclization of the iridoid moiety as well as the glucosylation of the iridoid uh, moiety of the picrocytes and further the transcription factors in the genome were also annotated and i have highlighted bzip and berkey because when we uh, scanned the binding sites for these transcription factors across the genome we found uh, the binding sites for these Uh, uh, two group of transcription factors in the promoters of the genes regulating picrocyte biosynthesis and uh, further the non coding elements in the genome were also annotated and the long non coding fraction was 30% now uh, we got interested in the uh, uh, identification of the regulatory elements in the genome because uh, we had a previous lead uh, from our lab in which we had found that exposure of picoro uh, picoriza to two temperature it uh, modulated uh, vital metabolic pathways with evident alteration in gene expression and as microRNA and transcription factors as well as their binding sites are key regulators of gene expression so we uh, went for identification of these regulatory elements in the genome first uh, for identification of microRNA we did small rna sequencing and uh, we identified a total of 710 microRNAs in the genome and Further, the respective targets of these microRNAs were also mapped onto the genome. The expression of both the targets as well as the microRNAs was validated by qRT-PCR. These are the microRNA-regulated biological processes in both leaf and rhizome tissue. We uh, we found that most of the upregulated biological processes at 25 degree were a response to abscisic acid stimulus, defense response to fungus, and response uh, defense response to heat. Whereas at 25 degree the down regulated processes they belong to growth regulation of cellular respiration and response to cold these are the micro rna regulated keg pathways so based on our observations we proposed a model that a temperature of 25 degree it acts as a stress which leads to excessive ros accumulation as well as influx of cytosolic calcium which leads to activation of downstream signaling cascades also uh, this uh, Uh, temperature of 25 degree it leads to the activation of signaling cascades mediated by plant hormones and which uh, further leads to the activation of transcription factors and the uh, the um, in uh, green arrows these are the respective targeting micro rnas so uh, our previous work had also identified uh, working motifs in the promoters of regulatory genes so as these working motifs could be the potential binding sites for worky group of transcription factors so we got interested in worky transcription factors uh, there are there after we uh, identified two worky transcription factors in the genome one contained a single uh, worky motif and the other contained the double worky motif we uh, cloned them to full length and characterized them and uh, we found that the double worky uh, transcription factor it exhibited a positive correlation with the picrocyte content and when we functionally evaluated it in yeast to uh, we found that it exhibited dna binding ability as well as transcriptional activation abil ability further we uh, transiently overexpressed both these workies in tobacco and we found that both of these workies they modulated the expression of native genes involved in mep and mdf pathway so coming over to the conclusion 
this a simple first draft genome of picorua offers a valuable resource and reference in information for evolutionary as well as association studies and the availability of this genome will uh, obviously facilitate integration of biotechnological tools for improvement and conservation of picorua and the study also provides a repertoire of temperature responsive microRNAs which can be further validated and experimental findings also suggested the involvement of worky transcription factors in picrocyte biosynthesis thank you all thank you tanvi sharma now the session is open for discussion uh, so tanvi what was the what was what do you think is the likely role of uh, worky transcription factors in the picrocyte biosynthesis so uh, likely would as if so uh, they may be binding to the promoters of the regulatory genes of the pathway and further they are regulating the pathway because uh, when we analyze the expression in relation to picrocyte content they exhibit uh, this double worky it exhibited a positive correlation with the with the picrocyte content also and uh, i have also uh, generated uh, transgenic lines in arabidopsis for stable expression so it uh, it is also up regulating the expression of uh, native genes of uh, rhabdopsis uh, involved in mvp and nva pathway okay yes sir thanks sir tony for the presentation and uh, it's a nice uh, thing to hear that about this genome sequencing i have a basic question so uh, what temperature is usually picorrhiza grows and yes. that's all sir i'm not uh, it's not audible to your question at what what temperature range usually this picorrhiza grows in natural conditions yes sir uh, during night time it can be from 2 to -10 okay. and uh, during day it can be it can range from 8 to 30 approximately during the day time or 25 maximum okay so uh, 15 degrees it produces more picorrhiza is it is comparison to 25 degrees or the natural conditions So it is compared to 25 degree, not too natural. 15 we have taken as an ambient temperature because when we do it in the growth chamber, but we have found uh, this research was going on since last few years in our lab. We found that 15 is ambient temperature for the plant to grow here, and okay, at 25 it doesn't grow well. Okay, thank Others, others can ask if. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I ask, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I mean, uh, from your genome sequencing, if, if you can see, I mean, uh, uh, majority of the elements you, which you find is trans. I mean, uh, these repeat elements. Can you link somehow the role of these, uh, you know, repeat elements with adaptation? I mean, can you comment on that? Uh, with adaptation, sir, uh, actually, uh, they uh, they have a complex role. First, uh, the direct role is, I think, in the genome size expansion only. But they can act as uh, regulators of gene expression because uh, they regulate uh, the formation of nucleoprotein complexes, and they may have a role in epigenetic regulation of gene expression. So, how gene genome expansion is advantageous in terms of adaptation? In terms of adaptation. Yes, I mean you 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 said genome expansion. I mean these repeats are involved in genome expansion. So how they are linked? I mean uh, genome expansion to the adaptation. Yes, sir. Um, because uh, sir, evolutionary studies have uh, in many studies I have read that uh, these repeats have uh, increased through uh, with time. Now uh, with duplication events are happening or something is happening. so maybe uh, they have a selective adv advantage in the evolution they are uh, selected uh, the varieties which are having much repeats are evolutionarily selected okay thank you very much uh, thank you tanvi sharma now we are we are very much thankful to our judges and the participants of the session for uh now we are having a lunch break for the session is very interactive and definitely will provide you more information because people are talking about natural uh, nutraceutical advancements the potential innovatory of sars covid 
and bio uh, bio batteries remote sensing at gis so now the uh, there will be a lunch and uh, the lunch is now available in the icsr hvt canteen for everyone everyone uh, will meet sh at sharp uh, 2:30 uh, because uh, since we are already running out of time so we will have to complete uh, two more sessions uh, and uh, uh, an e poster session will be uh, uh, will be conducting currently and a link will be provided uh, to you so you can the participants and judges can uh, uh, link to the uh, e poster session and rest uh, you can stay here for a session two after lunch so we'll meet at 2:30 thank you everyone thank you thank you thank
Okay. Hello, everyone. So now we are back. I hope uh, everyone had a good lunch. So after lunch, we have a parallel e, e poster session, which is currently going on. Uh, for the session two, uh, we have uh, one invitee speaker. Uh, who is the alumnus from uh, CSIR IHBT, uh, Dr. Praveen Rahi, Scientist C, National Center for Cell Science, Pune. Uh, he will be talking about harnessing soil plant microbe interaction for human health and well being. Uh, in session two, uh, we have presenters for oral presentation competition Ankur Kumar Chaudhary from uh, Bansilal University, Bihani. He will be talking about uh, on a nutraceutical advancement and insights of equus SNS donkey milk probiotics. Another one we have uh, Mahima Chohan from CSR ISBT Palampur itself. Uh, she will be talking about discovery of natural molecules as potential inhibitors of SARS COVID 2. Another one we have uh, Dr. Anuradha from CSR ISBT. She will be talking about the use of remote sensing and GIS in landscaping. Next one, we have a presentation from uh, Ashish Kumar Rajayan from Punjab University, Chandigarh. She will be talking about biobattery, a new way to look upon electric power. Uh, in the second session, we have uh, five uh, presenters. Uh, Parneet Kaur from Shurini University. She will be talking about wastewater surveillance using artificial intelligence in Himachal Pradesh. Such a wonderful, uh, you know, the topics of uh, their presentations. And after that uh, session two, we will have a video, a video session and interactive session. So, Okay, so let's start our uh, session two. Uh, Dr. Praveen Rahi. Yeah. Okay. So. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. yes sir, yeah. Yes. Am I audible to you people? Sir. Am I audible now? Nah? That's just. Yes, yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I'm just. I'm just sharing my screen. Yes, sir. Kindly of share your screen. Yeah. So. 
screen and yeah so presenting after lunch is really a daunting task because most of the people they had good lunch and especially in the sunday afternoons it's it's indeed very difficult task to attend another uh, session uh, and uh, you may find uh, presentation a little boring and may take little nap also and in virtual modes it's like impossible to keep people engaged uh, during these presentations but i'll try my best to uh, to make keep you people away from the uh, after lunch nap and uh, I hope you must had a, a good lunch and uh, yeah so first of all I just want to introduce myself um, right now I'm working at National Center for Microbial Resource which is a microbial repository at National Center for Cell Science and uh, here I'm uh, working as a research scientist uh, and in addition to that I'm also looking into the various services as a service coordinator I'm coordinating all the services and I keep on receiving emails and uh, uh, service requests from uh, 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 many many uh, 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 CSIR HBT alumni and many uh, research scientists those who are working currently in uh, CSIR HBT so I'm not very much uh, like uh, away from HBT so I, I'm uh, constantly in touch with uh, most of the researchers in IHBT. So that's one thing that uh, I, I still feel good. Uh, and the, the other thing I just want to mention that the place Palampur and IHBT is a, a place, it's like very cold and uh, pleasant temperature, but people are so warm there. So uh, I, I have made friends for my life there and uh, uh, that's uh, shared some wonderful memories uh, with the, the my uh, uh, PhD fellows that time, and uh, uh, I have learned so many things. And I, I, I must say, I must admit that I'm one of the rarest person who used to travel to, uh, who used to visit each and every lab of IHBT because in my lab we don't have much of the facilities that time. We were not having any PCR machines. We don't have any gel doc systems. Even gel electrophoresis, I have to visit Dr. Sanjay's lab. So I have used uh, like uh, resources in all all different different laboratories in CSI IHBT. Uh, may it be Dr. Sanjay's lab, uh, GCMS and GCHPLC at Do uh, Dr. Call's lab at Dr. Vikram's lab, and then uh, uh, gel doc documentation and incubators at Dr. Vipin Helen's search lab. At that time, Dr. Zedi was was also there. So uh, uh, and and I, I learned uh, biostatistics from Dr. Ardi Singh, late Dr. Ardi Singh, and uh, that that really changed my perspective towards looking into science in a different way. Uh, like it's not like somebody's like you you need to have everything in your uh, lab and with you then only you can do good science i i believe if you if you believe in uh, asking good questions so you'll make ways for uh, performing those uh, uh, experiments also so with this i uh, uh, when i when i joined uh, ncmr uh, nccs pune so here uh, it was a new setup and this is a culture collection wherein people deposit their cultures we provide services we also look into microbial taxonomy i was not a taxonomist by training i'm a, uh, i call myself a molecular microbial ecologist so for me it was like a little bit of a shift where when when i joined here but i try to adapt to the uh, local environment then that's how we people do when we move to a, a newer place and then I started working in uh, because in uh, ecology studies you have to travel in different places. Most of my research during PhD was on Leh Ladakh, uh, Lahul and Spiti region, so cold desert and all that. But here I could not access uh, any of the uh, this kind of uh, environment. So and initially I was not I was not having any fund uh, fund uh, to support my research also. So I started uh, doing a little bit of research on cell phones and I started looking into microbial uh, communities in, uh, on the cell phones and uh, that led to a, a short term uh, kind of. Uh, 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 glory and uh, a study was reported by almost all uh, major uh, news channels and uh, 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 in different print media also. Uh, but that didn't, uh, many people suggested me to focus more on uh, electronic gadgets and the things which are around people and look into the microbial communities. 
but the passion and the love uh, and the things which I have learned at IHBT that drove me back to uh, look into the soil plant microbe interactions which I have learned uh, while my, uh, doing my PhD with the, uh, Dr. Arvind Gulati's lab at uh, Palampur. So, uh, so the title of my talk is uh, Harnessing Soil Plant Microbe Interaction for Human Health and Well-Being. So it's, it's like a quite a broad title. Uh, it, it's not like uh, I'll give you a whole lot of information that how we can harness the soil plant microbe interactions to uh, improve the human health and well-being. I'll be just giving you a glimpse on how we can uh, understand the key drivers uh, which shapes the plant rhizosphere microbial communities. And from there, we can take clues and develop strategies to uh, uh, improve the uh, human health and well-being by using this uh, uh, or by harnessing these soil plant microbe interactions. So with this, I'll start. And before I start, I'll, I'll give you a brief overview about what are the tools which we can use uh, or we, which we were using and we are using uh, to decode microbial communities. This is just for uh, uh, most of the students, those who are uh, recently joined PhD or those who want to uh, look into microbial communities. So I just want to give a brief uh, overview. What are the tools which are available to us and what are the tools which are uh, more appropriate in today's scenario. So sample collection is one very important thing, but when you collect a sample, then you process, how you process the, uh, uh, the sample for uh, understanding the micro uh, or decoding the microbial community. So there are different, different approaches. One is cultivation-based approach. And during my PhD, I did most of the research, um, all, all, of, all of my research uh, by cultivating microorganisms. Uh, I, I cultivated phosphate solidizing bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria, and then we studied their uh, uh, like uh, diversity by using different uh, DNA fingerprinting tools and all these experiments I used to do in Dr. Uh, uh, Sanjay's lab. So, yeah, so it, it, it was like we were not having any any of the uh, facilities that time. So I, I'm really grateful to Dr. Sanjay and uh, uh, his students and uh, my very good friends there, those who helped me uh, accessing all those equipments uh, that time. Uh, and then and nowadays, uh, the, we, we can uh, directly look into the communities also without cultivating microorganisms. So what are those uh, techniques where we can remove the cultivation step and directly look into the microbial community? So now we have a different kind of lens to look into the microbial communities. And that lens is uh, using NGS platforms. So previously, people were uh, people use direct cloning also. And uh, by cloning, then again, you... Uh, pick the clones and then go for sequencing. It's uh, like quite tedious uh, work, but initially when the NGS platforms were not available, most of the microbiome or uh, metagenome uh, studies were uh, conducted by using uh, cloning methods. Uh, and few people used uh, 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 density gradient gel electrophoresis or TRFLP. So these were so two, three different different methods, but they are not not in use now. And now we are mostly using direct sequencing of uh, community DNA by using NGS platforms. So uh, please uh, remind me if I if I, if I cross the time limits. Uh, so maybe I, I I might take some little time. Okay. So just yes, uh, yes, give me a yes, ping yes, or yes. something. Yeah. So uh, when 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 you are using uh, this direct sequencing technologies or uh, NGS technologies for understanding the microbiome, you need to have uh, robust uh, microbiome analysis pipelines and uh, databases. Uh, so for that, you, the databases where you search your uh, data, like whatever you get out of the uh, this microbiome pipeline after sequencing, you have to find their identity, like which species, which genus, which phyla they belong to. So to for, for this type of studies, you need to have uh, well curated databases. So there are a few pipelines which are uh, very well uh, in use and Chime and Mother, they were the standard pipelines uh, which are being used by people uh, across the globe uh, till now, uh, till uh, uh, last five, uh, three or four years. But uh, Dada 2 and Chime 2, these are the newer versions or we can call them uh, Generation 2 uh, uh, Amplicon uh, Microbiome Analysis Pipelines. And here we, uh, we, we get much 
accurate results now and uh, if you want to me to elaborate more on th uh, this i can just make one or two statements that previously we used to assign species or ot use we, we used to call them operational taxonomic units by uh, based on their 99% uh, sequence identity or 97% uh, sequence identity which was later we found that it's not correct because a single nucleotide variation in 16S RNA gene could lead to a new, new species. Now, today, today it's a valid fact, but previously it used to be like 97% similarity in 16S RNA gene similar, uh, sequences. It means they belong to similar species. And if this, it's less than 97%, then it's a new species. But now the concepts has been changed and that's how the analysis pipelines uh, are also updated. So these two pipelines are uh, very well in use and Chime, one, uh, Chime 2 has recently succeeded Chime 1 and there are newer versions of uh, Chime 1. So if somebody who plans, who is planning to perform a microbiome analysis, I, I, I suggest them to choose Chime 2 instead of Chime 1 or Mother or Data 2. So uh, now uh, looking into the databases, 6 RNA gene sequencing, we have hundreds of databases and I have enlisted a few of them like ribosomal DNA project, RDP database, which was the conventional database when, when I was doing PhD in uh, that time, people used to work with RDP database and that time we used to consider RDP database is the best database, but it's not true now. So later on, we, we found that uh, Green Gene and EZ BioCloud, they are also very good databases, especially EZ BioCloud, which is very, very well curated type strain database, uh, or maybe uh, they, they also consider some of the uh, genome sequenced uh, data databases so the silver database it's it's one of the best uh, curated uh, database for 6ness rna gene sequences and it's keep they keep on updating so in case of that databases it's very important to have a database which is recently updated if you use a database which is last updated somewhere in 2018 or 2015 that means the information on the newer species because every uh, year uh, as it uh, uh, microbiology systematics or uh, uh, taxonomist I must tell you that we discover more than thousand species uh, based on the cultivation approaches and more than thousand species are now being discovered or being named based on single uh, this uh, um, max means metagenome uh, assembled genomes or single uh, uh, single cell amplified uh, genome sequence amplified genomes so sags and max they are they are, they are also being used for uh, 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 naming new species in case of fungi uh, we, we have just one database and it is also very good. Unite database. Other one is NCBI. If somebody wants to use NCBI database, that is also good. But NCBI database, when somebody wants to use, they have to be very careful because it contains all different sort of data. So you have to uh, make your own curation. So if you do not want to do it, do use uh, Unite database. It has both ITS region and 18S region sequences uh, curated in that. So in this presentation, I'll give you a snapshot of three uh, different stories which we uh, conducted in our lab. And the first one is uh, to understand the how uh, a host plant shapes the microbiome under different nutrient management practices. So in this particular uh, study, we collected samples from uh, a long-term experimental trial, which was conducted under different management practices for last 10 years. So these management practices were being used to cultivate rice and peas alternatively uh, for last 10 years. So we uh, went to, uh, this is uh, this particular study is in collaboration, was uh, done in collaboration with the ICR uh, Regional Center Shillong. And uh, we collected these samples, uh, uh, rhizospheric and bulk soil sample and brought, brought them to lab. And then we performed microbiome analysis and we did the uh, uh, whole pipeline. And then uh, we come to know the alpha diversity. And in alpha diversity, what we found is uh, that bulk soil samples are, having less uh, are less diverse in comparison to the rhizospheric soils so which which is something which is uh, not uh, uh, collaborating well with the uh, findings people uh, reported in, in case of rhizospheric samples because uh, most of the studies people found that bulk soil samples are much uh, diverse they are much richer in diversity they have much more species uh, in comparison to the rhizospheric soils so what we 
conclude it here because these soils are being constant uh, under a, a, new, a particular kind of nutrient management practices and they are being used for uh, last 10 years in uh, uh, for cultivating only two crops so that might lead to uh, loss of diversity and it's a known fact that if you uh, perform uh, uh, conventional agriculture or uh, 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 cultivate only one or two crops for longer time, or is what we call monoculture, you that will lead to uh, loss of diversity. And when you uh, cultivate uh, a crop like pea, which is a legume, and legumes are known to enrich the soil with, uh, or they they are known to attract more and more bacteria towards their roots uh, because they enter into symbiosis and they release so many root exudates. So that, that could be the reason that bulk soil samples, uh, rice free soil samples are much richer in their diversity. So when we looked into the beta diversity plots, what we found is that the rice free samples are very compactly uh, uh, grouped together, whereas the bulk soil samples, they are scattered in a, in a bigger uh, uh, circle. So this, this particular uh, uh, graph indicates that uh, the plant, host plant is uh, putting a selection pressure and it is selecting very uh, specific kind of communities, which is making the rhizospheric communities very homogeneous. So when we looked into the phylum level relative abundance of these communities, we found that uh, there is a significant difference in the proteobacteria and formicules uh, relative abundance. And to further validate it, we did uh, qPCR based analysis, wherein we used uh, two sets of primer. One was uh, universal sickness RNA gene primer to estimate the bacterial count, uh, total bacterial count in rhizospheric and bulk soil samples. And then we also used uh, specific primers uh, for qPCR of uh, firmicutes. And then we we found uh, and we compared the data of. Uh, uh, this NGS uh, analysis with the qPCR analysis and what we found is that both the results are consistent and the interesting point was that there was 20% of firmicutes in the rhizosphere sample in the qPCR data and same thing is reflected in our NGS uh, 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 data also. So and, and the uh, in, in, yeah so it's, it's sir, time is over. Sir, uh, sir uh, you conclude your uh, uh, slide uh, in a while. Actually, we are running out of time and we have uh, two more sessions to conduct. Okay, so I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just, I'll just, I just, uh, I just want to discuss uh, this particular study because uh, Ladakh is another region where we're in. Uh, we, we are talking a lot about Ladakh uh, since morning, and uh, here in what we studied is that we, we try to understand the impact of elevation gradient on the rhizosphere microbiome of Artemisia brevifolia, which is uh, which is growing uh, wild in different regions in Le Ladakh re uh, area. And what we uh, did for this study is we chose. Uh, four different sites, two low altitude sites and two high altitude sites. And what we found is, uh, what we uh, want to estimate is that is there is any, uh, because in case of higher organisms, it is uh, known that when you go uh, uh, to the to, towards the higher altitudes, the diversity of species reduces. So we found almost similar in case of the bulk soil samples that when we go from low altitude to the higher altitude, the diversity, there is a significant decrease in the diversity. But when we looked into the rhizospheric uh, communities, uh, we, we found that the, these communities are consistent. May it be in uh, low altitude, may it be in high altitude, rhizospheric communities are consistent in case of all for diversity in diocese. And when we looked into the beta diversity plots, we found that uh, the bulk and rhizosphere samples cannot be uh, separated if you just look uh, uh, this uh, microbiome data by using this particular lens. So what we do, did is we just changed our filter and we applied altitude filter into our study. And what we could see now is the high altitude and low altitude samples are uh, separated in two different clusters. And when we further looked into subgrouping of these low and high altitude clusters, we found that bulk soil samples of high altitude and uh, rhizospheric soil samples of high altitude, they are different, but they are also different, they are more different from the bulk and rhizospheric samples of uh, lower altitudes. And I don't want to discuss uh, the uh, this in more details. And then we did similar kind of studies for uh, estimating the fungal communities. And uh, it, it was almost similar kind of trend we observed in case of fungi. 
And uh, then there is another study, uh, we, we uh, pose another question, uh, does factors like geography, climate, and uh, other factors, uh, they also shape uh, rhizosphere microbiome. And in this particular study, we used uh, a tea plant. Uh, and here what we did is we collected sample from 10 uh, uh, tea gardens of Darjeeling and 10 tea gardens from Assam. And we collected samples of bulk soil, rhizosphere and endophytic uh, root samples. And what we found is that uh, the diversity, uh, alpha diversity in case of bulk soil samples was consistent across the uh, locations. So there is no difference in the uh, alpha diversity in the bulk soil samples of uh, Assam and Darjeeling, but there are differences in the uh, samples uh, types like bulk soil, rhizosphere, and the endophytic. So diversity reduces when you go deeper, like from bulk soil samples, when you go to rhizospheric samples, the diversity reduces and it reduces further when you look into the endophytic uh, uh, samples. So we did the, again, uh, beta diversity plots, and uh, these plots also showed us that if you apply the location uh, filter, you'll get discrete grouping. And when you apply just the type of sample filter, you'll get again discrete grouping, but you cannot separate the, uh, uh, like the bulk soil samples are more composed here, uh, are much more similar, whereas the bulk and uh, endophytic samples, they are very scattered. So when we use both the filters and we come to know that the uh, bulk soil samples of uh, Darjeeling and the rhizosphere samples and the endophytic samples, they are quite distinct and we can group them in, into different, different clusters. So we also did the relative abundance plots and uh, this is the relative abundance plot. I don't want to discuss more. And this is another study we, wherein we, uh, look into, we, we describe the new species of rhizobium uh, uh, from the Pangong and Durbuk region. This is again on the uh, Ladakh area and uh, uh, Okay, okay, okay. That's it. <laughs> okay, let, let me let me just acknowledge uh, uh, the, my people, those who work with me. There are they, they, many students. They contributed this work, and my, many of my collaborator. They part to this work, and this is the thing that while doing research, we we cherish several moments. And while in ISPT, we used to celebrate uh, all the uh, occasions, may it be a cricket match or hockey match. And now, uh, after joining here, I am uh, associated with Foldscope movement, wherein I'm uh, introducing Foldscope to schools and uh, introducing students to the world of uh, microbes. So with that, thank you very much. And I just want to thank all the organizers, especially Dr. Sanjay and uh, Dr. Ram Kumar and Dr. Uh, Vivek Dogra for inviting me. And uh, I also want to mention uh, Pallavi. She, she, uh, especially messaged me about uh, my uh, participation into this. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, sir. We are really very sorry to interrupt you in uh, in between because we, no we don't have much time because we need to conclude uh, our two more sessions. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Now, how are you? I'm good, sir. Good I hope nice. you are also doing good, sir. Long time. Wo yes, sir. Wo mara Belgium wala nikal gaya kya hai? Wo bhi attached hai. I think yeh pe hona chahiye, sir. Uh, I think he must be here. Upender se baat karte karte rah gaya main do baar. So, nee nee, main aap logon ka session late karunga, but that's okay. I think it is worth. Kaise Upender? Nice to see you all after such a long time. Yes, and sir. And seeing you guys yes, are doing such wonderful jobs. Thank spreading you, thank good you. work outside the nation yes, and sir. also outside Himachal. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Really proud of you all. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And we are also proud the way you are leading uh, this institution, sir. Especially the work which you have initiated in the last three, four years, um, contributing more towards social societal benefits. I think that's a tremendous job, sir. And I congratulate yeah. you for that. I couldn't agree more. All our scientists. All yeah, our yeah, students, they, they, they are the backbone. Yeah, agree. And you see, today they they brought all of you together here on one platform. Yes, yes. yes. that's true, sir. Thank so you. over to the students now. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir
Uh, sir, Dr. Praveen Rai, sir, could you please uh, unshare your screen? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. I, I Thank think you. I have done. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you. Okay, next presenter is uh, Mahima Johan from uh, CSRI Beauty Palanpur itself. Uh, over to you, Mahima. Start with your uh, presentation. Thank I you so much. Um, should I uh, share uh, your presentation or you will be sharing? I should I share. Think, but the link is not available, I think. Uh, okay, no problem. I am sharing the, your presentation. No, uh, let, me share, let me share it like, uh, one second. No, no, no. I will share your presentation and uh, because there, there is technical glitches. Okay, okay let me okay. share, share the presentation. <laughs> Okay, is it visible, uh, Mahima? Yeah, it's visible. Yes, you may proceed. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, so, a very good afternoon, everybody, and a very happy Teachers Day. Uh, I'm Mahima Chauhan and I'm a PhD scholar at CSIR IHBT Palampur and under the supervision of Dr. Arun Kumar and I'm going to present my topic on the discovery of natural molecules as potential inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Thank you. Thank so you. the SARS-CoV-2 is the causal agent of the COVID-19 and these two these two terms are quite mistaken. The COVID-19 is the name of the disease and the SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. So this virus is enveloped single-stranded. This virus is enveloped single-stranded and positive sense with diverse RNA viruses. Uh, along the uh, viruses. So this uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome is uh, of 20, uh, 30 KB and uh, this 30 KB genomic includes encodes for the long non-structural protein, polyprotein that is for the proteolytically cleave to form 15-16 proteins and it also uh, encodes for 5 accessory proteins and 4 structural proteins. The structural proteins can be seen on the right side. One is a spike protein. This spike protein is responsible for the binding of this virus to the host receptor. Then the nucleocapsid, the nucleocapsid proteins are uh, involved in the regulation of this um, synthesis of RNA viral genome. And uh, the membrane protein are responsible for the, uh, are assisting in the viral entity. And the enveloped proteins are also in, uh, important, but they are not fully understood. So in the last Three, uh, in the last two decades, we have encountered three highly pathogenic viruses like uh, MERS, SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. So what makes this SARS-CoV-2 different from other pandemics? Firstly is the R0. R0 is the reproductive rate. Uh, it represents that if uh, that how many people can be transmitted infection from one infected person. The R0 value for the SARS-CoV and MERS were 1.1 and 0.69 respectively, but it is quite high. It is 2.5 for SARS-CoV-2, and that is the major reason that this pandemic is not ending. Secondly, the fatality rate. The fatality rate is the death rate. Okay, but though it's very low as compared to other viruses like SARS-CoV and MERS, it is quite lower for SARS-CoV-2. Thirdly, the binding of spike with ACE2. The binding, uh, the binding of spike with ACE2 is quite stronger in case of SARS-CoV-2 as compared to SARS-CoV-1. And from the figures, it is shown that the number of deaths reported from SARS-CoV and MERS were nearly 700 to 800, but it is 45.5 lakhs in case of SARS-CoV-2, and it is not ending. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, what are the solutions and what are the concerns? So, though the vaccines are uh, coming to play, the various vaccines are available, Moderna, Pfizer, Covishield, Covaxin, seven of them have granted use in India too. And there have been a number of repurposed drugs like Remdesivir, Fevipiravir, and Lopinavir, etc. 
but the what are the concerns these uh, these sars cov 2 virus is um, mutating at very higher rates sars cov 2 like other viruses constantly changes through mutation with new variant occurring over time and among the numerous sars cov 2 variants that have been detected only a few uh, small proportion of are of public health concerns so they are more transmissible because because they are more transmissible they uh, they cause more severe illnesses and can elude the immune response that they develop uh, following the infection and possibly from vaccination so the coronavirus transmission among vaccinated people could raise the risk of even more dangerous variants so either we get immune well or the virus stops mutating so these are the various mutants and in this this uh, b.1.617 is the popularly known delta virus delta variant of this uh, sars cov 2 which is of indian origin and has been discovered in october 2020 so the race to vaccinate the world will need to respond to the pathogen's constant evolution to evade immunity my question is what marks the end of this pandemic next slide so with this thought we should uh, opt for some alternative ways the cure for this natural hazard lies in nature itself Nat natural molecules natural compounds besides vaccines and other synthetic compounds are of great use our traditional or our centuries old traditional knowledge like ayurveda siddha yunani etc already behold enough information but lacks scientific validations natural molecules can prove effective for their better and fast recovery for those infected already and they lack si serious side effects and are easily accessible and can easily incorporated in daily life as we are using them next slide so what are the various potential drug targets sites for sars cov 2 among all the drug target sites including non structural and structural protein targets we mainly focused our work on main protease that is also called mpro this is the enzyme responsible for the proteolytic cleavage of this polyproteins that makes the polyproteins functional to uh, let the virus infect and what makes it a attractive extremely attractive drug target is the absence of its closely related homologs in human beings and its functional importance in the viral life cycle and lastly it is the most conserved target region within the whole you know as the, it is mutating it is the most conserved one next slide so uh, the methodology we followed we made a live an online library library of around 3000 plant compounds and uh, uh, mostly we included most of the himalayan botanicals which had medicinal properties we did docking and uh, mp simulation in silico studies and we did in vitro enzymatic we set up an in vitro enzymatic inhibition assay which was fluorescence based and then we also uh, did the in vivo testing the virus cell lines were used and the viral count was determined by rt pcr next slide so in the in vitro inhibition assay we set up in our library we did the heterologous expression of main protease and the develop and we developed the inhibition assay we cloned the uh, mpro gene into the vector pet 151d topo vector and we expressed this as we can see in the gel pictures this is a 33.8 kilo dalton molecular weight main protease which can be seen in the picture and we purified it with the affinity chromatography we used a substrate that which was fluorogenic and Uh, in this a fluorescent and a quencher part was there which was when treated with main protease it cleaves the it cleaves the amide bond and the fluorescence was produced which can be analyzed and uh, at the excitation and emission of 320 and 420 nanometer respectively so we tested several molecules next slide please we tested a number of molecules and um, um, among of among which uh, we found a t molecule that inhibited main protease and reduced the viral count in vivo 2 and we did a lot of uh, in depth studies about this t molecule as our uh, reputed uh, institute is uh, uh, gives very significant to this t so in this figure figure 1 we can see t molecules inhibit t molecule inhibited main protease protein of sars cov 2 well tested well the inhibition was checked uh, to different concentrations 
concentrations. We plot the drug, this drug response curve and the low nuclear regression tells the IC50, which turns out to be 21.14 micromolar. In figure two, that is the results of in vivo studied when it was tested on live virus, the impact of incubation of T molecules on the viral reduction. So it reduced the viral reduction by 60% at a concentration of 200 micromolar. And this is the work from our uh, paper, Mahima Atal 2021, which is under communication. Next slide, please. With this, we also we were curious for the uh, mechanism of inhibition. We did some in silico studies too for this compound. In this figure three, the T molecules inter are uh, this T molecule is shown to be interacted with the active side of active side residues by hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions. And in figure four, the RMSD, that is the root mean square deviation for backbone C alpha atoms for T molecule in complex with main protease is shown, which is quite low. Which lower the RMSD value, higher the stability of the compound, which shows that it is a, uh, the interaction is quite tight. In figure five, the SMD simulation results were shown and it depicts that the strong external pulling force is required to uh, unbind this complex and uh, this protein and ligand complex. So as we can see with the time, it unbounds with some extra external force. So Overall, we can say that this T molecule was uh, quite stable with main protease and did an effective work. With this, we uh, also tested several other Himalayan botanicals too. Next slide, please. In the studies of which are shown, and the low 10, uh, the percentage viral reduction was uh, shown against concentration in which we can we are I'm very glad to uh, share that we have discovered a molecule that showed 100 percent inhibition that is complete inhibition at a concentration as low as 6.25 micromoles so it is a huge thing and we are also planning to do in-depth studies for this molecule like bioavailability and uh, surface plasma resonance and uh, uh, crystallography etc so next slide please While concluding my work, I've done, I've prepared a library of 3000 natural molecules and we have done in silico studies of them. We have showed let's say 65 molecules of which we have done in vitro studies and of the top molecules we have done in vivo studies and we have also discovered this top magic molecule uh, which shows complete inhibition at 6.25 micromole concentration and the mechanism was also studied with in silico studies and this study lays a foundation not only for the development of safeguard molecules, but will also be useful in the validation of centuries old traditional knowledge like Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, and it will be a wise decision to incorporate our traditional knowledge and resources with scientific approach to tackle such pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, Mahima. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, we have a... Okay. Uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you, ma'am. So, uh, for the second session, we have judges Dr. Shashi Bhushan, Dr. Amit Chawla, Dr. Pamita Bandari, Dr. Gaurav Bhinta, and Dr. Ankit Saneja. Thank you. So, our next presentee is uh, Ashish Kumar Rajayan from Punjab University. He will be presenting Bio Battery, a new way to look upon electric power. Ashish, can you hear me? Ajeev, I think some people might have some questions. Yes, sir. am I audible? Uh, okay, Ashish. Am I audible? Yes, 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 you are audible. Uh, sir, we are running out of time, uh, so I think we, we cannot accept any questions. Okay, so... Shall I start? Okay, no, no, uh, let, me, let me open your presentation. Yeah, please. Till then, I can save the time by uh, doing the initial things. Uh, Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Par Brahma, Tasmay Shri Guru Nama. Uh, my namaste to all and happy Teachers Day to all the teachers and as well as the students uh, present over here. Uh, myself, Ashish Kumar Rajayan from Punjab University, Chandigarh, and I am pursuing M Tech in Material Science and Technology. Today I am really presenting uh, my uh, this uh, on bio battery that is a new way 
to lug upon electric power next please next slide please okay uh, ashish uh, make your presentation under 8 minutes because uh, the final yeah, bell sure. rings at 8 uh, and uh, if it exceeds then marks will be deducted okay thank you uh, am i clearly audible yes 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 you are audible uh, ah yeah, ja please next one okay uh, so the the first thing uh, when we talk about batteries came to our mind is like uh, in our day to day life we came across different gadgets and the technology which utilizes battery power for their uh, like use and uh, while using this technology there are a few questions which certainly hits nearly everyone mind that is like how long does the battery last for different gadgets like whether it is a mobile phone a laptop or something like that the second is whether these batteries are environment friendly or not so uh, coming to the few points where we can uh, just these things like uh, if we consider the mobile phones we need to charge them nearly daily in 24 hours and the pacemakers if we go into medical terms the pacemakers that are installed in the heart of a patient they need to be replaced nearly after every 10 years because of their battery life they have battery life only 10 years the third thing is the lithium while constructing a lithium ion battery uh, the lithium extraction harms the soil and also cause air contamination and in today's time uh, the battery operated toys are also there in the market and if we have uh, gone through like there are several cases of students like small children they just swallow the battery which cause very like rare serious medical problem in in severe cases death as well next please so from the uh, very past the discovery of batteries there are various types of batteries that had been uh, came into existence that is the lead acid batteries nickel metal hydride battery the nickel cadmium battery lithium ion the most common in nowadays which is powering most of our like uh, battery operated gadgets and the other one is bio battery which make itself stand out of all these next please so a bio battery is something from the name itself we can depict what the term signifies and what the battery is all about it signifies something like we are using something biological to generate electrical power so here in the bio battery is the backbone or we can say the energy producing substance is the organic compound that is glucose so something the thing that happens inside the battery is like this glucose is being broken down into electron proton and gluconolate which and these electrons are further being utilized to generate the electric current so this is something an overview how the bio battery produce the electric current next please so here uh, i have shown the construction and the workings on the right hand side of the slide you can see there is the at the top there is anode at the bottom there is the cathode situated and in between there is electrolyte and the separator so it has a general like general construction as the other batteries but the thing where it is it stands apart from others is what i'm going to explain further so the separator work is that it uh, don't allow anode and cathode to came into direct contact so what is happening inside a bio battery the uh, the diagram shown over here is the prototype of a bio battery which was uh, manufactured by cfd research association in U united states so what happens in a bio battery is uh, next slide please so from here you can see the how the reaction is going on and how electric current is being generated at the top of uh, this diagram there is a uh, you can say a glucose reservoir where we can fill a glucose rich liquid or a drink the glucose content on the anode side there the yellow one top layer anode is Uh, coated with the enzyme which has the capability of breaking down the glucose into glucano lactone as well as electron and a proton so this electron is further utilized to produce the electric current the electron is carried with the help of anode electron mediator to the cathode and this way the electric current is being produced in between the hydrogen h positive ion that is released during the breakdown of the glucose travels through this electrolyte and separator to cathode cathode is also coated with a material but of different type that is a, a different enzyme 
which has the capability of converting this H positive ion into water by taking oxygen from the atmosphere. Previous slide, please. Previous one, previous. Yeah. So uh, here the glucose is being broken at anode by the enzymes. There are like if we look into human body, there uh, blood in blood the glucose is uh, in human body the glucose is also broken down into further uh, subparts and there also electron is being released. So this is the phenomena which scientists had like adopted in uh, constructing and making this bio battery feasible and this is the way it is working. So uh, electrons flow from anode to cathode and current flows in the reverse direction as we all know that the flow of current is in the reverse direction to that of that of the electron. Next slide, please skip two slides. Next one, yeah. So the advantages of using this bio battery is something we can predict is that it is like as long as we got the uh, glucose rich liquid or a syrup with us, we can generate uh, power with it. On the right side, the second diagram, you can see that uh, this bio battery runs on multiple fuel sources. It can be uh, Gatorade, uh, the energy drink, which is very common. The second could be uh, the Coca-Cola and all other, these type of drinks. In the uh, last diagram, it is shown that uh, about the, the energy density for bio battery. Energy density is something which we can calculate by uh, multiplying the battery voltage and the capacity of a particular battery and dividing it whole with the weight of that particular battery. So the uh, bio battery is having high energy density and uh, the, uh, the energy that can be produced by a sugar can is equivalent to a cola can can be equivalent to 72 double A size batteries. So this is uh, the uh, impact of bio batteries and their efficiency we can say. Next please. So here it is uh, present applications where scientists are using these bio batteries in today time. The first uh, diagram, the first image shows that Gatorade, the energy drink is being used to uh, generate the electric current and in the meter it is also reflecting the same. The second uh, image depicts the energy produced by the bio battery is being used to charge the mobile phone. And in the third image that is very fascinating and uh, quite uh, like innovative one, scientists in California Tech University along with the collaboration with CFDRC Research Center of United States, they are implanted this green uh, like structure, you are seeing a coin sized structure that is a bio battery, which they had implanted on the back of an insect. And then uh, the bio battery, this bio battery is powered by taking the glucose from the blood of that insect and generating electric power. So in a trial run, they had uh, seen that about 12 to 15 days, Continuously, the battery is taking uh, glucose from the blood of this uh, insect and generating electric power. So this can be a very uh, like a big step in the technology in the terms of uh, using it for defense purposes by implanting some sensors or like small cameras on the back of these insects, and they can just uh, be used for inspecting purposes. Next slide, please. Ashish, Next slide. Just conclude your uh, slide. Okay. Uh, the previous one. I will be concluding with the previous slide. Next, next, uh, the next to it. Okay. So this is something the future of the bio batteries. Uh, in future, scientists are planning to design such uh, insect level, uh, like uh, inspecting systems and the. Uh, for defense and all so that they can keep an eye on uh, the uh, during the like on borders and all so that uh, generating very small level of bio batteries taking energy and uh, glucose from the body of that insect and utilizing it to produce the electrical current next please so in future the bio batteries technology is making it uh, scientists are working on making more cost effective and increasing the efficiency and also in uh, near future. So next time you see a fly or an insect around, it could be a spy insect maybe, having a sensor and maybe a camera as well. So keep an eye on it. So be aware of the technology. It is uh, moving at a very rapid rate and soon such type of uh, like prototypes may be there in the market. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. There is only one minute left for the question, if anybody has.
Hello. Hello. Uh, it was a nice presentation. Uh, could you please tell me, uh, are there any mi microorganisms which are being used to produce bio battery? Yeah, uh, the microorganisms, they are using enzymes that are the uh, maltase and oxidase. Maltase at anode and oxidase at cathode for the conversion of the relevant thing into the other one. Okay, you should read something about uh, electric bacteria as well. Okay, thank Thanks. you. I'll go through it. Thanks a lot for the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashish. So we have next Thanks presenter, uh, Dr. Anuradha from CSR ISBT. Anuradha, uh, can you listen to me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Brother, you may proceed. Thank you. Okay. okay, first of all, good afternoon to all. I'm happy to just take to all. Uh, my topic is the use of remote sensing and GIS in landscaping. These are new tools which are used for in advanced ecosystem management. Uh, first of all, what is remote sensing? Remote sensing is a science and art of using information about an object or an area through analysis of data by device or a sensor from a far away, or far away uh, site without in contact with that area. It, we can say that it is typically to take the photograph from a above area. It can be defined as any process where we, we are not in contact with the area, but we use electromagnetic energy to interact with our surface material. Geographical information system. It is an integral collection of computer software to use the view and manage information about geographical places using spatial relationship and model spatial processes. So this is a framework to gather information about a particular area and using technology to uh, present these data in form of uh, uh, images. Then is global positioning system. This is the system of radio emitting and receiving satellites used for determining the position of Earth. In this, the principle is the trilation. Trilation is involved the measuring the distance, and we can locate the distances uh, and transmit signals. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, why we use this remote sensing and GIS in landscaping? So now, the, as the GIS provision is continued to growing, and we need environmental planner landscaping with uh, with the knowledge of remote sensing and GIS, as we want to speed up our uh, planning projects in the urban uh, planning. Uh, in this, we use ground-based remote sensing, GIS, photogrammetry, satellite remote sensing, and radar in landscaping. Uh, as the, as this science is emerging. Now, many universities have introduced a postgraduate and graduate program in their universities. So, we can say this skill is very important as it is said that the wealth held by developed countries today depends on the information, not on the natural resources. So, we need to uh, build our information center more strong. Uh, in this, we use remote sensing, satellite images. Uh, Erase image softwares, RQ softwares, AutoCAD softwares, and the Google Earth to coordinate image and the mapping of the area. For the boundary of the area, we use Google Earth, GPS tools, georeferencing, and digital using ArcGIS environment. And uh, other softwares like Surfer softwares to manipulate the data and uh, to for image rectification and sample collection for image classification. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, with ge geological surveys, image satellite imaging, we take the aerial photographs and compare the changes from the last. Uh, we can compare the changes from the last few years of the land use, vegetation cover, and urban growth. So we can use theoretical knowledge in the real life application in landscaping. So. Uh, 
So we can say that uh, in remote sensing, we take data from different sources and analyze it and make the uh, images and plan for the landscape. Next slide, please. Remote sensing. Remote, in remote sensing, we analyze special land cover and vegetation type maps. We characterize electromagnetic radiation and in interaction with atmosphere, plants, and soil. We make the available satellite images and their characterization, image processing, including geometrical corrections and spectral enhancement and image processing with both supervised and unsupervised method. In GIS, we use the data. Uh, both spatial analyst and 3D analyst analysis, the rest analysis and surface analysis to concentrate on the slope and aspect derivations. With GPS, we use a distance mirroring with precising timing to determine the position and reference datum in the landscape. Next slide, please. Next slide. Previous slide. Uh, with GIS, in the both sensors, we use radius imaging, GIS, RPU, GPS, and surface softwares. For imaging, we use aerial photos, landsets, sports pan, and icons. These are the satellites used for the imaging. Uh, then we screen, digitalize, and generate contour map, generate slope, aspect analysis of 3D schemes, and spectral enhancement and for image spectral enhancement and classification. Next slide, please. Oh, these are the other software we used in the landscaping, like RPU 3.2, we use for spatial and surface analysis, Surfer for contour construction and surface analysis, AutoCAD for screen digitalization of topographical maps, and uh, finally the other photo zone. Next slide, please. This is a procedure used in a study to make the landscape plan. They, uh, they site characterize the study using topographical maps, and then topographical maps are scanned and contour lines of 20 meter intervals are made. They are digitalized using AutoCAD, and then the surface is eight software was used to generate a contour map of at the interval of 10 meter and exported as a shape file to be used with RPU. Then RPU convert the shape files to PIN from which the aspect so far derived and 3D scenes was constructed. Then erased images was used to perform image enhancement. These are the first, these are the first uh, perform uh, steps to various spectral enhancement. Then the uh, role of false color composite, which enhances the layer and we collect the data and uh, uh, resolute the emerge the images with landscape images and Econos images. Then we make the new images. Then, uh, next slide, please. So, we can say for the understanding of urban liability, we need to quality life for the human environment with using GIS and board sensing, we can uh, generate, a cent, uh, in the, uh, generate a set of urban liability, evaluating the indicators by abstract land use information. We can plan uh, urban planning with uh, access to parks and open spaces and make the managing plan for the activities. So we can say that with the new science technology and uh, GPS and GIS, we can improve the area for the quality environment for the building. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, is, is it over? Thank you. Yes, sir. yes. Okay. Now session is op open for uh, uh, discussion for two minutes. Uh, uh, Anuradha. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, could you tell please what are what should be the resolution considerations? Uh, what what should be the resolution considerations when you have to do remote sensing and GIS for landscaping?
Hello, Anuradha. Are you listening? Hello, Anuradha. Uh, I think she is. She left the meeting or is here. She is still here. Anuradha, did you hear the question of Dr. Amit Chawla? I think she she left, sir. Okay, so okay, no problem. Okay, thank you, sir. Next, we have uh, Parneet Kaur from Shudini University. She will be talking about wastewater surveillance using artificial intelligence in Himachal Pradesh. Parneet Kaur. Hello, good afternoon, sir. I am audible yeah. to you. Okay, I am sharing your slide. Yeah. You may proceed. Thank um, you. The slide is well, the slide is not visible to me. Okay. Is it is it visible now? No. Okay. Wait a minute. Is it visible yeah, now? It is visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's visible. So, hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Parneet Kaur uh, from Shulini University, and I would like to thank seminar series organized by CSI IHBT for welcoming us. So the topic for today's presentation is wastewater surveillance using artificial intelligence in Himachal Pradesh. So can you please move it to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So SARS coronavirus 2, which I think everyone knows now, it was declared as a pandemic in 2019 when it was originated in China, the Hubei province. There are both asymptomatic and symptomatic patients present, and the common symptoms include cold, fever, cough. So basically, in this, in this project, I'm telling you, I'll be explaining about the surveillance, wastewater surveillance, because according to the recent studies, the fecal samples of the patients, which contains the viral load, are present, are, are released into the open systems or the sewage systems, which ultimately drains into the open systems. And this may lead to the mixing up of the portable drinking water with the infected or the viral load present in the water and can lead to the increase in the viral load and which ultimately increases the number of patients. Himachal Pradesh was, sir, please move to the next slide. So Himachal Pradesh was selected as I'm currently studying in Shulini, which is located in Himachal. And Himachal is a hotspot or a tourist spot for most of the most of the people. The tourist, it's a tourist destination. So the probability of spreading of the virus in the wastewater or the water treatment plants would be more than anywhere else. So in the first phase, we are planning to establish the sewage surveillance in the in Himachal Pradesh. First of all, in the Solan and the Shimla districts, and later on, we'll be planning it to shifting it to other states also. Next slide. Yeah, so the main objectives of our pro project are the collection of the sewage samples from the sewage treatment plants, which includes, as I initially told, will be from Solan and Shimla districts like Sanjoli, Summerhill, Nalagar, Arki. Then we'll be detecting the COVID-19 or the SARS coronavirus 2 virus in the sewage samples. And then we'll be doing the genome sequencing for the detection of the different variants and mutants of COVID-19. And then we'll be using the internet, or IoT or Internet of Things or artificial intelligence for creating a dashboard, which will give us the or which will give us the update of the water monitoring or the water quality or the viral load present in that wastewater or the sewage treatment plants. Next slide. So the methodology which we will be doing is, first of all, the sampling on weekly basis. So samples will be collected from the sewage treatment plants mostly on weekends because the large number of people or the tourists entering in Himachal on weekend is greater as compared to the other days. So the samplings will be collect, samples will be collected and will be kept in sodium hypochlorite so that it inactivates the pathogens. And then these samples will be processed under 20, under 12 hours of the time. So after that, the RNA will be extracted using RT-PCR. Then we'll be doing the genome sequencing by creating the libraries and adapters and doing the target sequence will be analyzed. And these all will be uploaded on a dashboard. Dashboard means a software which will be working on basis of the artificial intelligence or IoT that can give us the accurate results in less span of time. 
regularly or weekly updates will be posted on these dashboards so that everyone the locals of that place or even the government can come to know about the quality and even can get the update about the water quality and monitor the place next slide so yes um, as we know artificial intelligence is the new era of the coming time so this will be a cost efficient method for keeping the data about the wastewater treatment plants so that any future outbreaks could be prevented and this will also give us the information regarding mutations and variants of various sars coronavirus to which are coming up next slide so the road map going forward so our experiment analysis our basically experimentation is divided into three phases the phase one includes the collection of samples so as initially it will be solan and shimla districts then we'll be preparing it for viral load testing then phase 2 is about rna extraction and genome sequencing so rna will be extracted and then the genome sequencing to know the variants of covid 19 and then the finally these all will be uploaded on a software or a dashboard which will be maintained initially by shulini university and then later on it will be tied up with the national and international governments and public and multi lateral agencies so that they can come to know about the check and update or they can come to know about the water quality of their region next slide so the deliverables of this project is basically the government agencies and the local peoples to monitor the viral load and quality of the water samples present in that area next slide so in conclusion we can say that water is a vital source and this pandemic is already creating a havoc so to keep our water resources up to date or to keep them safe from these viral spike proteins or the sars corona virus too we'll be this technology will help them to evaluate the disease outbreaks and location of even the hotspot areas on early basis so that's all from my side thank you thank you so much parneet it was a really a brief uh, presentation by you uh now thank you session is open for uh, uh, discussion we have uh, five minutes for discussion thank you so uh, pranit uh, it was a nice uh, presentation uh, so thank you sir uh, i would like to ask you a couple of questions uh, sure. the first the first one is relating uh, uh, to your uh, this proposal of sampling so mm -hmm. you are saying that uh, you are doing this uh, uh, sewage surveillance for whole of the state of himachal pradesh so my question yeah. is how how are you planning to represent the state uh, what 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 uh, what are your plans for your uh, sampling uh, the the second question is uh, 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 regarding uh, this uh, uh, artificial intelligence so so how you, how uh, you would be using ai for your study okay so first i'll answer your the first question the sampling plans so initially we'll be targeting only only the solan and the shimla district of himachal so the sampling plans would be like we'll be collecting there are like sewage treatment plants there are eight of them in the solan which includes the districts nalagar arki sanjoli summer hill that's in this shimla district so we'll be going and collecting the samples with using all the sops and we'll be keeping them in the sodium hypochlorite solution so that the they can inactivate the pathogens and then they'll be processed within the 12 hours of the time so this is your first question sampling plans and ai for the study the artificial intelligence the software which we have designed is like we have initially pay, not patented like it's under copyright program so it it's using the artificial intelligence to monitor we'll be uploading all the data on weekly basis and it will be sto uh, storing that data and if anyone like if you type the in like in the google we type about like solan so in solan it will give you with the many options like which type of which plant do you want to specify after clicking on that specific plant you this database will provide you about the water quality monitoring all the data like bod cod levels of that and even the sars corona virus 2 is it any possibility that it's present there or the any new kind of mutations are present so it will give you a brief monitoring about everything related to that okay thanks thank you any other question please uh, so uh, can i ask a uh, one more question yeah yes. sure sir please uh, so uh, 
could you please tell me how are you going to test for this covid-19 uh, disease in the uh, sewage samples so sewage samples will be collected and then we'll be like uh, genome sequencing or we'll be isolating the rna first and then we'll be going for the genome sequencing then the target sequence will be analyzed and then we can come to know because the genome sequence of uh, sars corona virus is already present in the pdb and the databases so we'll just be analyzing it after before isolating the rna oh sorry are after isolating aware, the rna are you aware of some new technologies for rapid rapid uh, detection yeah. of the virus yes so i am already aware there are many rapid te uh, tests even the sensor based water surveillance devices are also present which can just we can just put the sensor and they'll come will come to know what are the what are the monitoring devices or what are the water quality of that region okay you, can you name any of these techniques uh, which techniques for uh, like any uh, like uh, any modification of rt pcr technique or something like that so yeah. rapid antigen testing no, so there is right. one is used like specifically for this Maybe. sewage surveillance your voice is cracking i'm not you want the rapid antigen testing for sars corona virus too you asking me no 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 it's it's uh, my my question is about sewage sewage samples so how, yes, how exactly are you uh, there are te uh, many technologies being uh, being utilized for this sewage surveillance so i just wanted to ask you whether you know uh, you can name any of these like um i'm not getting your question like um, okay, it's, for, okay it's, uh, fine. it's fine yeah. it's fine thank you okay okay thank you thank you parneet thank you so much sir so i would like to uh, thanks our judges for the session to dr shashi bhushan sir dr amit chawla dr pramita bhandari dr gorav jinta and dr ankit saneja thank you sir okay now move for uh, uh, third session in the third, third session we have uh, our, one of our alumnus dr avdesh kepal assistant professor bihar agriculture university he will be talking about uh, plant tissue culture basic aspects and applied prospects dr avdesh kepal over to you uh sir sir can you hear me am i audible Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. I am trying to share my screen. My screen is visible. Uh, slides are not visible yet, sir. Is it visible now? No sir, not yet sir. Visible now? No sir. <laughs> yes sir, it is visible, clearly visible. Uh, sir, could you please? Uh, concise it into 10 to 12 minutes we are running out of time actually we are already two hours late with our uh, with, uh, with respect to our schedule it's okay, a time i'll try to complete okay i'll try to complete it within time yes uh, sir thank you sir. am i audible now okay uh, respected director csi rise between dr sanjay kumar other respected scientist and my teachers of rise between uh, senior rise between alumni my fellow alumni and beloved research scholars so i am very th <clears throat> very much thankful to organizers for giving me this golden opportunity to speak face to face to with my gurus on this auspicious day of teacher day so <clears throat> before uh, moving ahead with my presentation is my duty to give respect to my teachers uh, late dr ps ahuja my mentor and guide dr sanjay kumar dr anil sood dr mita vatcharya dr anil kumar singh dr sk vats madhu sharma dr ram kumar dr Dr. Singh Aslu, Dr. Adi Singh, and others who have taught me in, uh, during my IPT days. And by, I, I was there in the IPT from April 2005 to September 2012. So, <clears throat> coming to the uh, presentation on plant tissue culture, basic aspects and uh, applied prospects. Uh, this will be the layout of my presentation. We will, I will briefly go through the basic techniques of plant tissue cultures, just to uh, remind what, what what is actually uh, tissue 
culture and then about the place of work where i am working and what we are doing and uh, commercial applications of plant tissue cultures uh, with focus to uh, our university and uh, its mandate and then if time permits we'll go to the low cost tissue culture and entrepreneurs development so basics of the plant tissue cultures uh, it's a micro propagation of plantlets on artificial media under aseptic conditions and its benefits are that it's a production of planting material for seedless plants and it produces disease free planting material which are true to the type and it produces short span of time in limited space and production is independent of season uniform harvesting materials are produced and uh, that's because of uniform harvesting material it's easy to transfer uh, on same date so there is a reduction on the cost of transport so uh, basic uh, about uh, basic aspects of uh, tissue culture which we should consider when we are working in a laboratory the orientation of the laboratory that means the positions of room uh, rooms with respect to each other is very important to reduce the cost on contamination and another other aspects in nutrient media, which includes PDR and nutrient media, different components of the nutrient media, and sterilization techniques of different components and different parts of the laboratory and different things used in the laboratory that is very much important. And these aspects are uh, basically for reductions of con uh, loss caused due to contamination. So this is a basic uh, typical diagram of a layout of a tissue culture laboratory for commercial purposes, uh, which uh, uh, one should keep in mind while establishing a tissue culture laboratory. Uh, I'm not going to describe all the things, it's written over there and arrow marks are the passage through which one should move and it should be taken into mind while building a tissue culture laboratory for commercial purposes. And uh, the tissue culture laboratory are uh, distributed in three zones uh, depending upon the uh, sterility. The white zone is the most sterile zone where none of the contamination can be found. The gray zone is uh, mild zone and the black zone is where lo lots of uh, contamination can be found where washing and other things uh, are carried out. So can, coming to the component of Russian school, uh, media, different media used for uh, uh, tissue culture purpose like NIS media, MS media, Gambo, B5 and other. Different Russian media is the most important one and most, uh, mostly used media which has measured. So these are the components of the media which I have listed here for basic knowledge purpose. And uh, these are other com uh, components which are used like uh, plant growth hormones, agar, sucrose. These are the aspects of the nutrient media. For uh, so in vitro morphogenetic approaches uh, for genetic studies, plant need to be grown under control conditions. And uh, different uh, in vitro approaches includes clonal propagation, calcing, suit regeneration, cell suspension culture, superclonal differentiation, uh, in vitro mutagenesis, embryo rescues. Uh, these are the techniques, different techniques which are used in tissue culture laboratory for different purposes. So we will discuss. Uh, I will discuss in uh, brief these techniques, and which is used uh, to propagate plants on large uh, scale. And the uh, explant which is used for uh, uh, manufacturing large number of plants is the one which is naturally uh, grown, like uh, uh, vegetative apical meristems, axillary bud. These are the things which are used for uh, propagating the plants. This is calcining, suit regeneration, and somatic embryogenesis. Calcining means development of calus, for development of new plants from the calus. Uh, this is used uh, in mostly all the techniques of uh, tissue culture, which are uh, which are involved in crop improvement, uh, like uh, development of transgenic so, somatic hybridization, in vitro mutagenesis. These all techniques require suit, uh, suit regeneration. This is the most important one uh, in tissue culture. This is cell and suspension culture, where single cell or group of cells are uh, cultured uh, through different methods. Like, methods are written in the lower paragraph and this is used for uh, production of secondary metabolites on large scale or medicinal compound, medicinally important compounds. Uh, this is some of variations which is the, uh, used to create variations in plants, wild variations for de uh, development of new varieties. So in the corner uh, you can see green and violet color grafts plant, these are the results of some of variations. So in vitro metagenesis is done in the cultures, uh, culture cells uh, under in vitro conditions using gamma irradiations or chemical treatments and different uh, uh, mutation lines are developed which are further screened for the purpose which, for which they have been developed. This is embryo rescue or wide evolution. So there are many barriers, sexual barriers which are not, uh, which uh, exist in plant system uh, which lead uh, the uh, embryo not to germinate or abortion of the embryo. So the, uh, the growing of embryo on artificial media can lead, lead to the viability of that embryo. So there are many methods uh, for, from which we can uh, raise embryo from the rescue the embryo in the media. This is haplo development and devil haploidy. 
so and uh, purity of the uh, plant like uh, generating homozygous lines uh, this is very important so uh, development of haploid and uh, identification of suitable haploid lines which are useful for our, our purpose for which we have developed and that can be double uh, double uh, in the next cycle using uh, chemicals like colchicin and uh, that is exact copy of the first genomes so they are homozygous in just in the second genome otherwise uh, through conventional crop, uh, breeding program it takes about 7 to 8 years to get the homozygous line and they, they are not 100% homozygous and next up is protoplast isolation and fusion so this this, uh, this is the uh, fusion of two body cells and uh, <clears throat> where different methods are used for uh, fusion of the two uh, protoplasts of different sources and this exists uh, this can be done for uh, among the white It requires high high amount. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir. You are audible. Hello. Sir, sir do you hear me? Hello. Uh, diagrammatic uh, uh, somatic uh, the plant has to be regenerated from this. So, and different methods are there for somatic hybrids. And now, uh, uh, somatic hybrids. And again, uh, so tissue culture is also used using transgenic plants. This uh, slide is showing the generation of transgenic. Hello, sir. You are not audible. Need again, uh, yep, doing that. Not audible. Yes, sir. Now you are audible. Coming to the about, about the place of my work, uh, this is a state of Bihar in the eastern state of eastern part of India, and uh, this is the Bhagalpur where I am based. Uh, my university is lying. And coming to agroclimatic zones of Bihar, we have zone 1, zone 2, zone 3A, zone 3B. These are four agroclimatic zones uh, of Bihar. And uh, uh, Bihar, Bihar, we are having two agriculture universities. One is Dr. Rajendra Prasad Agriculture University, Pusa, Samastipur, which was established in 1970. And uh, now it has been converted to Central Agriculture University in 2016. The second university is Bihar Agriculture University. It's a state university established at Bhagalpur. And uh, the Zone 1 comes under uh, uh, Dr. R. Uh, Rajendra Prasad Agriculture University and Zone 2, 3A and 3B comes under the jurisdiction of Bihar Agriculture University. So, so this, is, uh, the, this is the historical building of uh, Bihar and these were converted into university in 2010. And these are the colleges under uh, Bihar Agriculture University. We have six different colleges and four new colleges have been established in last year. So these are the plan. These are the regional research stations. These are Krishi Vigyan Kendra. Coming to commercial aspects of plant tissue culture, it is started with the uh, work which I started at IHBT. I am just talking about the plant tissue cultures, not uh, any other research. So uh, this was the work I carried out at, uh, at IHBT. After that, I joined uh, Merino Industries, where I used to produce large number of uh, potato through this technique. Uh, so this is the potato belt of Bihar. So we, are, we have established a laboratory at Noor Sarai uh, in collaboration of, of inter, uh, international potato where we are producing large number of seed plants. So initially, uh, uh, when I joined in 2012 at Bihar Agriculture University, we had only one uh, tissue culture laboratory in whole of Bihar. But now we are having more than six and seven different uh, laboratories uh, for different purposes. So this is the glimpse of tissue culture laboratory at my, my institute. Uh, where uh, awareness uh, of tissue culture work has been done through uh, inviting various uh, high bureaucrats and administrative people. These are some leaders in, established by Nitish Kumar and all chief minister and others. They have Mang Dr. Mangala Rai, XDG, CSR have also visited my laboratory. 
So uh, about work of banana, we are doing chilia mango is a uh, is a species which are grown in uh, Hajipur area. The grand dandy is the variety which is grown in uh, this Bhagalpur, and this is the zone of Bihar where grand dandy uh, variety is grown. So we have developed uh, methods for large scale productions of uh, banana. These are the methods which we have standardized, optimized, and uh, thus we are uh, providing tail legs, about tail legs plant uh, annually to the farmers. So this is the glimpse of farmers' field. Coming to pineapple, this is the, this area of Kishanganj and Ritalin area is the uh, area where pineapple is grown in large quantity. And for this, we have developed tissue culture protocols for Q, Queen, and M2 variety, which we are uh, providing. Planting which is established at Kishanganj. This, this part. This is the uh, protocol we have optimized for large scale production. Coming to bamboo, this uh, the area which is the, uh, where balkwa, bamboos, and tulda varieties are grown. So initially we studied the protocol at Subol. Now we have established a laboratory at Supol district, and uh, where there people are working on uh, Supol. We have established this laboratory at Supol. So this is the optimized protocol for bamboo uh, micro propagation. This is the cycle of propagation bamboo. Coming to strawberry propagation, this area is popular for uh, this. This area is popular for uh, strawberry. And now we are we are trying to pull the towards the Bihar regions, and we have standardized micro propagation for uh, strawberry because uh, it, during uh, summer the strawberry plants in the field they just uh, die. So we have, we have to give them pla planting material on a large scale. So we studied the tissue culture process for micro progression of strawberry also. Uh, we have established a laboratory here at Dumbarang where we are producing uh, planting material for sugarcane. This is the protocol for sugarcane establishment. Uh, also, uh, we have two, uh, 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 two issues we have undertaken nowadays. So another aspect uh, we are trying to, uh, for Makhana. This is Makhana is Ural Therosi. This area of uh, Bihar is lowland, where water is, uh, remains there is stagnant uh, after rain. So people grow Makhana in there, but crop improvement through its flower is very difficult because the after uh, after fertilization, the seed goes down into the plant. So uh, in vitro methods can be used for uh, and this is very popular crop of Bihar. So we are, we are in process of studying the in vitro protocols, micro propagation and other protocols for Makhana also. So <clears throat> coming to this, uh, this uh, is an area called Mukama Tal. This is very low land and uh, almost six uh, months in the water. Well, after rice cultivation, what they do, they just spread, broadcast the lentil or other uh, pulses seed. Seed, But uh, after uh, high humidity, when summer approaches, the uh, pulses crop, they face a terminal heat and drought. So uh, I got a project from the Department of Biotechnology in Delhi, where we, are, we have tried to understand the molecular mechanism of uh, heat and drought tolerance mechanism, uh, where uh, we also found some genes which were up-leveled and down-regulated. And yes. coming to tissue culture part of this project, we try to understand, uh, try to uh, validate the function of the genes to tissue culture. And so these tissue culture protocols were standardized and putative transplant were, were formed. Your, uh, now this is the we are really short of time. Sir, we are running short of time. Please conclude your okay, presentation. I'll try to. Sir, it's a kind request. Okay, I'll try to finish. So, this was, a, okay, okay. this was the project from Department of Science and Technology. We are de uh, developing suitable double upload lines for terminal heat, sport plus resistance. Uh, so, this is through VT to maize cross, where, where we have produced uh, zero seed, which is false seed, and uh, with uh, embryo, which is about you. So rescue of those embryos on uh, haploid embryo on uh, uh, on artificial media is done. This is difference between the two seeds, infertile seed and uh, pseudo seed. So these are the haploid lines, and after conscientious treatment, these are the DH line which we have produced. And this is again the technique I was talking about that we get 100% homozygous line within one year, and that which uh, we get after seven to eight years in uh, conventional breeding program. So new projects we have already taken from the uh, Department of Atomic Energy and BARC. Uh, we have two projects we, have, we are getting, one is on fusarium resistance, in vitro mutagenesis in banana for fusarium resistance. This is the fusarium uh, investigated plant and for salinity tolerance in banana. So this work is under progress. So I will skip this slow code tissue culture laboratory and enterprise development because, because I don't think uh, this is important for uh, you people. This, we have, this I have produced, uh, prepared for uh, partners and entrepreneurs. Where I've talked 
about the, how to uh, minimize the cost in tissue culture uh, practices and how to uh, uh, create uh, employment or source of uh, entrepreneurs. So, coming to conclusion, tissue culture techniques can be a boon for agriculture sector for rapid development of new crop varieties and availability of disease free planting materials of seedless plants. Uh, but it requires a good setup, high level sterility, and expertise manpower. It can create employment for youth and uh, entrepreneurs also on large scale. So, uh, coming to the technology part, I acknowledge DBT New Delhi, DST New Delhi, the Department of Atomic Energy, Bhag Tombe, Government of Bihar, Administration of Bihar Agriculture University, and research scholars working under me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, uh, presentation. And uh, now we'll move to uh, towards presenters for oral presentation competition. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our judges for uh, session three. Dr. Sanjay Kumar Nyar, Dr. S.J. Iswara Reddy, Dr. Daman Prit Singh, Dr. Arun Kumar, Dr. Shiv Shankar Pandey. Uh, uh, could you please unshare your uh, presentation? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So our next presenter is uh, <coughs> Dr. Surinder Kumar from CSR ISBT Palampur. Over to you, Dr. Surinder Kumar. So very good afternoon to all and a happy teacher day. Uh, the topic of my talk is role of genome editing tools, CRISPR Cas9 in crop improvement. The work which I am going to present is carried in uh, Agriculture Research Organization, Volcanic Center, Israel. So, why is crop improvement? So, if we see in 21st century, the major challenge is to maintain a balance between the supply and demand of food for increasing world population. Different pathogens alone can cause 20 to 40 percent crop loss, and uh, if we see this loss in major crops, uh, for, for example, wheat is near to 28% in rice and maize, it's 41%. In case of potato, it's 21%. Or in case of soybean, it's 32.4%. So these, these figures or stats, they reflect that crop, this crop health management to improve the sustainability of agroecosystem is an important area. And the recent advancement in genome editing tools uh, like CRISPR-Cas9 offers several advantages in this period. So, by looking at these figures, we decided to choose a development of pathogen resistance against different pathogens using this CRISPR-Cas9 as a tool. Okay, so in this study, we developed resistance against different plant pathogens, plant pathogens including viruses and some of the fungal pathogens. When we talk about a pathogen, so most of these viral pathogens depends on host factors for their replication, for the movement of their RNA from point of inoculation to the systemic parts, and we can say also say cell to cell movement. And also, these host factors contribute to the pathogenicity of these viruses. We call them as susceptible genes. So, using the genome editing tools, we can precisely disturb these uh, interactions. And uh, that can lead to development of resistance. So, in case, in this study, we developed resistance in tomato and cucumber using the CRISPR-Cas9 tool. And in case of the, in these crops, uh, polyviruses are one of the major problems. If we see 
about proteoviruses. This potato virus Y is the type member of this genus, and uh, its genome is linear and genome is covalently bound to the VPG protein. That is called a viral genome link protein. And this VPG protein, how actually it interacts with host factor? This VPG protein interacts with the eukaryotic elongation factor. Uh, for the translation of this viral RNA into a polyprotein, into a polyprotein. This is the uh, representation of this complex, the VPG binds, and the poly A tail of this viral RNA interacts with uh, this protein. We call it poly A binding protein, and it mimics the function cell, basically the cellular mRNA translation function. So in this way. The RNA of this virus is translated in form of a polyprotein, which was later cleaved by the viral protein, the P1, XC Pro, and NIA into different functional proteins. So to, uh, to achieve the re resistance, uh, we first what we did is mine the uh, this tomato uh, genome database, and we found that there are three elongation factors. We call them E1. E2 and one is the E2. So E1 and E2 are very closely related and we targeted these two genes. And uh, this is the gene organization of these elongation factor, E1 and E2. Both, both of them are more or less similar organization. From the exon one, we designed the SCRN. These are the SCRNA which we designed and this is the palm region. And upstream of uh, this palm, uh, we selected a, we actually choose the SGRNA having restriction size. So after the transformation and editing events, we got some indels in different lines. And uh, uh, from these, we choose the line 7 for E1. And for E2, we got only one line. And luckily, both of these lines are homozygous. And also by crossing, we generate a double mutant for E1 and E2. This is the, just a representation of the restriction, the uh, resistance pattern of the uh, mutant amplicons. So these mutants were challenged with this virus, and what we we found that the E1 and the double mutant they doesn't show any virus related symptom, whereas the E2 mutant and Y type they show typical symptoms related to the virus. Then we quantify the virus, and we found that the there is presence of viral RNA, although the level of RNA is less than less as compared to the Wild type. So there was something confusing actually in these results. There is there are there is a presence of RNA, but there are no symptoms in case of E1 and that double mutant. So basically, these elongation factor have a role in translation. So we further use the core protein of this virus as a marker gene to study the translation inside host. So in this study, this is this is the the left panel is related to PVY and the uh, right panel is related to the other viruses. In case of PVY, we found that there is a less accumulation of viral uh, proteins and later on subsequent days, uh, it either goes down and it is almost undetectable on 32 and 42 DPI. And in case of uh, other viruses, we didn't see any, uh, any such resistance. So based on these results, we can say that there is a significant reduction in potato virus by protein. These results show that the, this elongation factor VDD resistance is specific to the 40 virus. And in case of tomato, E1 alone is the prime target and <laughs> mutation in this gene alone is sufficient to generate resistance. Further, we extended this approach to cook to cucumber, in case of cucumber, there is only one elongation factor. And uh, we can clearly see here in heterozygous mutants, there is development of symptom and uh, virus here we use is the cucumber vein yellow mosaic, yellow, cucumber vein yellowing virus. And in case of homozygous mutant, there are there are no symptom. And surprisingly, in this case, we didn't observe any transcript. So these plants are almost immune to the 40 viruses. And also this resistance, we found this resistance in a, in case of Jukini yellow mosaic virus also. So it's a, like a broad resistance was developed in cucumber. And further we extended this approach to the fungal pathogens. And th these are the results of uh, powdery mildew, development of uh, resistance against powdery mildew. And in this study, we targeted the MLO, uh, MLO genes. 
so the severity of the disease is significantly reduced in the mutant plants so finally i conclude my talk this crispr cas9 can be used to alter the regulation of gene expression pattern in a predetermined region and it facilitate novel insight into the functional genomics of organism this crispr cas system has brought considerable excitement of work especially among the agriculture scientists because of its simplicity precision and power or we can also say the speed by which we got results as it offer new opportunity to develop improve variety with clear cut addition of valuable traits or removal of undesirable undesirable traits thank you thank you thank you so much sir uh, now session is open uh, for discussion for 2 minutes only yeah. thank you dr surinder for such a fantastic presentation uh, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Sir. Uh, you talk about elongation factor, uh, silencing of uh, elongation factor in plants. So, what what function? Uh, I mean, this gene has in plant. Uh, it actually helps in uh, translation of uh, mRNA. Okay. So, uh, did you see any side effects? Like, uh, was there any trade off? Uh, uh when you see in terms of like resistance uh, were, were there any negative effects on the plant yeah exactly when we generate the double mutant in case of tomato there is development effect but when we mutate singly e1 and e2 mutants there were no effect only in case of double uh, double mutant we saw the effect and also these gene have redundant functionality great 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 and then uh, dr surinder how do you see like use of this technology in in case of medicinal and aromatic plants and in case of you know traits which are you know uh, which are uh, controlled by um, i mean many genes quantitating uh, i mean in case of quantitative traits Hello? in that case we need we can say multiple approaches we need mm -hmm. we cannot go directly to one gene only for example uh, uh, for the removal of some of the unwanted products we can use this but uh, if certain product is uh, like controlled by many genes then no we cannot go for this thank you i think dr shivshankar pandey has some questions dr surinder very nice presentation thank you sir Uh, you uh, well established the role of this EIF4E elongation factor in cucumber. What is the status of this factor in other crops? So, uh, like in case of Arabidopsis, we have two. One is the major one, the uh, elongation factor. We call it E1, and another one is the uh, ESO. Uh, but uh, it's uh, the prime target for forty viruses is. E1 in case of uh, rhabdosis. In case of capsicum, there is only one elongation factor. Okay. So, like uh, cucumber. So people have already targeted this elongation factor. Are you first reported this factor in disease resistance? So, uh, uh, we actually report first in cucumber, and okay. after that there are lot of there are lot of reports from other crops. Thank you, Dr. Sundar. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Now we have uh, next presenter, Neha Dogra from uh, Punjab University, Patiala. Amit. Yes, sir. The convener. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is a request for you. If not limiting, please ask the presenters to open their cameras. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. limiting then you may totally avoid it but if it is not limiting you may ask them to open up their cameras yes sir sure sir thank you sir thank you for suggestion sir okay neha dogra will be presenting temperature stress mitigation by uh brasino steroids for sustainable development of uh, brassica juncia seedling over to you neha dogra hello 
Yes, sir. Yes. Nihal Ura. Good evening to all who are present here. Happy Teachers Day to all. Today I'm having a presentation on the topic Temperature Stress Mitigation by Brasler Steroids for Sustainable Development of Brasler Gentia Seedlings under the kind guidance of Dr. Vivek Dogra and supervision of Dr. Gitika Serhande. First of all, stress. Uh, stress is the adverse condition that affect plant growth, development, and productivity. And stresses are generally of two types: biotic stress and abiotic stress. Biotic stress is negative impact of living factors, and abiotic stresses are the negative impact of non-living factors that include heat stress, cold temperature stress, heavy metals, salinity, drought, flooding, etc. And when there is any kind of stress, there occurs the generation of secondary stresses that are ionic stress, oxidative stress, and osmotic stress. And then signals are passed through signal transition pathway, and and then expression of stress responsive genes take place. If stress is too low, then there can be uh, there can be survival or acclimatization, but due to high stress, there can be cell death. So we are focusing on mainly on temperature stress because human activities are introducing uh, billion tons of carbon dioxide as well as many other heat trapping gases that affecting the climate change and uh, in very unparalleled way and that leads to uh, temperature uh, temperature uh, we can say temperature uh, amelioration or we can say decrease uh, that affects the terrestrial uh, uh, terrestrial uh, living beings but mainly plants because plants are rooted in soil as they cannot move so our study is mainly focusing on heat and as, as well as cold temperature stress uh, uh, these days, these days, uh, 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 different researchers are uh, focusing on uh, focusing on uh, uh, producing different resistant as, as well as tolerating varieties. Uh, and uh, through uh, for this, the nowadays our technique that is chemical genetic technique is uh, leading these days. And so uh, on the basis of this, we are introducing Brazilian steroids. What are Brazilian steroids? Brazilian steroids is a new class of fighter hormones that were first time isolated from Brazil and Naples by Michel et al. And they found that uh, stem elongation as well as cell division differentiation uh, significantly increased in Brasica nippers and they introduced the term Brasil. And later on, the Brasil term was, uh, Brasil name was uh, converted into Brasil steroid because Brasil steroid is a steroid, steroidal hormone. And Brasil steroids are uh, playing role uh, in pollen tube elongation, flowering, shoot elongation, vascular differentiation, etc. As Trivesen et al. in 2020 found that in May, shoot elongation was enhanced with the supplementation of BRs, as well as Volvir et al. found pollen tube elongation in Arabidopsis with the supplementation of epibrasinolite. Till date, more than 70 types of uh, uh, brasinol steroids are known, and out of them, few are very active that play a role in growth, division, in uh, cell division, elongation, differentiation, and reproductive development. Our focus is on to find out that do brasinol steroids make plant tolerant to stress? And many studies are reported, but but still, a crystal clear mechanism is still missing. As there is temperature stress, either cold or high, there occurs the production of ROS, and that leads to anti defense system uh, production. Uh, but but in uh, in very low amount that if ROS is too high due to stress, there occurs the DNA damage as well as impaired proteostasis that inhibit the growth and plants can even die. So hypothesis of these studies find out to, uh, to find out that do EBN and 28 HBL, which are most active brushless steroids, can enhance the tolerance of uh, plant to stress. And for this, we uh, selected brushless crop uh, that belongs to mustard family brassicaceum. This was experimental set setup. Seeds were washed with sodium hypochlorite and dipping oxygen, different concentration of a micromolar, a nanomolar, a picomolar of EBN and HBL, and distilled water as control was given. And sowing of seeds in factory plates in distilled water in plant growth chamber. Then seeds were shifted at fourth day after sowing to brown germinating paper by following cigar roll method. And then eighth day after sowing, temperature stress of 5 degrees cold and 35 degrees Celsius. A heat at heat stress, shock treatment of five hours was given up to three consecutive, consecutive days. And then seedlings were harvested at 10th day after sowing for morphological as well as biochemical analysis. As we can as we can see here that 
whether if there is a stress free condition or there is poor stress or there is uh, uh, there is high temperature stress there is the enhancement in the fresh way dry way shoot length and root length of the plant uh, with respect to with respect to control in both ebl and hbl supplementation next melon dialdehyde as we know when there is stress lipid for oxidation occurs and melon dialdehyde is the precursor uh, for this and uh, melon if there is um, there is a high melon dialdehyde it means there is more cell damage but in case of even hbl supplementation there is significant decrease in its content means means this uh, hormone is uh, uh, protecting our crop from the stress conditions either cold stress or heat stress same in case of chlorin as well as in our chlorophyll as well as carotenoid content whether there is stress or without stress condition the exogenous application of both even hbl significantly enhance the content of chlorophyll as well as carotenoids as i told you earlier the active of the species are there when there is any kind of stress because uh, because free radical steal uh, steal uh, uh, electron from uh, liquid and rupture the membrane that leads to different kind of damages but here our ebl and hbl hormone uh, help in uh, in uh, in uh, decreasing the content of these ros that leads to toler uh, uh, leads to tolerance of the plant to stress conditions antigen defense system of plant is very important uh, as it control it control uh, the reproductive species uh, content and same here uh, our uh, hormone ebl hpl both are enhancing the content and of salt cat ascorbate uh, as compared to uh, as compared to uh, control conditions either in a stressful condition or either in the stress that is heat or as well as cold stress same in case of vitamins vitamins are non enzymatic antioxidants and we, here we saw significant results uh, results in case of uh, these vitamin a e c content with respect to control conditions uh, without any hormone but exogenous application of these uh, ebl and hbl and down the content under cold stress as well as heat stress condition as we all know that vitamins are good for human health also conclusion we found that 24 ebl and 28 hbl augmented defense uh, enzymes that decrease mda or we can say lipid per oxidation it has also enhanced the uh, pigment content increase the biomass that accumulated proline vitamins and help in maintaining the homeostasis of cell that lead to plant tolerance with stream temperature and our uh, future um, uh, and we are focusing on the role of brs at molecular level to see how batteries of br uh, how br is playing role in different mechanisms thank you thank you thank you so much for, for discussion now so neha thank you for nice work so i have few queries about your work uh i mean these uh, the brachiosteroids yes sir i mean they have a lot of functions yes sir uh, which you call as pleiotropic effect of these hormones yes, and when you performed these studies did you see any kind of you know morphological changing in the seedlings because in the introduction you told it it helped in cell elongation cell division so did you see your seedling seedlings growing faster yes sir okay so what kind of phenotype did you see what sir sorry sir what kind of phenotype did you see when you you know uh, uh, use these brachiosteroids so what what were the phenotypic differences sir uh, uh, there was a difference in the sir uh, shoot length and uh, root length uh, increase uh, length sir significant difference sir significant differences were there yes sir okay okay i mean are you planning to do some kind of like inhibitor studies also like one good way to you know um, uh, demonstrate the function of uh, this brachiosteroids would be to use some inhibitors so there are some known inhibitors of brachiosteroid by synthesis pathway also yes sir so yes, sir. are you in future going to use uh, inhibitors inhibitors also yes sir we are uh, we are uh, we are focusing on that also sir okay which inhibitor you are going to use uh, sir uh, we are we are in, we are going to use been to more uh, over expression sir that is uh, that is active role in brachiosteroid uh, signaling sir oh that is via genetic manipulation yes, but you can use uh, you know inhibitors of brachiosteroid uh, by synthetic pathway also okay so for sure i'll study about this sir. okay and and i mean 
do these uh, Russian asteroids they do they like I mean cause, cause all kind of these good changes by themselves or do they interact with certain, certain other plant hormones? Maybe sir, they are interacting with other hormones. Maybe there is like uh, there is taking place any kind of crosstalk with other hormones, sir. So, so did you did you quantify certain other hormones also or no? Yes, sir. We, uh, we are proceeding for that, sir. Also. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next question is from uh, Daman, sir. Sir, please. Yes, Neha. It was really a good presentation. Just a generalized uh, question. Uh, you studied n number of parameters. You studied SOD, catalase, vitamin A, vitamin C, uh, likewise a lot of parameters. And uh, you said that there was a significant change in uh, the intervention that you have made. Yes, sir. So none of your parameters showed that there was a significant difference among each other. Or it was there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, uh, sir, there was, sir, uh, sir, catalase was much more uh, significantly uh, higher than and epoxy. Okay, which test you performed? Uh, sir, a sir. Uh, no, no, no. Statistical mm -hmm. test. Which statistical test you performed? Uh, sir, sir uh, one way and over, sir. Okay, it was one way and over. Okay. Okay, thank you. Neha, I have one question. Yes, sir. How these brassinoesterides are biosynthesized in the plant? What are the metabolic pathways involved for the biosynthesis of these brassinoesterides? Uh, sir, uh, <coughs> uh, sir, uh, uh, yes, sir, sir, from, uh, sir uh, early oxidation and late oxidation pathway, MVA pathway, sir. MVA pathway? Yes, sir. Okay, and what is the role of Bresnoistroyce during seedling stage? Seedling, uh, sir, uh, sir uh, seedling stage, sir, uh, as compared to the control, uh, sir, uh, as compared to control condition, uh, sir, uh, uh, hypocritical as well as radical work, um, very early uh, grown, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so uh, third presenter in this session is Dr. Govind Gurk. Thank you, Neha. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Govind Gurk will be uh, speaking on pros and cons of use of artificial intelligence in drug, in drug discovery and development. So you can start, sir. Dr. Govind Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Presentation. Yes, I am sharing your presentation. Okay. Yes, Over sir. to you, sir. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am presenting my study on the pros and cons of use of artificial intelligence in drug discovery and development. It is simply a review uh, study of the literature available on the field of artificial intelligence in drug discovery and development. Artificial intelligence, as we know, is the intelligence which is demonstrated by the machine. Uh, kindly move to the next slide. Uh, it is the use of the intel, uh, use of the computer things which can uh, do the things which uh, need human intelligence. In uh, as per Wikipedia, we define artificial intelligence uh, agents as any devices that perceives its environment and takes action that maximizes it, the chance of successfully achieving its goal. So, in simple word, we can say that it is doing anything which requires human intelligence. Artificial intelligence itself began load back in 1960s but uh, now uh, then after that machine learning came then uh, <clears throat> neural networks came deep learning came so in the machine learning uh, the thing is the, uh, a significant difference from a uh, part of artificial intelligence wherein it perceives the changes which uh, happens uh, uh, which uh, is there in the code and in the uh, deep learning there are uh, there is a layer of uh, codes or algorithm between the input and the output and uh, these learnings are of different type and uh, will not go in detail in artificial intelligence because we'll uh, focus on our topic only, which is its application in the drug discovery and development, and what are its uh, uses and what are cons of using it. Could you please move next slide? So 
drug discovery and development is a long tedious process which take around 10 to 15 years and cost too much to the companies and it has a probability as per recent researches of uh, reaching a successful uh, lead to uh, 2.01% and it cost around 10 to 15 million us dollar to produce a single drug so it is a very expensive process having multiple stages in the development like firstly we have to identify the lead then we have to um, Uh, we have to target particular thing then lead uh, generation and then optimization and then the candidate selection but uh, how artificial insemination uh, intelligence is used in this process is in the four ways first it can generate the novel drug candidates uh, uh, secondly it helps to understand the disease mechanism like how the drug and disease patho uh, how drug uh, happen uh, helps in the pathogenesis and uh, thirdly it aggregates and synthesizes the available information and fourthly it is uh, used for the repurposing of the drugs uh, for the novel candidate we have lot of directories available online and uh, through those uh, those directories applying our algorithms we can come to the molecule which is helpful for a particular condition like in the particular study uh, triple a plus unfolded enzyme was discovered uh, by using uh, cryo sparc and also ibm what's an example i have given in this presentation which is a software developed by the I, ibm which is super computer de- developed by the ibm which has uh, which beat have even beaten the human intelligence and it is uh, used uh, by them for detection of the breast cancer and also for the uh, repurposing of the drug and similarly binobilent ai is another platform which has came into uh, news recently because it it has used all the existing drugs uh, library to predict the uh, repurpose the drugs for the covid-19 pandemic so we can see like in the covid-19 pandemic it take if we need 10 to 15 year to uh, identify a particular drug it will take a lot of time but in this we can repurpose it in a, a very little time here in the next slide we see the graphical representation how it happens uh, in please move to next slide artificial intelligence as i already already said it is uh, uh, it helps in the development of qsar model and uh, admet studies quantitative structure uh, structure activity uh, relationship it helps to determine it, it was used back in 1960s but now it is uh, used for the ligand based uh, drug de- uh, selection and the all such things and it is helpful in all four stages of the drug uh, discovery and development which is direct target identification lead identification lead optimization and candidate selection here we uh, uses the heat uh, heat expansion high throughput screening as been said by the previous uh, speaker as well how <clears throat> in silico models are being used to identify a particular drug and uh, The, uh, this is not a new technology it is already in, uh, in use in quite many things uh, please to the next slide now coming to the main thing next slide please in this study will not study in detail uh, how it is applied but what are the benefits of applying it and what are the disadvantages of applying the artificial intelligence uh, artificial intelligence to the process of drug discovery and development firstly the important thing is that when we are doing a particular research we have a subjective bias to show our result to be uh, positive always it is uh, there in our uh, human nature but uh, as we know it is a computer thing artificial intelligence so it will not have a subjective bias towards particular uh, thing and the human brain has a limited capacity but uh, through artificial intelligence we can increase the capacity and uh, utilize all the available uh, information and use them and uh, do uh, define out or to chalk out a meaningful interaction out of this and uh, most importantly artificial intelligence has potential to move drug screening from bench to a vir- uh, virtual lab uh, this thing has been said a lot that it can move uh, from real a uh, lab study to a in silico study of the thing of the drug discovery and it is in the process and it significantly reduces the manpower and the experimentation cost which is uh, needed for uh, drug discovery continue to the next slide uh, there are many mobile platforms which are uh, used uh, nowadays like i said about ibm watson which uh, detect about breast cancer and software about that 
uh, it also helps to reduce the usage of the laboratory animal, which is a, a really a rising issue because of the ethics thing. And the uh, uh, Bloomberg technology, I have reported that Bloomberg technology have reported that Microsoft has developed an artificial intelligence based machine to support doctors to find particular uh, proper cure for the cancers. And uh, other thing is uh, in trend in the pharmacology is the personalized medicine uh, applying the pharmacogenomics principle so that a particular drug is for the particular person and similar concept in the Ayurveda like Ayur genomics so that uh, every individual is a unique person, unique a, a genetic code. So for that thing we need to uh, target a particular uh, drugs for a particular disease. So. In that case also because we have repositories of the genomes of the both the pathogens and the uh, uh, pathogens and of the person also so we can target according to that now uh, these are all the advantages of this now coming to uh, because it's always uh, it's in the developing stage so it has some skepticism critical skepticism in our mind so what are those things which are uh, made us critical about the artificial intelligence which I'll see in the next slide. So artificial intelligence main issue in the artificial intelligence is of the fairness. And there is a treatment error, misdiagnosis, rich, uh, research standards which has to be followed, bias against the minority classes, FDA approval, training biases, virtual clinical trials. So beginning with the fairness, how much fear a model should be because ultimately we are not using this to like it's not limited to the computer only it will be applied to the humans or the animals for particular diseases so it need to be very much fear and it do not have the uh, it have to consider all the biological aberrations which happen and who shall be responsible for any misdiagnosis made by this and what are the research standard because we know in the uh, libraries of uh, all the drugs which have all the chemical molecules we have there are particular things which we need to consider that in what standards it was made and how much uh, error and precision was there in what conditions it was there because all these minor things brings out a lot of changes in the our uh, study and it will cause a huge difference in the uh, artificial intelligence integrated drug molecule uh, could you please move to the next slide? And we are not here to move the completely to the virtu virtual clinical trials because I have already said every individual is a different identity and it will have different aberrations. Like in my uh, recent study, I, uh, I was going through research in which canagliflozin, which I was studying during my MBSC, was showing different effects in the mice of different age groups. So normally it inhibits the cardiac fibrosis, but when we studied in the mice of the growing age, it was actually causing cardiac fibrosis. So all these things has to be considered before moving to completely to the from batch to uh, these in silico models. Uh, could you move to next slide, please? Then uh, what are the drawbacks of applying it? Uh, I had already explained that minority class is always at the error because <clears throat> we should not repeat the previously done mistakes like we have to consider all things before moving to that and but uh, ethical issues and regulation is also an issue because FDA has haven't approved any such drug which has been developed because I said it, it began in 1960s but still now no drug is approved and other also had, uh, in a recent report a, a teenager had sued Apple for 1 billion claim claiming that he had been identified wrong with the face di uh, diagnosis. So who should be responsible ultimately for this? These are my genuine uh, skepticism about it. It's a very good growing field and in it is a sad thing because it's the garbage in it makes garbage out. So if the input is wrong, if it even slightly wrong. How can we say that? Uh, your, your time is up. Uh, could you conclude it uh, so that we can have one minute discussion? Okay. So in conclusion, I want to say that it is a thing. We are already living in the future. We have to use it, but we have to use it with particular things like we have to properly design our library so that the molecular studies are proper and also human interventions at every level is required for drug discovery. 
that's all i want to make i want to say that it is the most bold species, species that reside in so we always need to make development that's all i want to say thank you thank you thank you so much sir we will take questions now if uh, there is only one okay uh, dr daman please sir have a question thank you dr garg it was really a nice presentation so is again just a generalized question uh, okay. what is uh, is there a acceptance of data that is generated through ai while filing for ind in any case in any country sir fda has recently considered it but i have no idea about it regulation is a very big concern in artificial intelligence related data also in india also kerala has started to generate like uh, human uh, genomic data through ai but it is uh, under consideration till now i have no idea whether it is approved or not. okay 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 so is there any meta analysis that show how much there is a, a positivity rate of in silico data when we go for the wet lab analysis uh, particularly when we go for the drug discovery part yes sir there is lot of analysis on that thing. okay uh this study also shows that it point to the same thing that human intervention is required at every step but we can repurpose drugs based upon artificial intelligence okay thank you dr thank you thank you sir thank you so much sir uh, now i am inviting a last presenter of the session neetal sharma and her topic is dna damage repair proteins synergistically affect the cancer prognosis and resistance thank you panvi good afternoon all i welcome you all for my presentation on dna damage response protein synergistically affect the cancer prognosis and resistance the dna damage response or ddr involves a complex network of genes that are uh, responsible for uh, sensing and responding to the specific dna damage <laughs> dna damage occur in cells when there is heightened increase in rs concentration rs reactive oxygen species act as secondary messengers in cell signaling but if uh, the concentration is too high it leads to apoptosis uh uh to uh to counteract the heightened accumulation of ros in cell cells have a protective mechanism known as antioxidant response and cox cell acts as the master regulator of uh, antioxidant system and increased expression of cox cell uh, prevents apoptosis many studies have utilized inhibition of cox cell to uh, trigger apoptosis furthermore uh, the ros if their concentration is heightened uh, they prove a detrimental effect in uh, effect to biomolecules such as protein lipids and dna the single strand break repair is repaired by part 1 whereas the double strand break repairs are repaired by homologous recombination repair proteins the studies have utilized part 1 inhibition with a known drug pilaprip that is known to trigger apoptosis by endogenous accumulation of ros hr deficiency of the cancer cell has also been exploited in triggering apoptotic response in cancer cells but if the, if there is over expression of ddr machinery that leads to resistance in apoptosis in this study uh, we have identified some of the ddr hubs that are closely related to bad prognostic genes network most of the studies have utilized of increase in oxidative stress as a as a strategy to trigger apoptosis and to decline cancer progression however positive response to such therapy is limited second 
the single drug targeted therapy often leads to quick resistance and finally bad prognostic genes are difficult to target because they are very large in number these are the three strategies that uh, people have used till now to trigger apoptosis oxidative stress is defined as imbalance between the production of reactive oxygen species and the elimination by an antioxidants the limitation of oxidative stress mediated therapies are they are not bad prognostic target specific and second uh, they such therapies leads to quick resistance so uh, so what we did is we collected data we collected rna seq data from gbc data portal and performed systemic analysis the network analysis revealed modules that were positively correlated with cancer progression we and, and were also highly enriched with oxidative stress response genes then we identified a sub module of os module we called it uh, ddr module and ddr module consisted of highly packed bad prognostic gene network Uh, so we hypothesized at this point that if we target the hubs and bottleneck of this DDR module, the bad prognostic genes network will collapse in less time and with less effort. This is our bioinformat. Uh, what we got from bioinformatic analysis is the positive uh, correlated modules that were highly enriched with DNA repair pathway. we also identified hubs and bottlenecks of ddr module in lung cancer the differential gene expression analysis and the micro rna seq analysis uh, supported our findings uh, to validate our system biology analysis uh, we performed in vitro experiments in a549 lung cancer cells we we observed that exogenous rs uh, when provided lead led to dna damage and the apoptosis was increased but uh, we observed the expression pattern of ddr hubs uh, was the expression pattern of ddr response proteins was increased but it was inadequate to prevent apoptosis similarly endogenous rs uh, induction decrease increased uh, dna damage and it led to apoptosis contrarily we found that when we provide both exogenous rs that is in the form of external treatment h2o2 treatment and uh, drug induced rs accumulation uh, using olaparib the ddr inhibitor we found that the apoptosis was reduced we were uh, we were expecting synergistic uh results but we found antagonistic effects similarly when we used a second inhibitor inhibitor ddr inhibitor for the homologous recombination repair uh, inhibition we observed decrease in decline in apoptosis uh, so exogenous and endogenous rs promote apoptosis but combining these both two have an antagonistic effect rather than a synergistic effect DDR protein played a team role in network rather than individual role. To conclude, exogenous RS treatment like radiotherapy might cause resistance in drug-induced endogenous RS generation, and multiple inhibition of DDR proteins is required to prevent resistance towards amplification of oxidative stress-mediated therapies. I would like to thank all co-authors who contributed in this work. Thank you. I welcome you all for the questions, if any. Any questions? So I guess there are no questions. If anybody wants to interact on this topic, the session is open. in the session and now we will proceed further with the last session in oral presentation series in session 4 our invited speaker is dr reenu kumari an illuminus of uh, this 
Institute. She is an assistant professor at uh, Dr. Y. S. Parmar University of Horticulture and Forestry, Solar. And ma'am will be speaking on interplay between host RDRs and viral suppressor proteins, direct host defense. So ma'am, we have 10 minutes in our slots. And uh, I would request you to uh, please wrap up uh, your speech in this. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, Ma'am, you will be sharing your slides. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. Ah, uh, is my slide is visible? Uh, not yet, ma'am. Yes, it's visible now. It's visible. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, th I'm thankful every, uh, to the organizer for inviting me this, uh, to this series and I feel uh, really honored to be part of this. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, my postdoctoral work on the topic Can interplay between... in the full screen mode? Uh, yes, sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to present my uh, my postdoctoral work, which I did with Dr. Uh, Amit Gelon at uh, Agriculture Research Organization Israel. And my topic is interplay between host RDR1s and uh, viral suppressor protein directs host defense. Uh, so first of all, about the RDR function, some background that uh, uh, in plants, there are three, uh, six uh, uh, RDRs are reported and among them, RDR1, 2 and 6 are like well explored and uh, there is no much work done on the RDR3, 4, uh, 4 and 5. Uh, but there are like uh, some reports that uh, they are trying to work out uh, what is the role of uh, these other three RDRs. Uh, you know, coming to the RDR1 and 6, that RDR1 and Six, they are known to be involved like in stress responses and also in pathogen resistance. In addition to RDR6, it's also known to involve or regulate the cellular gene expressions. And uh, uh, RDR2 uh, is only known to be like mainly involved in the epigenetic regulations. Uh, so <clears throat> coming to the RDR's function in uh, in antiviral defense, uh, as we know, when the viral infection uh, uh, happens, so there is like antiviral defense against uh, that uh, infection, and uh, there are like many proteins are involved in that. And uh, RDRs are like uh, uh, like the plant defense proteins uh, which work in RNA silencing machinery, and uh, they uh, work against it. So when viruses uh, uh, enter the cells, so they uh, replicate and generate the double standard replicating forms, and these double standard replicating forms so like X, uh, they are like sensed by the plant defense systems and uh, defense is, uh, is initiated against them. And uh, so dicer like RNAs, uh, they, uh, they cut down these uh, double standard RNA and uh, like viral uh, small RNA are generated and these viral small RNA and are then, uh, are then loaded into the argonaut containing risk complexes and uh, which again lead to the production of the then aberrant RNA because they uh, work like uh, sequence similarity Manner, so that they target the cellular uh, or the viral <coughs> viral uh, RNA molecules. So they, they cut those molecules and uh, try to stop the infection. Uh, but uh, how the RDRs, uh, they help in this process because the uh, initial infection process is like for a shorter time. But these RDRs, they amplify this signal. Uh, what they do, they convert these uh, single standard RNA molecules to the double standard molecules and again amplify the signal. And this in this way, the signal is initiated and, uh, and these RDRs help to stop the process. So uh, in my work, I worked upon the cucurbit virus, which is the cucumber mosaic virus. It is the most uh, damaging viruses in case of cucurbits and also in other crops. So it is known to infect like more than 1200 species of the plants. And uh, it is a, a positive sense single standard tripartite virus. And it has like three RNAs, which encode for different proteins, which are important for its replication and capsidation movement, and also uh, suppressor of the uh, host defense system. Uh, so, 2B protein 
Uh, 2B protein in uh, cucumber mosaic virus, uh, it acts as viral suppressor protein. Uh, so in our study, we mainly worked upon this 2B protein. And uh, as uh, I worked upon the model plant cucumber, uh, so coming to the cucumber, uh, in cucumber, uh, in 2016, Livman et al., uh, it is the lab where I worked, uh, they identified a RDR1 gene family and uh, they were, uh, they, they try to work upon their uh, like they identified their role that it plays in antiviral defense and they uh, they uh, they found that uh, there is like a family of four genes in case of rdr1 in case of cucumber and it is uh, like one a one b and one c1 and one c2 one uh, c gene it has duplicated forms um and what they uh, uh, do in their the studies uh, and they they found that uh, that these uh, genes they uh, they got induced upon virus infection and uh, they specifically work against different viruses uh, so they took a number of cucurbit different viruses more than four and five viruses so for, they found that these genes got induced upon infection and uh, like the characteristics of uh, these rdr1 gene that they got also induced upon salicylic hormones salicylic acid hormones so so they also found that these genes also got induced during salicylic salicy acid treatment uh, so continuing their work uh, we uh, like focused upon the uh, to work out on the mechanism of these rdr ones um, rdr ones uh, and taking only cmb uh, in this case in the study so um, uh, first of all uh, we because we try to work uh, on the regulation of these rdr rdr one expression during cmb infection and uh, how they be it behave uh, when uh, uh, cmb virus suppressor is pre present on not. So we inoculated uh, like some uh, uh, species, uh, cucumber uh, susceptible species, and we found that when we inoculated uh, uh, without uh, viral suppressor protein, uh, the, with the mutant virus, uh, the expression of RDR ones uh, is like negligible or not uh, like induced much. Uh, and we also observed that the CMB virus, it uh, is like uh, uh, it inducing the uh, RDR1C expression like exponentially. Uh, so we thought that uh, this virus is mainly involved in the much more expression uh, or induction of uh, this RDR1C. So taking this study further, uh, we uh, try to analyze uh, these uh, uh, um, relation between the CMB2B and the RDR1C. Uh, we did this study in the protoplast system, cucumber protoplast, and we found that uh, that expression of this rdr one C is uh, uh, is only induced or induced only in the presence of viral suppressor. Other proteins were not able to uh, express it itself. So uh, we found that the CMB uh, 2B presence can itself induce this RDR1C. Um, so other proteins are uh, like uh, pres presence is not so important. It can induce itself. Uh, so uh, we conclude from this study that uh, CMB 2B presence is like a trigger for the RDR1C expression. So for uh, taking this study but we did that uh, we overexpressed uh, these rdr ones uh, 1 a 1 b and 1 c individually along with the cmb transcripts uh, in the protoplast system and then we found that uh, when we overexpress these rdr ones uh, so uh, one A, uh, when we overexpressed one A and one B, uh, so this uh, uh, virus was uh, like suppressed. Its presence was like uh, it was not present much, or its uh, replication is hampered. But uh, what we observed, like very surprisingly, that one C uh, presence, uh, uh, it, its overexpression uh, have not hampered the ex replication of the virus, but it also enhanced its expression uh, replication. Uh, so we uh, like. Uh, uh, concluded from this study that uh, at the cellular level that uh, presence of the RDR1C it's uh, like a, a, a trigger or of, uh, it's a trigger for the it enhances the replication of the viral in the initial stages. So uh, further to uh, uh, take this study that how uh, these proteins are uh, behaving or uh, either they, they, they are doing it like at a direct level or indirect level. So first we try to uh, uh, study this by direct interaction. So we took uh, the system ACE2 hybrid system and uh, by using ACE2 hybrid system, uh, we found that these proteins, uh, these RDR ones, they directly interact with the uh, viral suppressor protein to be. And uh, uh, we also dissected it at that domain level 
that uh, even uh, the <clears throat> uh, even the domains of uh, this uh, protein these proteins rdr1 they are also able to uh, interact with the uh, um, full length to be protein and, uh, and we also take another uh, uh, controls negative controls so we found that this interaction is quite specific and uh, the whole proteins were able to interact with each other uh, and uh, and then we try to uh, uh, dissect it at the level of the 2b domain level that whether uh, 2b need special reason for the interaction with the rdr1 so so we found that for the uh, the uh, interaction this interaction uh, that uh, whole 2b protein is important uh, not uh, the uh, different comp uh, like uh, short domains they cannot interact with rdr1 so complete functional 2b protein is uh, uh, need to be present there for this interaction so then uh, this interaction was further confirmed in in planta by by molecular fluorescent complementation assay and we found that they uh, interact and uh, they localized in the cytoplasmic region further to like specify its uh, localization we went uh, into the protoplast system and then we try to express these proteins together or individually also then we found that these rdr well, these rdrs uh, so these all three rdrs they actually uh, found to be like uh, look located in the punctuate spots like they are scattered uh, in the cytoplasm and uh, cmb2b is like a uh, 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 present also in the cytoplasm and also into the nucleus when but when when we localize these proteins together so these uh, proteins were uh, they like uh, changed the distribution pattern of the rdrs along with the 2b and they are found scattered throughout the cell so uh, this uh, the study also uh, like conclude that these proteins uh, they associate together and uh, they uh, are present together in the cells so uh, concluding the whole study uh, we designed the model and that uh that uh, uh, interaction between the viral suppressor protein and the host defense system it shows a like a equilibrium uh, which uh, uh, which is important also important for the plant survival uh, because uh, viral suppressor proteins uh, they uh, this model shows that viral suppressor protein directly interact with the these host proteins and try to suppress or interfere with these functions so that there is no uh, viral siRNA amplification so uh, to st stop the viral process uh, to stop its replication uh, so uh, uh, to be protein like suppress uh, these rdr function um, but uh, its presence acts as a trigger for one of the rdr1 protein so it uh, uh, enhances its uh, re replication and uh, then this protein is again translated so abundance of then this protein also uh, suppress the viral suppressor uh, or indirectly the, like the virus accumulation so there is like equilibrium between in the uh, uh, cmb to be virulence or like the cmb virulence uh, and rna silencing activity which actually direct the cucumber host uh, cucumber uh, defense systems uh, which is also reflected in case of like when we uh, infect a plant so we saw, uh, saw that initially that plant shows a very severe symptoms and then eventually uh, it uh, started uh, showing less symptom or it recovered from the uh, it started recovering from the infection so it's because of this oscillation that uh, sometimes like uh, viral host uh, system uh, viral uh, virulent system it uh, suppresses the host defense and then uh, host defense system comes out and then it suppresses the virus and uh, it uh, takes uh, like uh, uh, enhances the like plant growth so it it's like a oscillation between this system so this is all about my talk and uh, thank you everyone if any questions thank you so much ma'am and thank you for adhering to the timeline you are not having any questions thank you ma'am thank you so much also i would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to our judges of the session 3 dr sanjeev nyal dr reddy dr damanpreet singh dr arun kumar and dr shiv shankar pandey with this we are proceeding with the last session and uh, i welcome the judges of the session dr rakesh rana dr mahesh gupta dr amitabh acharya dr vikram patyal and dr sarita devi so we will proceed with the
Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So our next presenter is uh, Anil Kumar Rana uh, from CSI ISBT, Palampur, and he is also my senior in uh, our lab. So he will be presenting old is gold lithium uh, therapy improves menopause associated memory impairment and uh, depressive behavior in rat model. After that, uh, we have only three presenters left: Ishita Chananna, uh, Abhisha Roy, and Sagar Gupta. Uh, I request three presenters be prepared for your presentations. Okay. Uh, I request uh, every audience uh, to, to stay connected with us because we have uh, a video session after the uh, session four uh, and and a special program and then uh, we have uh, concluding remarks and results for uh, photography, videography, uh, e-posters and oral presentations. Uh, so be with us uh, for the same. Thank you. Anil Kumar Rana. Over to you, Anil Kumar. So let's start. Good evening to everyone. I am Anil Kumar Rana from CSI HVT Palampur. Today I am going to present a part of my PhD that entitled me, uh, Old is the Gold, a lithium treatment helps to improve the memory impairment, menopause associated memory impairment and depressive behavior in the model. So as we know, every woman in the world has to show a transition in their life from reproductive to non-reproductive stage by the process known as a menopause, which is characterized by the permanent cessation of a mentally bleeding. Because of that, there is a significant decline in sexual hormones that ultimately disrupt the endo neuroendocrine event like impairment in the memory along with a depression-like behavior. To overcome such kind of a disruption, hormone replacement therapy is in a practice but that is gifted with a lot of side effects like a uterine atrophy, breast cancer along with a neurodegenerative event. So we are looking for a molecule that should replace the hormone replacement therapy with a minimum side effect. So through literature search, we find lithium is the gold standard drug used in a psychiatric medicine to treat a neuro neurodegenerative disorder. And last year, we also uh, find uh, there is a differential expression of a glycogen synthetase kinase 3 beta. That is the direct target of a lithium is involved in the development of neurobehavior impairment in middle-aged overoptimized rat. So to keep this thing in mind, we uh, design hypothesis that lithium treatment may be helpful after a critical window period to uh, treat the menopause associated neurobehavior impairment. To uh, fulfill our uh, requirement uh, or, or design, so first we are working on a 10 month old animal. Uh, we perform a surgery and then kept the animal for a 90 days for a development of a post menopause behavior alteration. After that, animal will be divided into the three group normal, disease, and treatment. And uh, normal and disease, treat, uh, disease group are kept on a normal chow. Via the treatment group will kept on a lithium diet for further two months. Subsequently, we perform a different battery of a behavior analysis and at the end we sacrifice the animal uh, and isolated the two regions of the brain, like a hippocampus as well as the somatocentric cortical region that majorly engage in the cognitive process of the brain. So uh, these are the surgical procedures that uh, we did to develop a model. First, we open the abdomen and isolate the uterine bone and excise the ovary and again uh, suture the animal. And again, after the completion of a treatment, we perform a different patterns of the behavior. So first, we study the uh, effect of lithium on a memory. So here, first, we analyze the spatial memory. This memory is basically dealing with the our, uh, how much we know about of the space. So here we find there was there was no alteration in the learning process of the learning process with us subsequently while that learning is not converted into the memory. This test was done with the help of a Morse water mail that is indicated by the less time spent in the target quadrant. However, lithium treatment helps to rescue the same. Further, the spatial memory we go for a recognition memory analysis. This memory deals with our the past events. And yet we also find there is a significant decrease in the recognition memory uh, while the lithium treatment helps to overcome from the same. Rather than the, lithium, rather than the cognition, the uh, females are more susceptible for a depression-like behavior. And same result we also observed in our study by using a force swimming test that indicated the more time spent by a disease control group as compared to the treatment group. So from where we came to know lithium therapy after critical window period is helpful to maintain the normal neurobehavior uh, cascades in the brain. 
After that, we go for the analysis of uh, neuroinflammatory events because we know numerous of the neuroinflammatory that is responsible for the degeneration of a neurodegenerative events. And here we find the expression of pro-inflammatory marker significantly upregulated in both the region of the brain while the lithium therapy is helpful reducing the same. And uh, the next question is that uh, which cell is responsible for the inflammation inside the brain? As we know, our brain is uh, devoid of a lot of uh, 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 glial cells and majorly astrocytes are higher in number than the neuron and rectal crisis is reported in the numerous of neurodegenerative events. It's a process in which rather than protecting our brain cell, it starts engulfing our own uh, neurons. So here we also find a significant increase in the genomic marker of active astrogliosis like a GFAP and PPR gamma that significantly reduce following the lithium treatment. Further to confirm the uh, reactive astrogliosis, we go for the uh, histopathological analysis. Here we find there was, here we use a GFAP AF marker of upper glial cells inside the brain, and glial cells seem to be more aggressive in the nature in a disease control group when compared with the treat treatment group. That is characterized by in, uh, elongation of their uh, astrocytic process length along with. Uh, their known numbers are also seems to be upregulated, but that will be suppressed following the lithium treatment in both the region of the brain. So we can conclude here that the lithium treatment suppresses the neuroinflammation in the brain by maintaining the normal uh, anatomy of our astrocytes. So uh, in our previous uh, behavior parameters, we understand that there was a, I mean, hurdle in the conversion of learning into the memory because conversion of learning into memory is a very essential cascade and that all depend upon the how the neurons are interacted with each other. So here we uh, study the neuroanatomy uh, by using the golgi cox analysis method. So but here we find there is significant degeneration inside the de disease uh, control group. However, the lithium treatment uh, sustained the normal anatomy of the dendrites over the neuron. That is characterized by significant increase in the total dendrite length as well as the uh, as well as uh, not in the neuron. For the, for the communication between the two neurons, it is very essential the more the complex nature of the uh, two neurons. So here we find the neuronal arborization seems to be significantly reduced in case of a disease group in both uh, the dendritic portion of the brain that is the apical as well as basal dendritic the pyramidal neuron further uh, treatment is helpful for the sustaination but the same result will be observed in case of uh, hippocampus so as from childhood we uh, came to know uh, synapses are very much essential for the uh, communication between the two neurons and here we find there is a significant decrease in the synapse number that's why they are altering the conversion of learning into the memory however the lithium treatment has to sustain the same level and lastly we uh, find the expression uh, what is the impact of lithium here we find the lithium treatment helps to upregulate the expression of a gsk beta that ultimately enhances the level of a beta catalyst in the brain that ultimately participated in the synaptic plasticity so lithium treatment helps to uh, normalize the beta catenin level by inhibiting the GSK3 beta in both the region of the brain. So even if the, both the region of the brain are uh, working uh, differentially because they have to deal with the different uh, 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 memory formations. And lastly, I concluded my result of what happened after the estrogen deprivation. There is a significant alteration in the neuronal impairment inside the brain by structural impairment, alteration in normal signaling as well as enhanced the rectal gliosis that actually uh, uh, overcome by the lithium treatment. So lithium treatment is a helpful therapy rather than, uh, in the place of uh, hormone displacement therapy. So at the end, I would uh, uh, acknowledge to the director CSIR HBT, Senna Series Committee, coordinator of ACSIR, my uh, supervisor, Dr. Damanpreet, and uh, my lab mates and DST for providing me the Inspire Partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, session is open for uh, discussion for four minutes, three, th uh, three and a half minutes, sorry. Anil, thank you for your presentation. This is uh, Rakesh Kumar. And uh, can you tell us what are these uh, reactive astroglysis markers? Uh, reactive astroglysis and, uh, and how this uh, lithium uh, affect these uh, uh, markers? Okay, uh, reactive astrogliosis is a process uh, in which astrocyte that is already present in our brain that start engulfing or damaging our neuron. And lithium is the first time reported there suppressing the synthesis of a GFAP, is the marker of our uh, reactive astrocytes. 
So lithium will be go and down regulate the expression of our uh, GFAP. As a result, aggressive behavior of astrocytes change into the normal behavior and suppression of the neuroinflammatory events. So you are the first who have, uh, or your lab have first reported this lithium effect on these markers, or is there any uh, other uh, lab they have report already reported? There is a current report in 2020. They reported on another aspect, like uh, in an Alzheimer's disease. But uh, over on overtomization, we are the first time reported this uh, how the lithium affect the astrogliosis process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hello, Anil. Uh, this is Dr. Vikram. So nice presentation. So can you tell me what are the limitation with the uh, this lithium therapy to uh, adopt it as a first line of uh, treatment for depression? Okay. Uh, so any, lithium, any limitation or any side effect associated yeah. with this? Okay. So lithium treatment, first of all, uh, we will give only a woman who are after a menopause because uh, it shouldn't be given to the female that are uh, under the process of uh, uh, transition because it will be interact with the estrogen and similarly we find in our lab uh, if there is if we started the therapy to the estrogen rich female so it will be create a toxicity so there is a limitation that we have to start it in only those women that are actually in the uh, menopause and uh, helpful after the critical window period that is not done by the estrogen so far Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think if you have any other question. No. Uh, Thank you. Actually, I have one question, sir. Uh, since lithium is uh, known to uh, activate NMD receptor, okay. and it has been uh, already uh, reported that lithium is also uh, used in uh, many of uh, epileptic models. Okay in uh, pre clinical right. study. So, uh, which hypothesis you have followed uh, that it is uh, altering the levels of all the reactive oxygen species and all the gene expression associated with it? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, what happened actually in case of uh, uh, estrogen deficient uh, rodent, if you're giving this to the uh, those animal, uh, suppose like uh, in case of epilepsy, there is a high excitotoxicity, okay, that will change the uh, anatomy of your spine, okay. But in our case, what happened after the menopause, because as I said, uh, the lithium is uh, male and female uh, brain are totally different from each other because of the presence of the estrogen. Okay, so uh, they depend on to which gender we are providing to the lithium therapy first of all, and it will work by a multiple of the cascade targeting, like a GSK is the major target, and yeah, NMD is separate in case of another uh, event, it will uh, uh, decrease change the shape of NMD receptor, while in an estrogen deficient rat, or maybe in a, a female, it will maintain the proper structure of our uh, spines, that's why it will be helpful to maintain, overcome from the depression, and yes, it will be definitely overcome from the stress, antioxidant, antioxidant activity, and anti-inflammatory activity is already reported uh, in case. But it is a very essential to depend upon the gender to which gender you are providing the drug. It's a very critical. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Chanel. Uh, I have. Uh, we have. I think one more question from Dr. Daman. Is there any questions, sir? Ah yes, Anil. It was a good presentation. Continuing the question of Dr. Patyal. He asked that uh, what, what will be the adverse event in case we give uh, lithium as it is. And you said that if we give lithium to a, uh, to a female where the estrogen level is normal, it results in toxic effects. But what, yes. what, will, effect, what will be the effect of lithium if we give that uh, drug to a male, either patient or a male animal, because it is used as a first-line therapy for mania treatment also? Okay, so uh, as you know, the estrogen level in a male is not that much up to level, first of all, and uh, uh, men have a normalized level of the estrogen, and that's why we can give us this lithium therapy to the male in any stages. Okay, but in female that are more enriched with the estrogen uh, before the menopause, that's why it's a toxic there. But not good so far, how it will be act as a toxic uh, during the time of estrogen. Okay, thank you, thank you, Anil. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Invite our next presenter. Uh, she is from CSIR HVT only, Abhisha Roy, and her topic is seaweed extract derived formulations enhance antibacterial resistance in Arabidopsis thaliana. 
Yes, you, you may proceed, Abhishek. Uh, Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I am Abhishek Roy, and I recently joined uh, Dr. Ruthin Halan's lab as an industry sponsored PhD student. And today, for the uh, student seminar series 2021, I will be talking to you about my work on the identification and characterization of different signaling pathways primed by seaweed extracts. So India as a country, which is heavily dependent on agriculture for its livelihood, has a common evil to face every year, which is a huge loss of crops. In our report, as new as of the of 2nd September 2021, it was reported by a joint study of industry body Asogram and Yes Bank that crops were 50,000 crores are lost a year due to pests and diseases. One of the very common combat, combat strategies is the use of pesticides. But then we also know about the various harmful impacts of pesticides that include the health impacts, the fact that it drains economies, it decreases the biodiversity and has long-term effects on water, soil and air. And these are some of the excerpts, excerpts that give us an idea of its long-term effects. Now, this is where we have to look for more organic alternatives. This is where seaweed comes into play. Seaweed is a common name for countless species of marine plants and algae that grow in the ocean as well as in rivers, lakes and other water bodies and has a lot of useful features like it is chock full of vitamins, minerals, fiber and can be tasty. For example, sushi in Japan is mainly based on seaweed. Second, it has a lot of anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial agents. Third, it possesses powerful cancer fighting agents. And fourth, in agriculture, the diluted seaweed extracts have already been shown to, uh, seen to promote growth, prevent diseases and improve the quality. This is where C6 Energy comes into play. This is a startup that was started in 2012 by four IIT Madras alumni and it is based in Bangalore. And the company's main focus is to derive ethanol coal from the red seaweed, Cassolitis alveolaris, that can replace non-renewable energy sources which are derived from fossil fuels. Uh, in their uh, extraction process, they uh, produce two other formulations from the differential bioconversion of the red CIG from its biomass, namely LBD3 and LBD12. And on a hunch, when they treated it on the crop plants, they found that there were reduced disease severity in these plants at the field optimized value or uh, the dosages of 4 ml per liter and 1 ml per liter. Now, this is where we come in. The formulations work, we know, but how? So, we use the the model plant pathogen system of Arabidopsis thaliana and Pseudomonas syringi to answer the following question. First, do these formulations have a direct effect on the pathogen growth like certain herbicides and insecticides do? Second, do these formulations prime the defenses in the plant that is in absolute absence of a pathogen? If we are treating these formulations, are they getting ready for the upcoming pathogen challenge? Are they getting primed? Third, do these formulations possess a curative effect on the plant that is once there is pathogen challenge? If we treat these formulations, will they be able to reduce the severity? And fourth, if all of this is happening, then which is the defense pathway these formulations are impinging on to show the above mentioned effects? First, when we incorporated these formulations in uh, King's Bee Media, which is a pseudomonas syringe growth media, we found that at any concentrations of these formulations used, we had these formulations had no direct effect on the pseudomonas syringe's growth kinetics. The figure in the my slide is of representative of 4 ml per liter of LBD3 and 1 ml per liter of LBD12. Post this, we also optimize these dosages in the lab because obviously crop plants and lab plants will have different con uh, different conditions and they make uh, these formulations may behave differently. But we found out that it uh, works best at 4 ml per liter for LBD3 and 1 ml for LBD12. I haven't mentioned that data because of time constraint. Second was the question that we wanted to answer. We found out that when we treat the Arabidopsis plants, 
24 and 48 hours prior to the, the them getting infected with arabidopsis uh, syringe when we, uh, we we saw reduced bacterial accumulation on the third day post infection and to further validate we did salicylic acid estimations on them so that is only on plants which has been treated with these formulations and without any pathogen challenge we see that there is significant upregulation of salicylic acid levels in these plants be it free salicylic acid or uh, conjugated salicylic acid. Similarly, we also did transcriptomic validation where PR1, FRT1, and COX2, which are very common PKI markers, they showed significant upregulation when compared to the untreated plants, both at both when the plants were treated for 24 hour post 24 hour and 48 hour post treatment. The third question we wanted to answer was in the incidence of an infection, whether these products are working. We saw that again. Uh, after 24 hours after being infiltrated with arabidopsis syringe, when these products are being treated with LBD3 and 12, there is significant back, uh, reduced bacterial accumulation. Also, we know that in an infected plant, in an uh, infected plant, uh, untreated plant also, in a normal plant, if they are uh, giving a pathogen challenge, there will be upregulation of both salicylic acid and also PR1 gene. But in the treated plants, Comparatively, the upregulation, as we can see, is more as compared to the untreated plants, which means that they are giving better defense. Second, as we are uh, uh, 48 hours post spray, when there is still infection, the maintenance of defense in the treated plants is more. As we can see, that the salicylic acid level upregulations are being maintained in whether there is a fall off in the untreated plants. Following this, we also try to see. If uh, since uh, we can see an impingement of salicylic acid mediated pathway, we use three salicylic acid pathway mutants EDS 1 2, SIG 2 1, and NPR 1 1. What we found that as compared to a wild type plant, the treatment for this uh, study, we used LBD 12 only at 1 ml per liter, and we found that the formulations were not able to retrieve the mutant deficiencies, neither in salicylic acid levels. Neither in the PR1 gene, which means that these formulations are probably impinging on the salicylic acid level upstream of these modulators, that is EDS1-2, SIG2-1, and NPR1-1. Finally, we also uh, did an HPLC quantification of some major phytoplant phytohormones, where we found significant upregulation for salicylic acid, jasmonic acid, arsacic acid, kinetin translating with the cytokinin, and indolacetic acid. And uh, so, to conclude my study, which I have found out still now, is that. First, these formulations enhance resistance in aerobidopsis by impinging on the SA mediated pathway. Second, they also enhance the entire phytohormon profile in the treated plant. My future directions for this work include elucidation of further antibacterial properties of the LBD uh, formulations by using more phytohormon mutants so that we can see if they're also impinging on other uh, phytohormon pathways. Second, in the field, there has already been seen some antiviral effects of these products. Now, we want to elucidate the molecular mechanism behind this effect as well. Third, there are some uh, initial data that these formulations are helping enhance uh, uh, phosphate uptake in the treated plants, and so we want to explore on that as well. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Avisha. Uh, session is open for uh, questions. For three minutes. <laughs> Uh, Avisha, uh, nice presentation. So uh, my question is that uh, what are the various uh, uh, constituents or chemical constituents uh, in your formulation which are responsible for this activity? Sir, uh, the formulations when they were presented to us, they were just presented as uh, two bottles because they had already been commercialized. And what we know that one of the major active comp components is that OG, oligogalactosaccharide is there. Because they have that their amount is there. Apart from that, the they uh, there is no active components as such which has been characterized. Only the effects has are being studied via us, the molecular mechanism we have to Okay, so you have uh, you have not done the characterization of chemical. No, uh, the characterization of the compounds has not been done. The only the molecular mechanism behind the effects are being studied. Right. Okay. <laughs> Any other question, please? Uh, yes, Avisha. Uh, uh, this side, Mahesh Gupta. Uh, your good presentation today. But uh, I have a few questions uh, regarding seaweed, actually. Uh, first is that, uh, what is the source of this seaweed? You have developed two formulations, LBD3, LBD12. And you have uh, chosen a particular species also. Yeah, am I correct? Yes, sir. 
so what is the source of this seaweed uh, sir, uh, uh, when these formulations were presented to us as i said they were just presented as two, uh, two formulations in one but c6 energy is actually more concentrated on doing ocean farming that is what they are doing they are trying to uh, standardize so uh, they are trying to ocean farm but they are calculating to produce ethanol fuel from them because according to them in uh, uh, farming of these seaweeds on land and all is becoming difficult so they are they have shifted to the ocean where they are trying to find up produce ethanol Okay. So, another, another, okay, I understand. One point is more. If you're telling this is a rich in oligoglycosides, uh, whatever the compound which is responsible for this activity. So, have you uh, study for extraction of this compound by different methods, or maybe you, uh, you have not mentioned the extraction process of that? How? Uh, uh, what is the difference between LBD three and LBD twelve? I think it is a different in concentration, maybe something like that. Yeah. LBD12 belongs to a more uh, purified fractionation, and the bioconversion yeah. process has been actually patented. But uh, yeah. as I said, we have been only given limited knowledge to just find out the molecular mechanism actually. Okay. So we are not we were not a part of the bioconversion or the extraction process. Okay. All we know is okay. LBD12. But, but this is very important. But this is very important for uh, uh, quality of product or maybe activity, antibacterial activity of this uh, uh, formulation actually. And another one, one uh, last question for uh, I also want to ask you. Uh, this LBD three and LBD twelve. Why only two fractions? Uh, is there any particular reason? uh sir these are two fractions that are being tested by us in terms of molecular mechanism but there are other fractions that are being produ uh, produced actually so okay, they are okay. also, you, you they for are initial phase was testing only these two fractions it is yes. like that so, uh, other okay. purified better acting uh, fractions are in the pipeline and uh, it is also in the plan to use them and see if they are acting better than lbd3 and 12 But you have only untreated plants. You have compared your data with untreated plants. No, any control? Uh, uh, you have used any any other sample which have antibacterial activity on the same infection. So, have you any compare any market product with this your product whatever developed actually? Because your data is only with untreated plant. Uh, actually, sir, uh, not with other market product, but we uh, did try it on. Uh, other agricultural plants which already have a high they are uh, highly as an ipt1-1 plant for albidopsis they already have a constitutively high level of defects so the initial testing that we started doing was on these plants that they already have high defects and if we are treating these formulations on the already high constitutive level of uh, uh, ipt1-1 are they being able to increase the defects level and we saw yes and that is after this we proceeded with the wild type Thank you, thank you, Gab, and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Abisha. Thank you, Abisha. So our next presenter is already with us. I'm inviting Sagar Gupta from CSIR IHBT Palampur. His topic is RBP Spot Deep Learning on Appropriate Contextual Information for RBP Binding Sites Discovery. So we are connecting. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my topic is on RBP for deep learning on appropriate contextual information for RBP binding site discovery. First of all, as the title says, as title says, RBP spot the spot where the RBP is the RNA binding proteins bind to the RNA. As we go further in detail, first we know why the RBP is. Uh, as we know, post-transcriptional gene regulation is essential for the uh, coordinating metabolism, cellular uh, cellular transportation of RNAs, stability and degra degradation of several type of RNAs. Mechanistically, these events to be happened with the help of on, uh, with the help of these ribonucleic protein with the complex uh, with the complex of RBPs. to go further in detail the functions of rbp mainly are in rna editing rna splicing uh, rna polyhydration etc etc some of the rbps are ada nova 1 aifm 1 these rbps are uh, 
the past two decades these rvp are a hot topic for research as we go further in detail first the R, the first rvp which is in which is created is hell and hell line and one bound uh, rna using p 32 ep type tag protein after the introduction of high throughput sequencing that is ngs there are several methods which are incorporated which like that uh, clip seq data i rip seq i clip etc etc where is the the breakthrough the research in in for uh, predicting these bar ne binding uh, the binding sites of this rbp on rna is deep bind which has a deep leading uh, deep neural network uh, network uh, that is cnns uh, convolutional neural nets to find out the exact position of this rna binding process hence it also says that this its algorithm is not sufficient uh, with comparison to transfer function that is uh, uh, institute discover uh, 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 therefore, several uh, many of the tools which are uh, in the uh, in the research right now are rely on fixed motive, which is a very uh, fixed motive. Fail to which just fail to discover uh, more diversity and uh, co uh, coherency, etc. To uh, <coughs> to overcome this problem, we design our own tool to overcome this problem to find out the binding sites of these RBPs. We have developed three. We have de uh, bifurcated our object, the study into three uh, objectives. First, we develop a more novel motif for this identity uh, uh, algorithm for this RNA binding proteins. Uh, then we use this motif as a robust uh, anchor to develop a data structure construction for models. And then later on in the objective three, we will use this positive and negative data set uh, through to model. our models to rbp models uh, uh, using silo and deep learning approach the detail pipeline ensures that because we use the six mer unique uh, mode uh, six mers unique nucleotides to as a simple singletary matrix position uh, as well as position of matrix in the clip seq data with 70% uh, identical approach to find out the uh, find out the prime motifs which are uh, in, uh, coming in this data in a very large quantity then using this prime motif as an anchor to extract this 75 uh, uh, on the uh, upstream and as well as downstream as the planting region to construct a positive data set for negative data set we use this strategy where the uh, rbp uh, where the motif are present but they are not experimentally validated so we consider that is as a negative data set further we calculated 16 nucleotide density profile heptamer density as well as the uh, uh, pentamer density to model our deep learning and cellular learning approaches first we uh, pass on this uh, uh, feature file to the input layer which is uh, which is then passed through two different hidden layers first is first is power, first is powered by relu and then and the next is il last uh, the final output layer uh, layer is sigmoid to uh, for the binary classification if the binding site is present then s if not then no Results for the motif. We we can say that the uh, um, uh, the heart of our big spot is motif because without this motif, this uh, this the uh, the robust data set we are talking here is not to be going any further. With with this motif, we anchor our data uh, to flank the regions and then divide it to uh, further negative set data set. Our motif. Uh, i am motive so similarity with the experimentally validated one and the p value for this one is provided here the conceptual information i has i'm talking about is from the start one the in this the left figure we can show that the heptamer and pentamer density is not in the motif region but in the upstream and downstream of the of the sequence too whereas the cg which cg is density of the sequence where is in the f score values where we can see that the cg reach as well as some of the most influential features are listed here the the, the implementation of deep neural network uh, powered our uh, powered our tool to the best of its uh, uh, best of its potentiality here we can say that the cellular learning based exhibits based cellular learning and the uh, with the help of impl uh, implementation of deep learning we can see that the best of its Further, we benchmark our tool with three different data set. The A, A represent the data set constructed. Our data set B for B R B P data set. The tool has been constructed, and the third one is graph plot. We can see that in all of the uh, uh, heat maps, we can see the accuracy F1 and C C in all the categories are the hence best for the R B P spot, followed by D P and then I D. 
We further elaborate our study into uh, robust data set on, on the basis of our data set. We further divided our study into two parts. First, we uh, first we take our data set, divide it into where the RBP spot train and test, then graph plot train and test that, uh, and then uh, RBP spot train and graph plot test and graph plot train and RBP spot test. Here in this uh, plot, we can also see that the RBP spot consistently outperforms the other tool that is Deep Leap and IDE. We show that the our feature generation technique is better, and the two motive and data set are consistently performing uh, consistently performing well than other the two tools. We can conclude that the RBP spot is a bench uh, can identify the binding site of existing RBPs in human system as well as it becomes one of the few tools where 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 users can put their own data, raise their own models for uh, any species and any RBP. The this approach may clip down the down, uh, down the flow cost of clips experiments are between the rock discovery it will help in abnation model discovery without need clips uh, experiment thank you we would like to acknowledge the gratitude to the uh, department of biotechnology india for trusting our vision and funding this project and all for beginning research and mm -hmm. also i would like to acknowledge my guru dr ravi shankar yes, thank you so much sir thank you so much mr sagar gupta uh, session is open for uh, discussion and question answer for three minutes. Yes, anyone has a question? Yeah, thank you, Sagar. Uh, this was a nice presentation. Just would like to know, have you compared your data set with the already available data set? Yes, sir. In the slide seven, we compared it with three, uh, three, with three different data set. First one is our data set. Then with comparison to two different data sets that is provided by GraphPro and other one is the BRBP data set. Okay, and how significant is your uh, this RBP spot? Uh, it it will uh, it outperforms all the different all the uh, five tools by a significant margin as we uh, as we can uh, earlier show in that heat map plot. Okay, thank you. And the other question is like, uh, how do you define this uh, this RNA? What is the role of this uh, RNA binding proteins? Exactly so what. These RNA binding proteins uh, regulates a vast variety, uh, regulates uh, all the types of RNA. Basically, uh, if we can say in simple language that it, it's perform uh, its role in RNA splicing. The RBP here responsible is uh, uh, the RBP here responsible is ADR. Uh, it is it's involved in a micro RNA biogenesis. The RBP responsible here for dosa dicer and PASA and dosa dicer PASA. And these three RBP where is the uh, Transfer of these microRNA to the host uh, to the target is performed by the arbitrate uh, group family. Okay. And uh, so poly uh, polyanalysis was, was, was carried out by the CPSF family. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other question, please? Okay, I think we don't have any other question. Thank you, Mr. Sagar Gupta. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, before moving to the last presenter of uh, uh, session four, uh, I would like to thank all these, uh, all the judges, all the participants, all the scholars, our alumni uh, who have been patiently uh, been with us uh, since the morning and since the beginning of this event. Uh, I, I want uh, to tell you these guys that uh, just wait for uh, 10 to 15 minutes. We uh, we are just compiling the results of uh, uh, photography, videography, e-poster, swear and oral presentation after the uh, last presenter. And we will be sharing the first, second, third of uh, photography competition, videography and e-poster. So next session will, uh, will be interesting for everyone. So I am inviting Ishita Chanana from Shurin University to present her uh, PPT on uh, a study of microalgae based air purifier for monitoring physical and biological parameters by using Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi. So Ishita Chanana, I, are you hearing me? Hello. Um, I'm from Shurin University, and uh, I'll be. Uh, can you uh, please share my PPT? Or uh, I'm supposed to share it. 
We are sharing it for you, Ishita. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, well, good evening to all. Uh, my uh, presentation is a uh, is based on a proposed idea, which is a study on microalgae based air purifier for monitoring physical and biological parameter by using Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm working uh, on uh, building an air purifier for mi from microalgae uh, using uh, chlorella, uh, chlorella species. Um, and uh, then using that air purifier, uh, I want to build a maximum efficacy uh, achieved so that it can be moved on to a large scale areas. That is from indoor air pollution to outdoor air pollution. Uh, something, uh, this concept is uh, what lies, uh, what I want to connect from indoor pollution, uh, whatever the data achieved from the indoor pollution and uh, maybe from an industrial output. And as we know that the roadside pollution is kind of in between what uh, what is between an industrial and uh, that is uh, indoor air pollution. So achieving uh, from the, the previous data from uh, indoor air pollution, uh, we can build on a mass, a mass scale. Uh, for example, we can take daily streets, for example. There is no room for uh, trees. Uh, so building on a large scale can provide uh, removal of um, most of the pollutant gases and because achievement of the biofuel. Slides are not uh, moving. Uh, can, we can we move on to the next slide? Uh, okay, so the microalgae based air purifiers can replace uh, the non recyclable air purifiers in the market. The uh, actual air purifiers they go to the uh, landfills and they create pollution uh, because of decomposition. Then the rising pollutants in the air is a cause of a concern and aggravation of health problems and disturbances in the biodiversity. There is a lot of high hike in the uh, cases uh, of lung diseases and um, kidney diseases. Then there is 0 0.18 degrees of this rising average temperature since 1981. Since uh, uh, okay, 1.03 degrees uh, Celsius rise in a single year uh, of uh, 2020 and 40% increase in emissions, CO2 equivalent emissions and 70 million automobiles average rate uh, bought in past 10 years. This year it was going to be 80 million uh, but the, it brought down to 70 million because of COVID. Uh, so the challenge for creating an uh, exemplary air purification system, uh, the main thing is maintenance and output. So uh, the maintenance and output, uh, maintaining the culture in the condition of an air purifier, then the output we achieve from it. So this is come. Uh, this is going to come from improving the system, which is going to be. Uh, which we are going to do by using the data obtained uh, by actually using the air purifier in indoor air pollution. So using uh, to do that, I'm going to use Raspberry Pi to obtain the data. Since I need a compact system, Raspberry Pi is such an uh, extraordinary example. Can we move on to next slide? Uh, okay, so a Raspberry Pi, an air purification system, it is a microprocessor with a RAM and a storage, low price in a mini computer. For making our operating system more compact uh, and for uh, integration of the micro air purification system with IoT, inter Internet of Things. So uh, automation of uh, uh, air purification systems uh, through sensors uh, and uh, then we are collecting and analyzing the data obtained through Raspberry Pi and reading the data and transforming it so as to integrate the system with IoT and providing instructions in order to control the parameters through the interface. Uh, so uh, the sensors I'm going to connect with the photobioreactor, uh, it's going to send my data uh, through Raspberry Pi and uh, it, it is going to tell me uh, uh, whatever the uh, whatever the condition is in inside my photobioreactor, the air purifier, and uh, whether the temperature, what is the temperature, what is the light conditions, uh, and it is going to uh, be transferred through Raspberry Pi, and it it's going to and vice versa through actuators. Uh, I'm going to control the co conditions. This is the proposed idea. Can we move on to next slide? 
Okay, uh, so as you can see on your right side, there is an experimental prototype. This we have already been built and a patent has been granted. Uh, it is an air purification system we built. Uh, the uh, there is a photobioreactor. We have put uh, there is a rod, heating rod. Then there is exhaust, a sparger, air pump, LED lights, uh, connecting pipes, and an AQI meter. Uh, this is a whole setup uh, already built, and uh, my work is to improve this system, which has already been created. Uh, so uh, this uh, this system is a this system has achieved a seventy eight percent efficiency. And uh, the actual uh, target is 98 to 99 percent. Uh, please, next slide, please. Next slide. OK, so uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, we are going to tools and equipments uh, that is required as a Raspberry Pi. Uh, then there is uh, sensors and actuators. Uh, Raspberry Pi is for transferring the data, and uh, then there, there are sensors to uh, collect information, what is the temperature of uh, or light intensity or uh, light conditions required, or uh, there is a pH level, and if the nutrient conditions, if it's possible, uh, and uh, optical density, it's costly, but uh, if it's possible, then uh, we can uh, make a do with it. And uh, then there is a microcontroller uh, to enhance the uh, efficacy of a Raspberry Pi for transferring information. Then there is router, cable, HDMI wire, and uh, accessories. And of course, our photobioreactor platform. It's uh, very uh, much required. Please, next slide. Uh, okay, so the uh, my overall proposed design is that the microalgae based air purification system, uh, the sensors are going to take the conditions, uh, the light intensity, uh, temperature, pH, and OD sensor for growth monitoring, and then air quality sensor, uh, which is around the room, the conditions around the room. So it is all connected to my photobioreactor system, uh, and that uh, data is going to be transferred. Uh, the information is going to be transferred through a Raspberry Pi using the concept of IoT. And of course, we need to install a camera for that. And uh, then there is the analysis of the data using a classification model and predicting the current state in the right environment and using the data to obtain uh, from uh, PCA, uh, principal component analysis, uh, to regulate the devices and then regulate the conditions via actuators. Uh, we'll be using Python libraries for that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, microalgae-based air purification system, uh, the work I'm uh, doing right now in my PhD, uh, if I connect them to the sensors, uh, the sensors will be a uh, light sensor, temperature sensor, pH sensor, and air quality sensors. That is the first basic model. And uh, uh, we are going to connect it to a Raspberry Pi. So, uh, the classification model uh, is that, that uh, it, the assembled model, this is actually a train model. Uh, which which I will be building. And the train model will be connected to sensors to Raspberry Pi. Uh, so uh, what will happen is that the, the assembled model is a combination of a PCA and a classification model. So the classification model will tell us uh, what is the condition uh, inside my photobioreactor, uh, whether uh, what is actual condition. Uh, and uh, the PCA will analyze and uh, tell us, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the classification model will tell us uh, whether the uh, whether the system has a problem or not. Uh, while the PCA will give an analysis and tell us what is the problem. So uh, outside, then uh, we are going to regulate it if uh, from from the starting to the sensors when the data is transferred from Raspberry Pi. Then, uh, then it it is going to tell us the conditions that the temperature is this, whether it is high or low. Uh, then, uh, from using a libraries, we are going to uh, send back through the uh, Raspberry Pi to the actuators to control the condition. For example, if the temperature is uh, very high, then the heating rod is going to turn off. As per the instructions, we are going to put uh, through the uh, through the Raspberry Pi the command we are going to put, and uh, then the uh, heating rod would turn off and uh, as for uh, if there is an extra required we can uh, include something a cooling agent for example a gel uh, so that to bring down the temperature so this is the system uh, i need to uh, create 
for uh, for a for obtaining a data so as to create a better system so this is just a assembled model uh, a trained model and uh, from a, a, from collecting a data through different conditions for example if i take my room i uh, i uh, through sensor i detect uh, what is the co2 concentration what is the um, humidity what is the temperature uh, what is the pm level whether it's uh, whether it is healthy or not uh, so uh, when uh, my system when it is going to begin uh, it is going to uh, it is going to help me uh, to collect that data and through years of collecting the data uh, we can create a better model please next slide uh, so my sensor works on a photobioreactor uh, and produce the data needed for analyzing the growth and development of microalgae the iot system can also interact in two directions so one way through sensors and the other way through actuators and the parameter data during the growth can be stored in a database so that it can be further processed and used uh, the performance of the integrated photobioreactor system with iot's uh, has been carried out by observing the microalgae cultivation system and regulation of the parameter the system can respond by getting data during the process uh, so this is uh, what is needed please next slide uh so uh my main future perspective what i mean what i aim for is creating a self adapting air purification system through all the data then to enhance the output for making it stable for the outdoor industrial pollution and roadside pollution uh so we can build the system uh on the roads and we can uh, collect uh products from the biomass and maybe even biofuel uh, with a better efficacy because the pollution is on a so much of a high level then to increase the accuracy at the mass level and to obtain efficient output for biomass conversion conversion to effective products next slide uh, so i express my uh, profound gratitude to university and my guide pradeep uh, sir for uh, helping me with this idea thank you Thank you so much, Ishita. Uh, is there any question? Ishita, nice presentation. Thank uh, you, sir. Is this uh, model has been developed by you, and uh, also you have filed for patent? Uh, no, sir. The uh, model has been uh, developed my, uh, by my guide and his previous student. Uh, my PhD has just started, so my main. Uh, Main uh, the project has been gotten a funding to create a better model for this one. So I am uh, creating a better model for it using uh, sensors and to increase the efficacy. Okay, and uh, this type of gases uh, or air pollutants uh, will they will be uh, it uh, this uh, able to uh, detect. uh yes sir the uh, there is no detection there is actually the thing is ki the the thing is that the micro algae will fix the gases so the micro algae we we will be taking multiple uh, types of micro algae uh, whether it is sandesmus tunialidi or chlorella so there are different gases we can uh, we will be creating a consortium and they are going to fix different gases mainly uh, nox sox and carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide okay, okay. thank you thank you uh, there is one more question from uh, dr bhagwe bhargava please sir shika yes sir so you are using a micro algae technique for reducing the air pollution yes so, sir what is the end product of uh, your uh, this instrument uh sir uh, the biomass we obtain it can be used as a biofuel uh, the cost of uh, actually purification of a biofuel to, to be used uh, for vehicles and different purposes is very high uh, so my main focus is will be achieving a maximum biomass for obtaining uh, a product uh, whether it be biofuel or a cosmetic or it can be used for an aqua feed uh so it's going to uh, the output is what what I, i want to achieve so as to make up for the cost for the for my whole system 
you can take up also uh, likewise in, in indoor air pollution several uh, volatile organic compounds are there yes sir so how microalgae are fixing these vocs or uh, known gases you are saying so you can also uh, take up the studies on the mechanism how they reduce these vocs and other gases to their system and and, and making the end product as a, as such a you are saying a biofuel uh yes sir it's a simple process of photosynthesis uh but as for pathways i'm currently start I- i'm in process of uh, currently studying the pathways haven't studied it since i uh, just begin uh but uh, the thing is that the micro algae has been there since uh, the reductive environment and we are kind of reverting towards a situation where the greenhouse gases were high up in the air so uh, micro algae has been previously been here on earth that's why we went from a reductive uh, environment to an oxygen uh, environment so uh, the processes i'm in a in of study okay okay so how much uh, cubic meter uh, area you will cover by this uh, your unit uh so my uh, the previ- my unit will be covering um, around if you take uh uh one seat at least that's what i'm uh, aiming for a small corner in a room so that would be uh, around if uh, my photo bear reactor is 4 uh, into 1 and uh, then there is uh, so if i take uh, it's it's about half a meter okay okay thank you ushita that's from my side thank you sir thank you thank you ishita so great with this uh, uh, we end of this wonderful session it was a wonderful day indeed but uh, the event is not over yet we will proceed with a very special program after this uh, but before that i would like to thank the judges of this particular session and all other judges dr rakesh rana dr mahesh gupta dr amitabh acharya dr vikram patyal and dr sarita devi and you all for joining us today now amit will brief us about the special program thank you balavi ma'am uh, now we have a special program uh, actually this event was sponsored by uh, five of our sponsors uh, pro mega scientific solution obexo scientific research aid and deep distributor uh one of our sponsors uh, wants to interact with uh, everyone so nitin kapoor uh, are you listening me yes i can uh, hear you you may proceed okay so hello i i hope you can hear me um, so first of all i would like to thank you the entire uh, ihbt team for giving us an opportunity so me and uh, my colleague mr tapish sood have uh, joined this call uh, to together to thank you for this opportunity uh, to interact uh, with each one of you during the road show that we have yesterday day before yesterday and today we are just going to have a very small uh, session uh sorry to interrupt you uh, i'm sharing your presentation okay yes yes please okay. share the presentation please i know ahead. that uh, you people have already uh, you know exceeded the uh, the session and that it was a heavy day for you so i i will keep it cut and short no, uh, not on. taking much time please 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 go ahead please 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 share the presentation if you have not yet shared is it visible okay yes it's it's visible uh, so basically i'm just going to cover some of the innovative uh, solutions in a genomics workflow that what all uh, innovations we have done so far in a genomics workflow so if you can move to the next slide so basically i'm just going to cover that what all key technologies we have used in the covid 19 and what all key products we have and in the recent time we have launched the spectrum compact ce instrument i am going to cover a bit about that and some things uh, some very interesting things about the student resource center if you can move to the next slide so basically this is just an overview i hope you all know basically we have entire genomics workflow starting from extractions quantitations and amplifications so for purifications we have a manual kit and uh, we have an automated um, instrument as well 
uh, and for quantitation, many of you must be using this Qantas instrument. So you can move to the next slide. This is again the similar set of RNA workflow. Just I thought of giving an overview. You can again move to the next slide. Yes, so the, apart from uh, the genomics workflow, cellular and biochemical areas are also our strength. So we have uh, products based on the luciferase based technology or called the in the products for protein protein interactions and macromolecular designs and, uh, and other uh, the cellular assays based studies like uh, to checking the cell health, cell death and all. So if you can move to the next slide. Um, Okay, so this is just slide to give an update that you know uh, in the COVID time we have uh, of a lot of products uh, that has been used in leading labs uh, for the uh, for the COVID nineteen uh, you know testing technologies. So for example, our RNA extraction kits were approved by ICMR. Um, our GoTech was also approved by uh, the CDC, and we are also working for some of the solutions for wastewater detection of COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, because people are also expecting that you know the next wave, which which might came, that you know it can came through the water also. So it is also important to check the uh, the COVID-19 uh, in the wastewater. The next slide. Uh, this is just to give an other update that you know we have medical instrument uh, that I've just shown that you know that automated instrument has also been used for some of the leading government lab across the India. Uh, if you can move to the next slide. Uh, yes, this is something which I just wanted to highlight that you know the Promega have recently launched the Spectrum Compact CE instrument. What is the Spectrum Compact CE instrument? Uh, so basically, we have launched this instrument because Sanger sequencing is the gold standard sequencing that has been used in market for around more than 40 year old technology. And uh, since you know we have a lot of expertise in this field, so the Promega, uh, in collaboration with Hitachi High Tech, have launched this instrument if you can move to the next slide uh, even next to that uh, next slide uh, yes so this is basically the four capillary uh, ce instrument uh, that help you to detect for for four color uh, detections and basically this instrument is also being provided with uh, you know the the software through that you know you can remotely access your all the experiments so this instrument is very small and compact so that you know uh, you don't have need basically much expertise and you can easily control that. I will not take much time to talk about this instrument, but I'll request students to, you know, share. We have one of the PPT, uh, sorry, the video, uh, you know, we have shared. You, if you can uh, share that video uh, with everybody, that will give a more detail about what this instrument is all about. So there is a Spectrum Compact CE video. Uh, will give you a more strength uh, idea about how this instrument work and uh, what all things are there. With that, I'll, I'll just basically close my session, but uh, if you can share that video. Not not this, the next one, the spec Sanger sequencing one. Yeah, this is the video, please play. Size is the only thing small about the Spectrum Compact CE system. With capabilities for Sanger sequencing and fragment analysis, the Spectrum Compact CE system has flexible run scheduling and an easy to use interface that empowers you to get your work done at your convenience. The plug and play pre-filled consumables are easy to install and use 2D barcoding to track levels and expiration dates. The separate consumables give you more control and help minimize reagent waste. Once you've plugged in your consumables, use the integrated touchscreen to get started. 
The instrument uses the best available polymers for each application, and it can process up to 32 samples per run with flexible batch sizes. Got a run? The remote access software allows you to edit, monitor, and download completed runs from any computer on the same network. Discover flexibility and efficiency at an affordable price point. Think Spectrum Compact. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Nitin. Now, uh, our judging committee is uh, concluding the results of a photographic event, videographic event, e-poster, swear competition, and oral presentation competition. In the meantime, uh, let's uh, let's uh, have a journey in, of a research scholar. Let's have a look on a daily routine of a research scholar. This video is dedicated to all our alumni and all the research scholars who are staying outside and as well as who are staying inside before this COVID pandemic started. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Uh, now we have one more video uh, from the previous uh, seminar series. In the meantime, we, uh, we can see these kind of videos uh, since our uh, judges are busy with the concluding the conclusion results of our uh, events. So let's have a look of uh, uh, previous seminar series.
Thank you everyone. Uh, now I would like to show you one more video. How this, uh, uh, how the preparations of uh, conveners uh, turn this event into a mega event. So let's have a look of another video. <laughs> Now I would like to invite our uh, organizing committee secretary, uh, Dr. Ram Kumar Sharma and Dr. Vivek Dogra. Sir, please. Uh, it's a uh, very good afternoon to all. Another good evening. Uh, it's great pleasure. It is great, uh, great pleasure. And uh, thank you, Amit, for uh, inviting me to really conclude. So uh, the fate of the nature is like that, that uh, whatever the created has to be come to the end. And this was the uh, excellent uh, uh, organizing. Uh, it's a pleasure organizing the things. And uh, we have uh, tried our level best with the good money, machinery which we are having and very excellent uh, uh, driving force with us. None other than the, our director, uh, honorable director, sir. And it's, uh, the movement is not, uh, it's very pleasant, pleasant movement that uh, for the very first time, during the concluding event, we have Madam Director, the first lady of the Institute, uh, Ms. Richa Mishra, Richa Kumar Mishra with us. We welcome you, madam. We welcome you, sir. And uh, so, sir, uh, the major plug behind this, uh, like you ask us to really do it uh, last, like the seven days before. And it was your desire that, uh, and the, your belief that we would, could able to do that uh, 
uh, whatever we have done today and hopefully that uh, with this kind of the team i think we could able to fulfill your expectations and desire so sir uh, there are the major pillar uh, of this event is the 12 guys and uh, i i with your permission i wish to name each and every one so sir there was a uh, miss pallavi so we try to maintain the gender bias uh, the, the committee is try to what we can do is uh, there is no gender bias so we have a uh, miss pallavi sharma so the entire event management and everything was uh, taken care by miss pallavi sharma then uh, we have a namoduo with us then we have a twinkle we will uh, that lady was, that girl was joined the institute just uh, uh, one year back and then uh, the invitation card you see that you are witness of the seeing the kind of the creativity she has done by making the invitation card and very nicely she made that card then we have a swas thakur he is he is the main force of uh, organizing assisting the e poster coordination and management Abhishek Goyal is the uh, logistic and event management. Then we have Anish Tamang, who's who, who that entire money come came for this event is from the effort by the Anish Tamang. Then we have Amit Kumar, event management and technical sir. Amar Varma, that nice abstract book came with the effort of the uh, some of the ten people with the Amar Varma. So Anil Kumar is basically again with the logistic and technical. We have the research condal, technical photography, and that videography. Very nice videography, sir. Uh, I think we hope you are, we are going to show them the videography. And then Sumanta uh, Mahapatra. He is again uh, editing and drafting the abstract book. And the main, sir, among uh, these people, there is a main leader. And the leader among uh, them is the very senior guy, is Mr. Vikas Dadwar. who was really the driving force uh, so i really congratulate you so and above and all sir uh, we appreciate uh, the kind of the assistance we got from the all component of the institute uh, like uh, from our instrumentation to our uh, uh, this canteen people then your entire directorate sir who was wherever we call uh, it was the really nice support and then overwhelming support from everyone every component of uh, uh, the institute so we are just the face otherwise sir this was the this event is for everyone's event and uh, sir i also want to say there is a few things which is very uh, important there is a presence and passion so this these are the guys which we, they are not only present they they created a kind of the passion also so uh, i don't know whether i i do see anyone and uh, i hope i have uh, and and then sir uh, after all this was uh, your support we are going to, uh, we we are able to conclude that and now i invite my dear organizing uh, companion uh, dr vivek jogra now he will be declaring the results and then uh, wherein everybody is uh, waiting so i don't want to come in between to the results and everyone so i'll like uh, take the lead and i invite dr vivek dogra dr vivek dogra please thank you very much sir thank uh thank you sir thank you uh, for appreciating everyone's effort i think this was such a nice event that we have you know concluded today and uh, this was a combined effort of all the people all these amazing guys are so much nice to see their efforts and uh, and now i can see like iqt is you know going really high and i i can see the future is bright so uh, as we have now concluded all the sessions now i will uh, start with the results to which we have now all compiled so we have uh, in total four events and uh, first event was photography competition
so uh, for the photography competition uh, to judge the, the all the entries they were we have uh, received around 65 entries and all were amazing photography uh, done by all the you know, participants and we we were having two judges uh, which were quite uh, uh, having quite expertise in 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 the area of photography and we have a Rajesh Kumar Singh and uh, Shivavit Raghunathan who is already uh, taking a charge of uh, photography in IHPT. So according to their uh, evaluation, the third prize goes to a mushroom stays down to earth but knows when to show up. Uh, uh, and uh, the winner is Vivek Manayatu and his project coordinator at CSIR Beauty. And uh, now we come for the second prize. It goes to Priyanka Bharadwaj. Uh, she is a GRF at CSIR HBT. And uh, the title of her photograph was In the Ocean of Digitalization and Installation, Only Nature's Boat Can Sail Us Through. And it was really uh, beautiful to see vitamin B12 coming from this, this plant. So, and uh, our first prize goes to the, our, our very own convener, Richard Condon. of his uh, photography uh, photograph was ancient knowledge nourishing the mankind through nature ingredients and he you know, put forward all this uh, ancient knowledge what we have in the form of science what we are doing today in our labs so congratulations Rishabh now uh, we come to the second event that was videography competition and uh, we got into the Vivek yes sir अब बाकी जो पैंसठ है वो कैसे देखने को मिलेंगे मैं बाकी फोटोग्राफ जो भी हैं शॉर्ट से है ना जो जिन्होंने जिन्होंने इन तीन को जितवाया है उन फोटोग्राफ को भी तो हम देखना चाहेंगे सो दे विल बी अवेलेबल ऑन आवर वेबसाइट और वे विल बी दे आर कंपाइलिंग द आवर एक्सट्रैक्ट बुक एस वेल एंड वी वि� so for the videography results uh, 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 competition, we had 23 entries and they all were really amazing. And again, the judges were Dr. Rajesh and uh, Shri Pavitra. And uh, the third prize goes to uh, Preshika. Uh, she is a project associate in plant biology lab at CSR HBT and her uh, title was Society Needs Plant Pathologies as plant doctors to cure plant diseases to protect our agriculture. So we, we want to show that uh, video as well. Sir, I think there was some technical glitch, there was no sound, so we'll be playing it again. Now uh, we move on to our second prize and uh, 
again, this is very interesting. It is actually uh, again from our convener Anil Kumar, he, who is an amazing photographer, and I think he has, I mean, a lot of uh, talent he has got from the world. The title was "Don't Go So Far, Stay Home, Have Patience, and See a Beautiful World Is Living Around You." So we'll be showing the video now. This is one of the most amazing videos I have ever seen. Even a National Geographic channel, I think, would not be. Judge, uh, it would be really difficult to you know choose one out of uh, these two entries which we are having. And uh, I would also like to uh, let everyone know that uh, Anil has uh, done all the videos in our uh, whatever we have shown the videos today has been compiled by Anil himself. So and so on, uh, a big round of applause. Too. Uh, now, the first slide. And uh, interestingly, and I think this is this group is full of talents. <laughs> so again, the first prize goes to one of the conveners, Subhash, uh, Subhash Kumar, and he is uh, ICMR SRF at uh, our institute. And uh, actually, he actually prepared the video uh, of about his research work. He works in microbiology, and and he. Uh, made the uh, the video and the title is Microbes Voyage Himalaya to Work Village. This is really a nice creativity which we can see now uh, as in the form of video. Uh, again, there was a technical glitch, so we'll be playing it again. Sorry for the inconvenience. Winners. Uh, it was really amazing to see the creativity of our, our students and uh, you know the, uh, the participants all, all across. But we have received all the entries. They were really amazing. So now we move on to our third uh, uh, event that that was e posters. And for the e posters, we were having a group of ten judges. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, before the posters, we were having another. Uh, I missed the event. It was the fifth event. It, it was so. It was about uh, articulistic writing of, of a scientific content, and uh, we got uh, 22 entries. And uh, the event was judged by uh, our eminent scientist from Institute, Dr. Aparna Matripathy, Dr. Dharam Singh, Dr. Palai Das, and Dr. Raksha Kumar. So among these entries. The third prize goes to again to Subhash Kumar. <laughs> the title of uh, his 
uh, article was uh, SS Sorrow and Sedition, My Story in My Own Words. And second prize actually is a tie. We have two contenders for that. One is Sonali Bharadwaj. The title was The Expedition of My Identification, a not so favorite bacteria. And other was uh, Vijay Bharadwaj, bridging the gap between traditional knowledge of Himalayan medicines and modern medical science through advanced pharmacoinformatics tools. Congratulations, Sonali and Vijay. Coincidentally, both these guys have the same surname. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first prize goes to Sainta Danal and uh, <laughs> congratulations uh, all the uh, four uh, winners. And uh, I think uh, it will be really great to read all your contents. And I think hopefully we'll be reading it in the abstract book. And okay. so we go uh, now, uh, the fourth event that is e poster presentation. And we got 31 entries in total. And it was evaluated uh, scientist in IHPT, headed by Dr. Amit Kumar, Dr. Sanat Sujat Singh, Dr. Yvindar Parvar, Dr. Vida Shankar Srivatsan, Dr. Jeremy, Dr. Vikas Kumar, Engineer Amit Kumari, Dr. Vandana, Dr. Poonam, and Dr. Rohit Joshi. Thank you all uh, judges for, uh, for this challenging work because it was going in parallel with the oral presentation session and it was really uh, tedious to uh, go through this uh, session and uh, based on their judgments we have the third prize and third prize goes to Athrinandan uh, from IHBT itself and uh, the title was Micro Alpha a Sustainable Approach to Combat In this event we have second prize and it goes to Rahul Upadhyay He's again from CSR at BT Palanpur, and uh, the title is Exploration of Influence is a Tie. And it goes again to two uh, students from IHPT itself. Uh, one is Gomit Seth. His work was Unraveling Transcriptional Network Underlying Heat Stress Associated Thermotolerance in Tea, which is a very important talk for our institute. And the second prize, uh, second uh, uh, contender was Abhishek Roy. She got, uh, she also got the third prize. And the, the title was CV Extract Derived Formulations Enhance Antibacterial Resistance in Arabidopsis Thaliana. Congratulations. <laughs> second prize goes to Dr. Surinder Kumar. He is a project scientist too here at IHBT. And uh, the title of his talk was Role of Genome Editing in Crop Improvement. And the final <laughs> entry and the final prize uh, and the first prize for our oral presentation goes to Anil Kumar Rana. And the title is Old is Gold. Lithium therapy improves menopause aggressive behavior in that model. It was really a very uh, uh, interesting work what he has carried out and his presentation was excellent. So because of this, uh, Dr. Anil, uh, Anil Kumarana got the first prize. Congratulations, Anil Kumar. So with this, I congratulate all the winners. And I would also like to say that it was really hard and challenging to pick the winners. Otherwise, all entries were extraordinary and we got a very, very good response. The city was really amazing. And we hope this will go up in the, in the future and we'll be having more interesting and exciting events like this. Thank you all. Thanks for your patience. Now, I, I would like to invite Anish, uh, to give a word of thanks. Anish, please. Thank you so much, sir, for inviting me. Uh, very good morning to all. Uh, Honorable DG, sir, Dr. Shekhar Simande, respected Dr. Ashish Kelele, our keynote speaker, Director of CSIHBT, Dr. Sanjay Kumar. Our most valued, I, Anish Taman, on the behalf of the whole organizing team, Deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the word of thanks on this memorable occasion of Student Seminar Series 2021. 
I would like to thank our DGC, uh, CSI, Dr. Sheikh Zee Mandi. Uh, firstly, I would like to invite our director, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. Uh, uh, now uh, we invite our honorable uh, director sir with uh, madam director sir uh, a student has his own aspiration and they want to give some kind of the surprise gift. Even we don't know what is there inside the box, but that was the surprise gift they wanted to give. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, sir, the double vaccination. All of us, Two minutes Uh, in the meantime, uh, they are uh, unboxing the gift of uh, our director, sir. Uh, we have gifts uh, to our organizing committee members, uh, Dr. Ram Kumar Sharma and uh, Dr. Vivek Dogra. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now we have uh, one more thing for our uh, uh, director, sir. There is also a momento for uh, our organizing secretary, uh, Dr. Ram Kumar Sharma and uh, Dr. Vivek Dogra. Europe to Africa, and he will talk about 
so many people who are also connected from other countries. So, so many of our alumni, they are actually in different countries. So they all working us. So many people are connected. Sir, can I be the first time when in the end of the ceremony, there are about one hundred four people are still connected. Connects all our alumni as well. They are actually in the same So, you guys will be your finalists. Myself is the finalist. So, I think you'll be leaving your fantastic legacy. Right, so I think you started when Tom was also in the So, and all of us guys are clipping. I think we should have one hour. Okay. So we have uh, mementos for all the judges from uh, different panels posters and uh, to uh, score competition, photography and uh, videography competition. Their momentum will be uh, reached to their place. And since we have uh, Dr. Rohit uh, Joshi here, so we'll be presenting him uh, the momentum for the for, for the coordination for e-poster event. Thank you, sir. So Dr. Josie was the main course. We have given him notice. He organized all the everything. How, what time, what's the frame? Everything was done by Josie, and we we got the very good response for everyone in there. So that just said we go and just meet with the we just like we in the just five to ten minutes he can do the everything and we just got it. That is power. You yes. go do not know. We yes. organize the whole demo on the yes. 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 right. Yes. Uh, so Yes. Sir, uh, there's a one more thing here. Uh, we request you and Madam. Uh, so we have the uh, some mementos for all the convenience. So I really request you, invite you, please, and give it your uh, with Madam, please. So I'll uh, speak out the name one by one. Let me tell you, all this money was raised by the community. Immediately, you know, we are doing this. This is something amazing. Take, take. So, may I have Abhishek Goel, please? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? हमारे ग्रुप का दो तो बहुत सॉलिड आंसर है ना एक ही और एक कामी एक और अनिल तो हर जगह नहीं करते हैं अनिल इस दिन एवरीवेयर सो सो द नेक्स्ट वन इस अमन वर्मा अमन वर्मा प्लीज Then Amit Kumar, please. Mr. Amit Kumar. Then can we have Anil Kumar, please? How are we Anil? Hello. 
And then uh, Mr. Anish Tamang, please. So where is the micro? Mr. Subhas Thakur? Mr. Sumanta, Mr. Sumanta, he is taking so I invite Mr. Vibhas. I thought Vikas, I will invite Vikas. <laughs> they are three photographers. <laughs> <Vikas, so. laughs> okay, Rishabh. Okay. 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 Sir, uh, we have the uh, momento for uh, Dr. Asis Lele also. Yes, yes sir. So, we have the Yes. So, we So, we have the momento and sir, uh, these students, uh, the pleasure is uh, for all the faculty, they have some. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, 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 uh, request you to say a few words. This is funny, I'm saying to me. <laughs> so it's kind but of I would say that this is not end of this. This is, I think, beginning of the next one. Yes. So the seed will be sown today, yes. and let's see the tree after a year. Yes. And this time, hopefully, uh, soon we will start the next time what I feel. Yes. And the uh, type of response we got this time and the learning experiences we had this time from Dr. Ashish Lele, from our Digiza, from our alumni friends. See, they are again the house of knowledge. Yes. And uh, next time I feel we can, we should have more involvement of our alumni, uh, international alumni, well in advance. And we also request that if they can encourage some of the guys sitting abroad, that let them all also participate. And maybe if it is more than one day, we don't mind probably that's what we like, right? And there are several students who actually wanted to give a talk. Yes. That, that, that's what my feeling was. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody, sir, only e poster men are my Then I realized that, you know, there is a need to announce uh, this number and hopefully next time uh, let's do some more renovation in this yeah. and uh, what I realized the enormous potential that our students have more and we have that. to create those environments and those conditions where their potential is not visible but fully fully utilized. You know our students potential is like our lungs. Yes, we hardly use 30% of our lung capacity. 
So I feel you guys have so much potential, so much potential. Only thing is, is our mistake that we are not able to offer you that environment which gives your 100%. I think we have to work hard uh, and this is all responsible to all of us. Not only uh, one or two person, even you guys have responsibility that you can tell me that, you know, my potential is being exploited only 10%. What can I do so that my potential is, you know, shown to the world by 100%. You can show us, show, show us that. Yes. Uh, as today everybody was telling that not necessarily it's the uh, teacher or the student which at times gives better ideas than the persons who are supposed to do that. So we have no hesitation in learning from all of you. If all those guys who want to offer some solution that how we can further enhance your potential not for personal benefit, but for national benefit, and also in turn it gives you the advantage. Yes. Right. So we have to create that sort of environment. And in IPT, we try to do so many things so that uh, your life becomes more productive. If you want to work, say, as many hours to show your best thing, we try to create that sort of environment. Only because of COVID, we are facing some obstacles, but hopefully, I think once all of you are double vaccinated and uh, follow the proper protocols, things should be all online. But still, we need to follow some of the protocols not necessary. Yes. And uh, let's show to the world that India was a world guru at one time and it will be again the same. Why we say that center of gravity is in US? <laughs> Why we have to say? Why do that gravity? Nowadays, gravity are shifting. You know? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why not these? Center of gravity for education come back to India. We just have to look for that sort of work. That's what I would say. And uh, let's be inspired by all our ideas. Uh, what we discuss in the morning. Um, you see, that guy, you know, JC Lewis, you put him anywhere, he will touch the plant, he will say there is electricity, and he will prove, there is will show it. Something new, which nobody would imagine. I think that should be our way of thinking, that should be our way of working. If something is already known, we are showing something, so what is new about it? What is uh, good about it? You have to change the way you think. Yes. Other day I was talking to some of guys, we say that there are, uh, you know, one of my students was working on roads. We say that, I am just telling you the how you think. Nobody says that you see beautiful, you know, dirty plant loaded with thorns and suddenly there is a rose. We always say that there is a rose plant, it has so many things. <laughs> so, things
Thank you so much, sir. A uh, very good morning, good evening to all. Honorable Deputy Sir, that Dr. Shikhar Singh Mande, respected Dr. Ashish Singh Kele, our keynote you know, speaker, that is his IHBT, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. Our most valued invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am Nish Tamam on the behalf of the whole organizing team. He made a great honor and a privilege to propose the word of thanks on this memorable occasion of students and Mass Series 2021. I would like to extend a very uh, thankful message to Dr. Um, Dr. BG CSR of the Sacred Simone for your constant and keen interest at your event. Your support always inspires us to do better. And uh, we are also grateful to Dr. Ashish Kelele, Director in uh, CSI and Sip Pumi. Your talk on hydrogen energy really made us think about the immense possibility of this new energy source of the future. A uh, special thank goes to Director CSI IHBT for your constant support. Your commitment to the event has always, uh, uh, has always inspired us and made us to do better each day. I would also like to thank our organizing secretary, Dr. Ram Kumar Sharma and Dr. Vivek Dogra for your constant guidance. And uh, I would like to thank our uh, invited speakers, Dr. Hiraj Vyas, Dr. Upendra Sharma, Dr. Praveen Rahi and Dr. Renu Kumari for delivering such inspiring and thought-provoking ideas, which gave us an insight into the commendable work you all are doing in your research area. Great amount of appreciation goes to the participants of different events, namely oral presentation, e-poster, as we discussed, photography and videography for, points, for showing such zeal of innovation and creativity. Also, much appreciation goes to our sponsors, which include Promega, Obixo, Research Aid, Deep Distributors, Scientific Solutions, for your kind support. Without which this event would not have been possible. And last but not least, I'd, I'd like to thank all my fellow organizing team colleagues. Without uh, your guys' support, this event would not be possible. We work day and night to make this event successful, and I thank you all in the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so uh, now I would like to thank uh, the persons behind the services, technical support, and uh, hospitality. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our technical support team, Vikras Ji, Mr. Sanjeev, Mr. Ishwar, Mr. Bijan, Mr. Anup, Mr. Neeraj, and Mr. Anurag. And I would like to thank Hospitality and for uh, providing us a nice lunch by uh, canteen team, Mr. Omanji, Mr. Anand, Mr. Bipin Guram, Mr. Bipin Kumar, Mr. Ajay and team, and uh, all the cleaning and the security staff. And I would like to thank our alumni who have uh, connected with us uh, across the globe. And uh, last but not the least, our audience uh, who are with, uh, with us patiently since the beginning of this event. Thank you, everyone, and have a great time. So now, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, there's an announcement. I have request everyone join uh, to please uh, come to the canteen for the high tea session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Who's going to look?